almost live. Are we live? Are we live? We're live. Okay, welcome to the stream, everyone. We've got some awesome Yada gameplay here for y'all. Uh, for the YRS on Format Library. It hadn't technically started. I think there's probably like one minute left. If you, if you do want to just quickly run over and join. Uh, I mean, not sure how many people are going to see this in time to actually do that. Because the stream's on a bit of a delay, so... Um, but it should be starting very soon. And, uh, yeah, okay, it looks like there will be a little more time just as potential late signups uh, trickle in. So if you're watching the stream and you're like, oh, wow, what is this tournament? It got a format. That sounds cool. Then there is still time to hop in and play. So uh, highly encourage you to do that because uh, Yada is very, very fun. It's one of my favorite DM era formats. And it is a blast to play. I mean, we held a local tournament last night, and that had some very, very intense gameplay. Like, down to the wire every time, but also very explosive. And it's going to be very cool. Rain Dance, welcome to the stream. Dump Truck for the win. Yeah, Dump Truck is in the tournament. We can look at the people currently in the tournament right now. Looks like we've got 11 people right now, but there is still time to sign up. So, we've got a lot of great players. Uh, how do I move this live thing? Uh, not quite sure how to do that, but... Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah, that should do it. But uh, we've got Barcode. We got Hoy. Uh, we got Lalo8888, uh, who I'm not sure has shown up in the locals, but they, they have been uh, playing this format a little bit on Format Library. We got Food. We got Dean. We got Dump Truck. Dean and Dump Truck was actually the finals of the locals last night, so it'd be funny if that match actually stays there. We got Bobby Bodega. We got Drays. We got C Spare. We got Alon. 129-280, and lastly, we got Alifia2, who is the Yata champion. They've won a lot of tournaments in this format, and maybe they'll be able to add this as a feather to their cap as well. Okay, it looks like Sprint Glide also just joined, so that should update there. Yep, there's Sprint Glide. Uh, and, oh, okay, it looks like one person who tried to join wasn't able to get in. So it looks like Lay Murphy is also trying to join. Who Lay Murphy has a YouTube channel, so definitely check that out. Uh, it's like a fire water uh, YouTube focus mainly, but th that's a very fun format. And they do do some modern YouTube stuff or modern Yu-Gi-Oh stuff as well. So definitely check them out, but it should be a good group. I mean, it is double elimination. So this will be a bit longer than my typical locals. It's also a bit of a higher attendance than my typical locals. So we'll be in it for a bit of a long haul here, but it should be a lot of fun. This will probably be the longest stream that I've done so far. So I'm excited to dive into it. And then I'll also be streaming tomorrow for the second day of the DM weekend on Format Library, uh, which will be held in Warrior Format, which is another one of my personal favorites from the DM era. If you checked out my tier list for all the DM era formats, which was just like sort of a big retrospective of the era as a whole. Um, then you know that my top formats from DM are Yada, Warrior, and Critter. Uh, those are my like S tier formats from the period. I think they're formats that, you know, could become a lot bigger in the future. And I think they're just really, really good. Like they play really, really well. Um, maybe that could all change in the future if people find just a, a completely busted strategy that like cracks open the meta and it's generous to play against. But I feel like those formats really do have potential to um, be big in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. So I really like them. I'm happy that the tournaments that are being held this weekend on Format Library are in Yada and Warrior because there was potential for it to be in like Yu-Gi-Oh Kaiba. Yu-Gi-Oh Kaiba would have been a much longer stream. It would have been long, long games of Stall Mill Mirrors in Devil Elimination format, which would have been a long time. So uh, I I'm glad that we uh, are spared from that. But Yugi Kaiba is still a very fun format, though. Like, for instance, I'm in the Yugi Kaiba tournament right now, or at least I was. I got eliminated in the top cut. But I still enjoy Yugi Kaiba a lot. It just is not a format that's really good to, like, stream a whole tournament of. You can stream, like, one match. Like, a finals match would be cool. And I might be streaming the finals match of the Yugi Kaiba tournament. It really does depend on when works for the most people. But, uh... I do think it is a very fun format. It's just not really good for this sort of event. But, um, you know, that's that's sort of another interesting thing. And I actually made a video a while back when they were sort of talking about 3v3s and different formats being in them. Where I basically made a video uh, talking about how if they want to do that sort of thing again, they should definitely not choose, like, a format like Yu Kaiba or Critter or something like that to actually put in with more fast-paced formats because what would happen is that the uh, slower, grindier games like Yu Yu or Critter would take a lot longer than the other games and it would just drag the whole um, event down a bit. So I do think it's a very interesting uh, sort of discussion to have about like the logistics of different formats being played in different events 
because like while I think that every format has something special to it and makes it like worth trying at least once, uh, I do think that for a tournament setting, there are some things that make certain formats a bit less conducive to that sort of thing than others. But uh, it, it definitely is an interesting discussion topic. So if you all have thoughts on it, let me know down in the comments of the stream because I do think it is very fascinating. So the tournament is just still loading up. Um, it looks like uh, a couple people are having a bit of issue joining. It looks like JT was just able to join. So, okay, yeah, we've got a fair bit more people now. Um, let's see, this is 14 people. That's pretty good. And uh, it looks like we are indeed going to start with that 14 people. And uh, we are going to get the official bracket very, very soon. Uh, once the seeding goes through and the tournaments are shuffled. Okay, it looks like this is probably the official bracket. I'm just going to refresh to make sure. And there we go. Okay, so we got some great games starting out. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six games uh, set up here right away for us. So uh, which format would be better DM for us for single day B-Socks? I think Yada and Warrior are two great ones. Um, they're the main ones. I think Android would be good as well. Android is a bit faster paced because it's like more aggression. You've got the beaters like Kaiku, Gemini Elf, Bazoo. Um, I think Vampire Format would also be very good for a single day because it's much more of a tempo focused format. So it it's not conducive to like long, long games. Um, honestly, anything after Imperial Format would probably work. Just because Imperial Format is the last of that era where like games drag on for a while. Imperial Format could also probably be fine. But you just do have the potential for games that drag on for a long time. And that is potentially something that could slow down the bracket. Like if people are waiting for certain games to wrap up. So uh, I do think that it's probably best to just focus on the formats after Imperial for those sorts of events. Um, yeah, Chaos and Fiber would be great. Yeah, because those are like, those are formats that they go quick, right? They're very, very fun games, very skill intensive games as well. But those games are much, much quicker. Even though you'd, you'd expect in a format like Fiber, where Fiber Jar is so important, you'd expect that uh, that would slow down the game. It actually does not. It actually, um, you know, makes the game go relatively quick. Um, because it's a much more damage-focused fo uh, format, because people know that Fiber Jar can come down uh, at basically any time. And so they're trying to get in more damage on their opponent, because Fiber Jar resets everything except for damage. So you want that edge if a Fiber Jar is activated. So... Uh, yeah, and Chaos, of course, Chaos is Chaos, right? There's broken cards out the wazoo. Uh, it would be, like, very, very fast-paced, very explosive, and it's really fun. Like, a lot of people look at Chaos, and they're like, ah, oh, Chaos, that's tier zero nonsense, right? But when you play it, it's, like, really interesting. Um, it does take a fair amount of skill, despite the, like, massive amount of blowout cards. Um, and also, I think deck building is a major part of Chaos as well, because... Uh, you know, everyone's trying to build that Chaos deck, but no one's really come up with the optimal build for it. Uh, and that optimal build might change a bit as the meta shifts. So I'm very curious to see with more Chaos events what will happen um, with that format. But anyways, uh, DRVYZ uh, just opened with a set card and Rydraga opened with Painful Choice and Pot of Greed. So they, they went for Pot uh, and then they're going for Painful. So they're sending the three hand rips, a knock, and a graceful. None of these are good for DRV, uh, DRVYZ to get. But uh, they're going to give Ryo Drago the duo, which means that they likely do have a Serpent in hand. Uh, or the set monster is a Sangan or Witch, and they're going to search out Serpent. I think this is smart. Normally, you do want to, like, save duo for, like, after you attack in. But if you have the read that your opponent has a Serpent, or they could search a Serpent here, then you do want to go for duo first. So I think that was a smart play on the part of Ryo Drago. Uh, and, yeah, they did hit a Raigeki out of hand with the duo. So that's something. But obviously, the Serpent makes this play a little bit worse. Hey, Allison Gomez, welcome to the stream. I hope you're having a good one. And this should be a really fun event uh, because this is like, I mean, Yada Lives happened, which was a single day Yada tournament that was held on Janjo's channel. And that was really fun. This is my first time streaming like a big long event like this. So it should be really fun. Um, <laughs> this will definitely test my endurance as a streamer. Uh, ooh, bring on Exile Force to pop the tomato. That's pretty good. Now they can get in for a hand rip with Zalug if that will go through. I mean, Ragged Dragon might have a way to stop this, like a ring or a mirror force, and uh, we'll have to see. Oh, they do not, so they'll rip a card out of hand. Yada is one of my favorite DM formats as well. I think it really is, like, it's a format with a lot of potential, right? It feels unique enough from something like Goat, which is what a lot of people go to if they want the classic sort of Yu-Gi-Oh era. Um, but at the same time, 
it has a lot of fascinating uh, plays that go on, a lot of fascinating strategy, a lot of different decks that people are experimenting with that seem pretty good. So the meta is very undefined right now. Uh, and it just feels like a great time. So, oh, damn. Okay, Exiled Force and uh, Change of Heart on the Zalug. So that means that they're able to take the Zalug, rip a card out of DRVYZ's hand, and DRVYZ did not add that Serpent back to hand, which is quite unfortunate. I mean, I can't complain too much because I also forget to do that very often. But, uh, yeah, it, it just shows to... Uh, it really just showed the importance of um, getting back that Serpent because... If that had not been the Jinzo hit, if it had been the Serpent instead, then DRVYZ would be in a much, much better spot. But uh, let's see if they remember to add it here. They do not. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, I mean, now that the hand rip happened, it might not be as bad. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you generally want to have the Serpent in hand just in case. MST for the Mirage. So perfect last two cards in Food's hand there. Uh, that will clear that, and they've got a lot of value here. Five cards versus two. One of the reasons why Mirage is one of the most busted cards in this format. Oh, and Dark Hole on a Fiber Jar, which could have been used to sort of reset the advantage here, and a Yada Garage coming down, but a TT is going to deal with that. Now, as a note, the Yada would not have been able to cause the Yada Lock on its own here, because DRVYZ does have a Serpent in rotation, so they could have added back that Serpent, and then, uh, set it to stop the Yada from hitting in. But, again, they forget the Serpent here, um... That, that could come back to bite them. They might have wanted to set the Serpent because one Nobleman's already used up, so it's not really the scariest thing that, you know, they might have another. Going for Premat here. Premat to bring back Jinzo, most likely, I assume. Um, and will that go through? I mean, one MST is used up uh, on the uh, on, on the Mirage, so. Call coming down, and Call's targeting Tomato. This makes sense because you can't use Call once Jinzo's up because Jinzo will shut down the Call. So you use Call to bring out Tomato to get yourself a blocker here to get yourself something that floats into other things. And now you give DRVYZ a bit of a tough choice. They will choose to attack into the Jinzo, though. So that'll deal a 1,000. And Rai Dre will get another monster out of their deck here. But that being said, Jinzo can be a very annoying monster to deal with. There are things that do deal with it in this format uh, and which can potentially get you into those things. But it is still very tough to deal with if you don't have things already. Well, Raigeki off the top will deal with it. So that will clear that. And now that Witch will be able to attack in for 11. Now getting back to the Serpent here is pretty vital. Because you need that as a chump blocker if you don't have anything else. Uh, and it looks like they will indeed be getting back the Serpent here. So, yeah, Serpent, I mean, it, it's one of the uh, tricky cards in the format. Like, it's very easy to forget, especially because you don't have things. I mean, Raigeki Break does exist in this format. Um, but you don't have a lot of discard fodder, so oftentimes you can be like, well, Serpent, what, what's it going to do, really? Um, but it really does, uh, come up a lot. IO for the, oh, for the pre-mat, yeah, and they had a read that Food did not have the MST here, because they didn't use MST on the pre-mat, so, yeah, that is, uh, brutal stuff. It's one of the reasons why people don't really play pre-mat as much. It does cost you life points, and while IO does shut down something like Reborn, Reborn can also take from your opponent's graveyard, also, you know, Reborn isn't shut off by MST. Um, Call of the Haunted is shut off by MST, but, like, the thing with Call is that you can chain it reactively. So if your opponent blind snipes your back row, you can use Call, get back, like, a Witch or a Sangant or a Jinzo, uh, and then get a search off that. So looks like they're going to T-set and pass again, so Food does know that the set is Serpent. Um, so if they have, like, a weak monster of their own, they can just attack over it and then attack him with Witch. But, yeah, it's, it's looking like a very interesting position to be in, for sure. Because, you know, it's it's kind of a stalemate a little bit. While Jinzo is, is going to break up that stalemate a little. Um, and also, Food will get a search here off the Witch. So, you know, this shuts down DRVYZ's traps. It could also shut down Rago Drago's traps if they've got some in the back row. Which I feel like they probably have traps in the back row. I mean, they could have just set monsters. Or, uh, not monsters, but spells. But uh, two hand rips are gone already. So, like, I don't necessarily know if that's the best. But, I don't know. And it looks like there's going to set two and pass. Now, Food does have another monster in hand, so they can just summon that out, hit over the Serpent, and then attack indirectly with the Jinzo for 2,400. And this puts DRVYZ in a very, very scary position. Only 300 life points to their name. And uh, looks like, you know, DRVYZ is going to need a really good card here to actually come back from this. Raigeki is gone. Dark Hole could potentially do it. Um, but, yeah, you need to draw that Dark Hole. And uh, that might be a bit too much of an ask. Pot of Greed will help, though. I mean, Pot of Greed is one of the best draws you can get in this sort of scenario. 
Yeah, that is uh, very good. And I'll, okay, they, they just admit defeat because they did not draw uh, into what is what could deal with that. So, yeah, very unfortunate stuff. But uh, that's how it goes sometimes in Yada. I think that was a very back-and-forth game. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, sometimes it just uh, your opponent just gets that advantage and you can't draw into the power card to deal with it. But I think that that was still a very good game. We can either stay on this game, see the game too, or we can dive into another one. So what are people feeling? People feeling staying on this one or people feeling diving into another? Uh, how many players joined? It was 14 players, I believe. Yep, 14 players total, which is a fairly good amount, I think. Um, for a format like this and also a double elimination tournament, I think that's a pretty good amount. And we'll also make it so that this is indeed one day. You know, it's not going to be a two-day thing like an RBT or anything like that. So um, I, I think that's good to just have it be one day. Uh, yeah, I'm planning on staying until the end as well. So uh, we'll be in this together. Graceful pitching a jar. That means that they must have a fairly confident uh, hand here. Um, forceful, I mean, yeah, that's pretty good. You don't necessarily need the jar to shuffle back all the knowledge that you get from the forceful. So I think this makes sense. And we may get... Uh, I'm not sure if DRVYZ is going to sort of put the hand... Uh, in the chat here, but taking back a dark hole is going to be pretty good. It means that they um, are a bit afraid of a board wipe. Might mean that they don't have like a Sangan or a Witch to set because what you could do is you could set Sangan or a Witch, try and bait the dark hole. Uh, might also mean that they don't have Serpent now because Serpent is also good dark hole bait. But it looks like they're just going to set and pass. So food knows that that's not a fiber jar, so at least they can play around that a little bit. But it could be like a Magician of Faith to get back Graceful or. Um, Oh, oh, Raigeki on the set, and that set turned out to be a spy. Brutal stuff. Uh, Raigeki must have been the top deck, because if you have Raigeki and Darkhold, you don't send back Darkhold, right? You send back Raigeki. So, brutal stuff. Um, sometimes the top decks, they, they just uh, can do that top deck, and, you know, it's it just can turn into the course of the game, and it's very unfortunate. That Spirit Reaper getting in for hand rips here. Ripping out a Moth is pretty brutal as well. You would have liked that Moth to stay um, in the hand. Uh, so that way you could set it here and get back a powerful spell. Because you do have powerful spells in Grave. It looks like, oh wow, they don't have uh, really another monster. I mean, MST is going to hit a back row here, hitting another MST. If you're DRVOIZ, you're probably happier that that got hit rather than your other cards. But uh, now you give food a bit of a tough choice. Do they attack into what is likely a Jinzo in the hand? Or do you just uh, leave that there? Hitting a Harpies as well is pretty good. And yeah, it looks like they're just going to switch the Reaper to defense. Bring out... Oh, okay. Well, this explains why they're doing this. Bring out Zalug. And uh, Zalug will be able to attack in for 14. Rip the card out of hand. But a ring will come down on the Zalug. Prevent that card from getting ripped. And also dealing 1,400 to both players. Ring is, is a bit of an interesting choice here. Um, because you could also have rung the Spirit Reaper. Because Spirit Reaper is a bit more annoying. If it is Jin's own hand, you don't really care as much about that getting sent to Grave. Because then it turns on, like, Call the Haunted, Premature Burial, etc. Um... But I, I get this. I get this because, like, you don't necessarily want this Luke to be on field either. If you don't necessarily have a good way to deal with it, it's just consistent damage, whereas Reaper isn't. Um, and you're not in a position to get really aggressive. So the idea is that, like, eventually you'll be able to get into a position where you're aggressive and you'll likely have a way to deal with Reaper that way. But uh, right now, I think Zalug is the more priority target. They're going to switch the Reaper to attack, and it looks like no Mirror Force there, so that's going to rip that last card of hand, which was indeed a Jinzo, uh, which was pretty much the only thing it could be, because otherwise the RVYZ would have committed to field. Reborn on the Jinzo, though, uh, and this is kind of what I was saying. Like, you could have used the Ring on the Reaper, uh, because then your uh, Reborn play is set up there. But I guess the Reborn was the card drawn last turn, so um, I don't think this is terrible. But uh, yeah, Jinzo is going to hit over the Elf there, Dealing five, and uh, then you're in a good spot. So they're going to set one pass back. I think you could honestly just have attacked over the Reaper because Raigeki is used up, and you just want to get in more damage at this point. But I don't think that hitting Elf is, like, terrible. It's just, um, I feel like the Reaper hit, just getting in that damage is very important. Damage does matter a lot in this format. Um, so yeah, sending a Yada, uh, a Knock, a Change of Heart. Oh, these are going to be rough. I, I feel like right now you give the, the Yada, but the set could be Dark Hole, I guess. Um, no, the set can't be Dark Hole because that was set um, near the beginning. And Dark Hole was spun back to deck. You know that Raigeki was the top deck uh, on that turn. So I feel like you give the Yada. Yada is like, Yada's scary, but it doesn't really do anything here. You also give like Force, but then they force your set, and that's annoying. 
So, I mean, it depends on what the set is as well. But I feel like right now you just give the, the yada. I mean, this could come back to bite you if the set is like uh, Snatch Deal. It says being Snatch Deal will be really bad with yada because like they snatch your Jinzo, summon a yada. They, take, they attack over the set with Jinzo, attack directly with Reaper, and then they attack in with yada. So, um, but either way, like you're in a tough spot with the set Snatch. So, I don't know. Uh, going for knock and that will take control of, or that will banish the spy. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I guess you're in kind of the same spot if they, like, exiled. And this way, at least they, um, they banished from deck. So, you kind of decked in a little bit as well. But, uh, this is a tough spot to be in. So, now, um, Red Drag or, uh, DRVYZ will gain a thousand here. So, it wasn't need the snatch. So, uh, not giving the Yada was correct. Um, yeah, this is a tough thing all around. And uh, will they have a way to stop this is the question. I mean, only one MST is used up, and most people do play three MSTs. So, Premat here. Uh, Premat can get back. Oh, this isn't even... This is, this is, I mean, yeah, you got to do it to stay alive, but that is unfortunate. Yeah, you just get back this guy to chump block, basically. But this is 500, that's 1,800, and that will be the end of the game. So, that's our first game there um, with Food Fallen. And... Uh, it looks like we've got a hype match going on. It looks like Olaf Gitu and Bobby Bodega are going to play. So let's watch that one actually, because Olaf Gitu is, uh, you know, they're they're a they're a Yada champion. You know, um, okay, it looks like Sprint Glide uh, unfortunately could not show up, but uh, yeah, I mean, Olaf Gitu is a Yada format champion. They've won multiple format uh, tournaments in this, or tournaments in this format that is. Uh, and they always bring something spicy. So I'm very curious to see what they do here. Um, but it, it should be pretty exciting. I mean, painful. Okay. They're, they're on the hot S and they're on Yada. So they might be on a bit of a fiend deck. Fiends are a deck that people have brought to Yada events and like experimented with because of course, hot is very strong. They do have some specific fiend support like bark of dark ruler, which is an okay battle trick. Yada, of course, is also a fiend, but uh, Yada kind of does its own thing, but, uh, this could just be Fiends. Now, if you're Bobby Bodega, what do you pick here? It's a bit tricky. I think you just pick Serpent because, you know, Serpent is just a card that like, yeah, uh, because Serpent would go back to hand anyways. So honestly, that painful is almost more for deck thinning here rather than for, um, just like getting a card to hand because unless Bobby has like Kaiku in hand to deal with the Serpent. Like, there's no real reason um, not to give it to them. Because if they've got, like, Graceful in hand... Like, the argument that people do is, like, oh, if they have Graceful in hand, then they activate Graceful, pitch Serpent. Well, if they've got Graceful in hand, they could just activate Graceful, pitch whatever, right? Or they could just wait a turn, add back Serpent, activate Graceful on the next turn, right? So you're just giving them an extra card there um, if you uh, don't give them the Serpent. So, um, in general, Serpent is the correct pick to give them if they send Serpent off Painful. But Grateful is on Bobby's side this time, so Bobby's going to think about what exactly to send here with these classic Yu-Gi-Oh card back uh, decal. Uh, I do like the old the old Yu-Gi-Oh uh, card back from the anime. Um, I, I think, honestly, I prefer the actual card back, which is kind of wild to say, but I just love the sort of like swirling on it. But uh, the, the anime card back, it's a classic, so... Uh, you can't really go wrong with it. But pitching a Parshath and a Tomato. Parshath is a bit of an interesting monster in this format. Um, people have sort of gone back and forth about whether to play it. Uh, oftentimes played in more like Go Control decks. Because what you do is you can bring out a Restrict. Then tribute over it for Parshath and you're in a good spot. Uh, you can also use Parshath for like Metamorphosis plays. You Metamorphosis uh, Parshath. Go into Dark Balter. Um, but it looks like uh, Alephi 2 is going to flip a giant germ, bring out a Sangan. So it seems like they are all in on the Fiend strategy. Now, is a Necrofear in the future, potentially, as well? Uh, that remains to be seen. But a knock will take care of that Mystic Tomato, and Alephi 2 will be able to get in for 2,000 here. And that will indeed go through. Now, part of the scary thing about giant germ is that can actually threaten a lot of damage if Bobby Bodega just brings out a monster. Because what you can do is you can crash germ into that monster, get out two more germs, and if you get a way to clear the monster, like Ring of Destruction, uh, then it gets in for even more damage. And also, whenever giant germ crashes into a monster, then your opponent takes 500. So, um, this could get out of hand really quickly. But this is very similar to the deck that all of you two won their last Gala tournament with, which was sort of playing a more aggressive burn deck, playing things like giant germ, nightmare wheels, etc. Uh, and they could be on a similar deck to that here. Uh, maybe they adjusted it a little bit to, um, you know, sort of 
iron out the kinks of it because I know that they played the tournament and they did have some issues with it. Um, it wasn't like a perfect deck by any means, so they could have potentially optimized it further and uh, end up ended up with uh, their current build here. No, Bobby is disconnected. Rip. Uh, that is classic DB for you. But it looks like they're back now. So hopefully that was just a temporary issue. Going for the elf here. Getting in even more damage, uh, potentially. So they're going to check what's in Bobby's graveyard. They see a Parshath, a tomato, and a charity. So it's just sort of like, you know, two tomatoes are gone. So you don't necessarily have to worry about this being a third, but oh, you do have to worry about that mirror force there. Oh, that is brutal. And good patience on Bobby's part. They could have fired that mirror force last turn with the germ and the Sangan, but they waited for Olive to commit another monster board and attack in for more. So Olive yeah, does get a Sangan search, so that is something. Like it's not nothing here, but they have committed their normal summon, so Bobby will be able to hit in and uh, get in some damage here next turn potentially. But yeah, brutal stuff. Uh, what will officers? They'll search out a Mystic Tomato of their own. No Mystic Tomatoes used up so far, so that means they probably don't have another in hand. And they're just going to pass back to Bobby here, hoping that that one set in the back row is going to be enough for them. What will Bobby do here? Will they get aggressive? Will they potentially try and bring out Parshath if they get another, or maybe the Parshath from Grave to get a draw? A lot of different options that they could go for here. They're thinking, though. They're thinking hard. And it is a bit of a, a tricky spot. And that's part of the interesting thing about Yada. Oh, it's a Reaper. Okay. So part of why they're thinking is probably because, you know, Olive has a Sinister Serpent in hand. And also, you know, Reaper, it just soaks damage. But Mirror Force will deal with the Reaper. I do like that play. Because one, you know, Reaper could hit a significant card in your hand. And you don't want that to happen. And two, if Bobby just switches Reaper defense afterwards, then... You can't really have an easy way to deal with that. And all of you two's deck is about damage, right? And so you want the damage to go through. So it looks like Tomato is going to come down here. Bobby did know about the Tomato. So I do think it makes sense for Olive to commit that Tomato. And will the Tomato attack in? I mean, Mirror Force is gone. There is Ring of Destruction, but you don't really have to worry about that. Oh, Necrofear coming down. Okay, I said, you know, it could be Necrofear. Um, but it is indeed the Necrofear here going in for 3,600 over half of Bobby Bodega's life points. And that's pretty brutal. I mean, that's part of the power of Necrofear. It is a powerful extender and it is a big boss monster too. I mean, 2,200 attack isn't really the highest in the world, but in a pinch, you can bring in defense for 2,800. Uh, if it's destroyed, then you get to take control of one of your opponent's monsters. So it, it's a very, very cool card. So very, very good play. I mean, Dark Hole's coming down here. And now what Bobby can do is if they like set a monster here, then they don't have to worry about the Necrofear. Um, they're, oh, or Yada. Yeah, Yada will also prevent the Necrofear from equipping because uh, Yada will return to the hand at the end of the turn. Now, this is... Okay, so it will still, it'll still go back to the hand just during the end phase of the turn. It would normal summon flip face up. So, uh, yeah. So either way, the Necrofear won't make a difference here because let's say the Necrofear comes back first and takes the Yada. Yada will just return to hand. And uh, it will just be destroyed again. Necrofear will have nothing to equip to. Um, and, you know, if Yada goes first, then Necrofear has nothing to equip to anyway. So, yeah. Pretty good Yada there. Now, Sinister Serpent will be able to sort of stop the Yada from coming down. So, that's something. Honestly, um, hey, Goat Format, welcome to the channel. JDZ in the house. Oh, we got some great Yada Format cooking here. And all of you too is definitely cooking. Yada, like, I mean, Necrofear and... Uh, Yada Garasu is a fiend, so, you know, it's kind of interesting that people are playing Yada Garasu, and uh, not many people are playing Necrofear to pair with it, but it's another synergy that it has, and uh, I'm really excited to see what Alki 2 does with this deck further, because I think they're in a really good position this game, uh, I think they will be winning this game, um, but it's very exciting. Uh, also, since since you're in the stream goat format, or, or JDZ, I'll just call you JDZ, it's easier than calling you goat format, since you're in the stream, uh, for all you out there, uh, me and JDZ actually have a collab that's coming up on the channel, and it should be out on Monday. So uh, look forward to that. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, we play a gl uh, classic GOAT format deck, and uh, it's just a blast to play, and, and we have a great time. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to put that up and see your all's uh, reactions to it, because it should be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, this is a very... Uh, oh, well, okay. Well, Reborn for Parshath is going to be pretty nice for uh, Bobby here. 
And oh, a Yada. Yep, we did know about the Yada before. So the thing about Serpent is that it's a great uh, stopper for Yada because the idea is like Yada can't get over it. So your opponent has to come in another monster as a normal summon to get over it. But uh, if they can just reborn the Parshaft, then that deals with the Serpent. So this isn't quite a stopper. Now, the fact that Alpha 2 didn't concede here means that they probably have some other way to stop the Parshaft. Um, but it still is not the best situation to be in. Very, very scary spot. And that's part of the power of Yada Garasu. Now, of course, okay, well, Snap Steel is a way to potentially deal with the Parshat, draw a card to sort of get around the Yada Lock, um, but MST will come down for the Snatch, and yeah, if they don't have anything else, then yep, then they don't have anything else. That's just the end of the game. Uh, yeah, no, this should be a great match indeed. I mean, that was a great game one. Like, a lot of interesting things going on there, and the Yada Lock showing his power. Um, Yada is interesting in this format because... Everyone knows Yada from, like, the Chaos Yada Lock that happened in Chaos format where, like, you just do this big combo where, like, you bring out CD, pop a Saiyan or Witch, get Yada to hand, and then you just lock out your opponent that way. Um, but in this format, Yada Lock to actually take a little bit more effort to go through. So it honestly feels a bit less bad because, like, yes, if your opponent, like, brings out Yada and just draws lock you, then you can't do anything. So you're like, ah, damn, I lose the game. But... In order to get to that point, a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh has to happen beforehand. So Yada is kind of like another win condition, but it's not an easy win condition to pull off. And having it in your deck can be a bit of a brick at times, where if you're like in top deck mode and you need something good, you draw into the Yada. That's obviously pretty unfortunate. So uh, I do think it is a bit of a better card in this format than it is in later ones. Um, and it's part of why I like this format a lot. Like this is one of my favorite DM era formats. And yes, Yada Garasu is running around. Yes, there's a bunch of powerful cards. But I really do feel like a lot of games just come down to the wire. And while Yada Garasu can pop up and cause the draw lock, again, it, it feels a lot more fair. So, uh, yeah, I, I hopefully, you know, we'll get to see more of these games and uh, show some of that, like, really intense back and forth. Um, I, I had a local stream last night in this format as well. And all the games there were super, super intense. And that's just what Yada format does. Like, all the games in this format seem really, really intense. I mean, there are, your, there are your blowouts here and there, of course. Um, but most of the games are just really back and forth and really awesome. So this time, Alpha 2 is going first. So what will they do here? I think they went first last time, too, where they sent the... Yeah, they did the painful uh, first thing and then set Germ and a back row. And it looks like they're just going to do a T-set and pass here. So no hand rips. Uh, in this format, you do have the three hand rips. You have Confi, Forceful, and Duo, which is a bit awkward because, like, obviously, if you open that going first, it's pretty brutal. But uh, looks like that did not happen this game, unless Bobby has some hand rips here. And looks like they do have the Confi. Going for that first, that's a bit of an interesting play. Uh, normally, in this format, I like to uh, bring out a monster and try and attack it on the set if it's, like, Sangan or Witch. So that way, if your opponent searches out a monster here, then you get to use the Confi, rip that out of hand, potentially. But... Uh, I guess they're getting information here. If they've got, like, a knock or some way to deal with the set, then, of course, going for Confi here doesn't, um, uh, really make a difference. So, it looks like Olive has a knock as well, and Bobby's actually gonna get rid of that knock. So, that means they probably have some powerful set monsters, um, in hand. It looks like they are just going to set, so, yeah, that's another reason why you'd go for this play. If you want to set instead of attacking in the monster, then Confi is definitely the move beforehand, because you want to know what you want to set. And also, if that set is even safe, because, for instance, if Olive had had the knock in hand and Bobby had not wanted to send that, then the set would not be safe. So, yeah, yeah, there is going to be a Warrior Tournament tomorrow at the same time as well, and I will be streaming that as well. So we're doing we're doing a weekend of streams here. It's going to be a, a big marathon. Uh, Nudoria, okay, Nudoria is a very, very powerful tech, and that's also a fiend. So I'm curious if Aleph is also on the Nudoria tech here. But uh, Nudoria is something that's been seeing a bit more popularity in this format. Um, in the last, or maybe not the last one, but in one of the Yada tournaments, I know that Jazz was on sort of a more good stuffy deck, and it did play a Eudoria in it, because you've got the three tomatoes to search out, like, Sangin or Witch, but Eudoria can come up a lot of the time, just as a pop that you want to go through, so I wouldn't be surprised if Eudoria sees more play. But Bobby's gonna go for Painful here. Painful, one of the most powerful cards in the format, but also one of the most, uh, difficult to use, and, uh, both these players are very good, so, um, yours will be a pretty good Painful but again, you know, sending the Serpent, um, it, it always is a bit of an interesting thing because, like, you could just use Painful as a Foolish for Serpent, but you have to acknowledge that by doing that, you're sort of burning four cards because there's no way your opponent doesn't give you the Serpent. And because, like, Serpent's going to come back anyway, so, like, there's no real risk to giving Serpent. I mean, yes, if they've got Graceful in hand, then, you know, the, they're just going to pitch Serpent to the Graceful, but, like, they get back the Serpent next turn anyways, so they can just hold the Graceful for a turn. So, yeah. 
Uh, that's basically burning these four cards, but getting Jinzo in rotation is pretty good. Because you've got like Call the Haunted or Reborn to bring back that Jinzo. Then you shut down your opponent's traps. So um, I, I don't hate that. And then just thinking out a uh, a Tomato and a Reaper is pretty good too. Although Reaper is a card that you might want to save for later. But uh, hitting into a Germ, so we get to see the Germs again. And dealing 500 damage there. So that's three Fiends already. So if Olive is able to get a Necrofear planted here uh, after these Germs go through, then that's going to be pretty powerful. MSD on the back row there. And, okay, it is indeed the call, so that's why the Jinzo was sent, and this is a very powerful play, because now the Jinzo sticks on field, because the call's effect that would destroy it, once it's destroyed, is negated by the Jinzo. So, yeah, rough stuff. Um, and the fact that, like, Aleph went for the MST there is a bit awkward, because to me that indicates that they don't have, like, a good way to clear this board. Because normally you'd save MST for if your opponent has, like, Io, right? Because Imperial Order is in this format, one way to stop Imperial Order is if you have an MST to deal with it. So you activate a powerful spell, they chain order, uh, you chain MST to pop the order, um, and then your powerful spell goes through. So I feel like they don't actually have, like, Raigeki. Oh, they've got Dark Hole. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, that does clear the board, and also it gets three Fiends in Grave. So if you've got the Necrofear in hand, then you can go for that. And uh, Elf is a good follow-up there, too. So going for the Elf now, and that will indeed attack in for 19. And... It looks like they do have a back row set, so they're going to pass back to Bobby here. Now, Bobby has, uh, both players have about the same amount of cards. We know that Bobby has a Serpent, but we don't know much else here. And so, th this is back to a pretty even game state, uh, I'd say. Harpy is going to deal with a duo here, not going for duo because the Serpent was known in hand. And it looks like both players are going to crash in those Elves. Bobby's just going to set one, pass back to Aleph, and we're back in intense territory. So Bobby is on a bit of a back foot here because they do have only 4,600 life points. And that is a scary place to be in this format. But both players are down to very low cards. Uh, Bobby might also still know some of what Aleph 2s got because they did do the comp early on. So they might have an idea as to like what that last card is, but they're going to MST that anyways. So hitting a ring, ring is very, very powerful here, especially when, you know, Bobby's at low life points. So hitting that ring is very, very good for them. And they're going to set one pass back to Olaf. They're going to go for Painful here. Another Painful. Uh, again, you know, very, very tough card to use. But when you can use it well, it is very, very good here. Um, what are they going to send here? Now might actually be a good time to get Serpent into rotation. So it looks like they're going to go for Hot S here. So hot S is really brutal if uh, if Bobby gives Olaf Hot S. Because then, you know... All of tributes over their monster, and then they attack in, negates uh, Bobby's monster. And if that serpent set, then that serpent ain't coming back because its effect will have been negated off the hot ass. So uh, this this could be like a legit five cards that are being sent off of uh, Painful. It could also just be burning cards to get fiends and grave for Necrofear, and also to get serpent in rotation because serpent isn't bad at this point in the game when both players are so low on cards. But all of it really is thinking, and Painful is such a difficult card to use in a situation like this. Um, you know, I, I I made a video on Warrior Format, and someone said in the comments, like, basically, oh, how would, why would you say the Painful Choice is a skillful card? Like, it's it's a, it's a very powerful card, but like, why is it skillful? And I think the reason why it's skillful is for exactly situations like this, where, like, you are in a almost top deck situation, and you need to get just, like, either the perfect card to hand, or you need to decide, like, do I deck thin here to make my top decks more valuable? Uh, do I get sharp in rotation? Like, there's a lot of different things to consider when going for this. And, yeah, Serpent is going to be added to hand, because, again, like, there's no real reason not to add Serpent unless you have Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer to banish it. But, yeah, and Aleph's just setting it. Now, if Bobby has a knock, then that Serpent will probably eat the knock. But, uh... Yeah, it's a bit tough. Yeah, she's better. This is the real bird up format. Yeah, that's why I, I made the thumbnail the way I did. Um, because, like, Yada, I mean, Yada is very powerful. We've seen it lock out a couple games so far. And uh, it can be very good. But this is exactly the sort of uh, example of a situation where Yada is actually not a very good top deck. And that's sort of one of the drawbacks to it, right? Like, for instance, if either player top decks a Yada here, they don't really have the way to push through and get in that attack with the Yada. So, like, it's kind of just a dead card at a point in the game where you really don't want dead cards. So Bobby's going to set one pass back. So each player is sort of building up their resources here. Neither one really wants to disturb the piece right now. But uh, very intense stuff. And if we check the graveyards right now, uh, Bobby's used up no Raigeki, no Dark Hole. So those are still in play. 
Uh, Alfie 2 used up one Dark Hole, um, but no Regeki. So both players still have Regeki in in the offings. Uh, Io is still not used up as well, so you have to worry about that. And Alfie 2 is down two MSTs, so they don't necessarily have the best way to deal with Io here. Yeah, this is, this is tricky stuff for sure. Also, Alfie 2 has that late game Necrofear bomb, like waiting in the wings to come down. So Bobby has to know about that, but Alfie doesn't necessarily want to commit it into what might be like a mirror force in the back row uh, or a ring or something like that. So, I mean, ring would actually be kind of good for Alf because it, then Bobby's down to 2,400 life points, which is very, very low. But it looks like both players are just playing the slow game here, which is, I think, what you got to do in this situation. So they're mirroring each other exactly. Two sets, uh, two set monsters, two set spells and traps. And this is a uh, very intense. Pot of Greed is going to potentially break the stalemate here, and that will indeed go through, so Aleph will draw two. Will they draw what they need to actually make a big push here? It's definitely possible. Raigeki, Necrofear, things like that. Those could definitely do it. They're, they're doing a big thing here. They're also down on cards, so like if this does go to deck out, which it very likely won't, because someone's probably going to make a move at some point. Uh, Alf is kind of behind, but Fiber Jar also exists, so Fiber could just reset everything and make the deck out situation um, not really worth considering. But looks like they are going to start going aggressive here, bringing out a Mystic Tomato, and Bobby's going to think about this. They could have a TT set in the back row uh, to pop the field. They do know that one of the uh, Alf sets is a Serpent. They don't really need to worry about that as much. Now, that does go through, and it looks like Olive is going to switch up the Serpent, probably because they do have the read that the first set was a Serpent, because Bobby was sitting on that for a while, and Olive didn't know about the Serpent in hand. Now, Bobby could have just been slow rolling the Serpent and then setting it second, um, but oh, Raigeki coming down here, so it won't even matter. Uh, hitting the Serpent, so that was the first set, and a Witch. Okay, Witch is going to be pretty good for Bobby here, getting a powerful search, potentially something to dig themselves a little bit out of the hole. But I wonder why Alf is going for the aggressive play now. Because only 1,700 damage on board is not really the best. I mean, they could have Necrofear, which would definitely be a way to push for more damage here. But if you get Necrofear, I feel like you want to go Necrofear first and then Raigeki in case they do want to just Trench Tribute the board. Now, the fact that they had Serpent and Witch means that TT is probably not in the back row, as you'd probably be fine TTing that board. But maybe they were so just saving it for Necrofear. But, uh... Yeah, they're going to start to exile. Exile will be able to deal with the tomato there. And it looks like Alf's just going to attack in for 17. So no need to sort of risk going in um, to a TT with the Necrofear. Um, and 17 yard damage is still a bit of pressure on Bobby here. And Mirror Force will come down indeed. It's kind of uh, an awkward Mirror Force because, you know, Alf does get back the Serpent there. But with only 4,600 life points left, you kind of do have to um, use it that defensively, right? So... They're just going to, or Alf's going to pass back to Bobby. Bobby will get back the Serpent, so we could just see another Serpent set play here. Or they could just try and get aggressive, exiled, forcing the set monster. A lot of different options for Bobby, especially given that they've got a lot of cards in hand that we don't know about. Uh, we know about the Serpent and the Exiled, but there are three unknowns that could definitely turn the tide here. And if we check their graveyard, they've used up no Nobleman of Crossouts yet. So they are on Nobleman, which they were going second. So bringing in Nobleman going second isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, especially if you see that your opponent's on Germs and they set Germ in game one. Uh, that can be pretty good. Going for Duo now that the Serpent is out of rotation. Uh, and hitting a Yadagarasu, so that's pretty good. And a Graceful. Oh, man. Okay, that also explains why Ala flipped up the Serpent because they are trying to bait removal on the Serpent there. Um... But yeah, brutal stuff. This could be a big, big turn uh, for Bobby here. And Olive has used up Raigeki. They've used up Dark Hole. So, oh, and Raigeki coming down for Bobby here, hitting a Dark Geroid. Whoa! On the Super Spice here. This card is actually a pretty good card. It can get over most things in the format by just sinking them down with its effect. But yeah, this is a this is a brutal play. I mean, Olive will be able to add back that Serpent, but Graceful's in Grave, and yeah, it, it's just tough. That's it, probably a Serpent as well. Um, and no Raigeki, no Dark Hole. So can't really easily clear this. 
There are some things they can do to potentially push for lethal this turn. Like, if they've got knock, they can knock the serpent. And if they've got, like, Chain of Heart or Snatch Kill, they can uh, take control of the Jinzo. But it's not quite lethal damage. It looks like they're going to go for a serpent. They are indeed going to Change of Heart the Jinzo here. So they're probably going to try and attack over the set with the serpent in case it's another serpent. And it is indeed that other serpent. And then get in for 2400. So that's not a bad play by any means. There are two MSTs still used up. Oh, but Mirage coming down. So if Bobby wants to use that MST, they got to decide, do I use it on the Mirage of Nightmare or do I use it on the uh, Snatch Shield there? Uh, I feel like you might want to just use it on the Snatch Shield because the only real out to Mirage of Nightmare here is the one MST remaining in all of the deck. And so they have to draw that out. Otherwise, that Mirage is going to start pitching cards. Um, so it's definitely an interesting situation to go in. But it looks like Bobby does not have an MST in hand. Now, if you do want to, like, use, like, Heavy Storm, uh, Harpy's Feather Duster is gone, but Heavy Storm is still legal in the format. And if you do want to use Heavy Storm here, then it's awkward because, oh, okay, well, Snatch on the Jinzo will also do something here. Uh, so that will take the Jinzo, and now the Jinzo will be able to attack over the Serpent, dealing 21. Now, it's kind of awkward because, like, now Olive can add back the Serpent in the standby phase and essentially, like, fade one of the discards off Mirage if they don't have a way to out it. Uh, looks like they are going to go for MST on their own Mirage to clear that. So that way they do keep the cards in hand. It will gain a thousand here as well and add back the serpent. So I'm curious what they're going to go for here. Uh, they could go for something like, you know, bringing out a Necrofear and just attacking the Vigenza to take control of it. But I feel like that's kind of awkward because then the Snatch Shields are still gaining life. But I don't know. Harpies will also will also clear that Snatch. So now they get back the Jinzo and they could try and go for a lethal push here. If they've got the serpent, they want to attack over the set. Uh, oh, or they got Necrofear. Necrofear will also clear pretty much everything in this format, and that sort of shows part of the power of Necrofear, right? It's a big late-game bomb, and uh, that extension can really come up, so it is indeed coming up here. Necrofear coming down onto the field, and I guess they could go for lethal with the Necrofear if they wanted to, but they're just going to play it safe, uh, attacking the set, and that will be the end of the game. So intense stuff there for sure, like big, big back and forth, and yeah, that was a really, really good game. And I think this does show, like, why this format's so fun. Like, there are so many power cards running around. We saw power cards getting thrown left and right. But, like, everyone has access to those power cards. So, if you go all in on your power cards, you've got to worry about your opponent responding to you on the following turn. And it, it just makes things very explosive. But explosive in a way that, like, you can't go all in just immediately when you get the power card. You do have to play them skillfully. And so there is that element of skill there. There's that element of grind that we saw in the game. Uh, as both players were just sort of sitting across the table, staring at each other, waiting for the other one to make a move. Uh, it is just so, so fun. You really would not expect it to be this good, given some of the powerful cards legal in this format. But it is so good. Oh, I, I can't wait for this game three. Now, of course, like, I don't want to play favorites here. But I do kind of want to see this Necrofear move on. I, I want to see all of you two win another tournament, this time with Necrofear. Because Necrofear... Such a cool boss monster. One of the earliest boss monsters that could actually see some legitimate play in the DM era. So I just want to see this Necrofear deck go far. But Bobby is by no means out of it. They're playing Parchap. They're playing some interesting stuff too. So I would like to see them do well as well. And this is double elimination. So no matter which Duelist loses here, they still have a chance to make it to the finals. Uh, just going through the lower bracket. So... Man, I'm excited to see what happens here. I'm just going to check the challenge as well to see if any other games are wrapped up. So it looks like Dean won against Alon. Uh, Seaspare won against Juicy Trippy. And Lay Murphy won against Lalo. So, uh, and also Barcode won against Food there. Okay. So it looks like some other games have been going on while we've been watching this one. But this one just seems so intense. Looks like Duo's coming down. Duo will get to rip some cards out of hand. And that's going to hit... A Necrofear. Oh, no, not the Necrofear. Uh, now, the question is if all of you two is playing more than one Necrofear or if that was it. But uh, when you coming down, that's a pretty good side deck tech here. This thing can stop the rats, can stop tomatoes. Uh, so I do like this play um, by Bobby. It's a very formidable board. And uh, they're going to go for Forceful here. So Forceful will get, we'll get a peek at Bobby's hand here. Okay, it looks like Fiber Jar, Storm, and Call are all there. Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough choice. Uh, Fiber Jar is just super powerful because it can reset the game, but... And and also the thing about Fiber Jar is, like, if all of you two wants to reset the game from this position, they don't necessarily have the option to force Bobby to use the Fiber Jar, right? Bobby's going to use the Fiber Jar when it benefits them. 
So you don't necessarily want to send back the fiber. Um, or, or yeah, okay, it looks like Call's going to get sent back. So I, I think Call isn't bad. It does signal that Alf probably doesn't have that much spell and trap removal because uh, Bobby doesn't really have a way to like fully utilize the Call if um, if they want to. So yeah, it looks like uh, Alf's just going to set one and set another pass back. Now, is that back row like Jar of Greed or something? Oh, it's just MST. So they're clearing the back row with that. And they hit another MST. So it looks like they did have MST, which makes me a little bit surprised that they got rid of the Call and the Haunted. But I mean, it is what it is. And they're going to use Witch to search out a monster here to potentially hit over the Wanghu. But will it be enough? Do they have a monster that can do it? They do have Gemini Elf. So Gemini Elf will be able to do it. And they know that the back row that Bobby might set here is probably going to be Storm. They could have drawn into something like a Mirror Force or some other way to deal with the Elf. But okay, it looks like they did draw into another back row and they probably are expecting to use that back row soon because the other back row here is Storm. Last card in hand is Fiber Jar. So that's some information for Olive here. And they're just going to play into the back row if the back row exists. I mean, this could be a bluff by Bobby. So uh, you kind of got to do it. And that will indeed go through. So that will hit over Wang Hu here, healing 200 more. And now I think Olive is in a really good position. Bobby could set the Fiber, but again, Fiber Jar resets everything except for the life points. And Bobby is lower on life points now. So this is a little bit awkward. They're going to set one. It might be the Fiber Jar. Uh, and if it is the Fiber Jar, I think Olive is just fine just attacking into it with the Elf. You don't necessarily want to commit another monster to board because if you, can another, if you commit another monster, then you can't normal summon set after the Fiber Jar resolves. So I, I think it's fine just attacking in. I mean, there is also the potential that Bobby did not set the Fiber Jar here. And Olive has to consider that because if Bobby didn't set the Fiber Jar, then they could just be using this to try and block off a direct attack to their life points. But I think it is probably still worth just to attack him with the elf. But they are thinking. They're they're thinking. And it is an important moment to think, I think. Because I mean this is like I think in every game of Yada they're always like and honestly every game of Yu-Gi-Oh! there are, are these points where like you have two options or more than two options. And if you go one way or another way it will just determine the way the game goes from that point on. So uh, this is definitely one of those moments, I think, where it will determine the outcome of the game. And, uh, it looks like Olive did set a monster here, not choosing to attack into the Fiber Jar, if it is a Fiber Jar, and it is indeed the Fiber Jar. Uh, will that go through? Fine. And that will go through? Fine. So that is a bit rough here. Um, yeah, that's just kind of unfortunate, because now Bobby will have the priority to do things. Uh, it seems like Olive probably did not think it was a Fiber Jar there, but, uh, unfortunately, it looks like it was, so... Yeah, Fiber Jar has to get shuffled back in. Um, uh, is the Fiber macro glitching? Oh, okay, there is a macro for Fiber Jar on the uh, the thing. You do have to click. You have to click Shuffle Fiber Jar back to do it. Um, so that might be it because they do give you the option, like, do you shuffle Fiber Jar back in or not? But either way, like, once it wraps up, you should just be able to manually add the Fiber Jar back into the deck and then, um, and then just... Uh, draw a new hand so because you should be able to draw a fiber jar in the hand that you draw a fiber jar so uh yeah so it looks like uh they're doing that indeed they're adding those cards back shuffling up the deck and drawing a new hand here so it's very easy to fix if that does happen um but yeah it just is there are multiple options on the macro so you do have to sort of keep that in mind um but yeah, it could also just be lag. Like, lag could have played a uh, role here. DB is uh, a mysterious entity, and sometimes it works in mysterious ways. So, could definitely be that. So, uh, Bobby will have the option here just to bring out a monster attack in. Pot's going to help out a lot, too. I mean, man, this is a, this is a good fiber jar for Bobby. Yeah, and as I said, like, that was sort of one of the... If, if Alf had attacked into the Fiber Jar last turn, things would have been very different here. Um, oh, it looks like both players are sort of experiencing a difference in what they see happening. So that, that's very strange. So I think this was just a DB glitch here. But, um, yeah, now Bobby can use that copy first, get full hand knowledge for Alfia 2, and uh, rip a card out of hand. Um, th here, here's an interesting debate, uh, folks, that I was I was wondering about. So, if you compare something like a hand rip like Confi or Forceful to something like Dust Shoot, um, which one is stronger? Because Dust Shoot can only bring back monsters, but oftentimes when you use Dust Shoot, it's during your opponent's turn. So you basically have full knowledge of what they have. Like, you have entire knowledge of their hand and what they're going to do with that hand. 
Uh, whereas Confi and Forceful, you do get to, you know, get rid of a card. Uh, Confi costs you a thousand, so, you know, that's a light point cost that you're, you're losing. But also, your opponent gets a draw on the next turn. So that one unknown card can throw a wrench into the works because that's a bit of uncertainty. If your opponent plays their cards right from that point, then you don't quite know where certain cards are, and that could potentially come up. So what which you all think is better? Do you think that uh, Death Shoot's full hand knowledge is better, or do you think that the hand rips are better? I personally think the hand rips are probably a bit better because it does rip the card out of hand. Um, but I do also think that the hand rips are kind of less frustrating, which is kind of paradoxical, but like... The thing about Death Shoot is, like, if you get Death Shoot on your turn, you're just like, well, I, I guess I can't really play this turn, right? Um, I mean, there's certain hands that you can play through Death Shoot, but, like, if you do get Death Shoot, I'm just like, my opponent knows everything I'm going to do this turn. So this turn's kind of like a wasted turn. Um, but with the hand rips, I'm like, okay, well, this this draw can potentially turn things around uh, because my opponent doesn't know that, and, you know, this could be something good, especially given that there are so many powerful cards in the format. So uh, what do you all think about that? Um, the sort of differences between the hand rips and dust shoot because I do think it's a very interesting question. No, no, it's it's fine. The jar did the jar went back eventually. Like realistically, this is um, this should be good. It it's not cheating. It's not cheating because it did go back eventually. He shuffled up again and drew five. So so this is this is all good. Um, I'm I mean I I can I can message Bobby. Uh, whoops, not movie. Uh, yeah, because we saw on stream here, like we were seeing the same thing that Bobby was seeing. Um, yeah, we saw on stream, so. Just a weird DB glitch. Yeah, so it, it it's fine. So I'm I'm glad you're watching this because uh, I don't want this game to end in like a, a technicality getting a loss because we we did see the fiber jar stay on field, so it was just kind of a weird thing uh, there. So yeah, so this this game should just go on like normal. Um, yeah, not sure if uh. Not not sure if a uh, if a judge is going to be called on this, but I I think it's personally fine. Um, so yeah, it should be good. But that can that can happen occasionally. Um, so they're they're hashing this out, but I think it I think it should still be good. Um, yeah, because we I mean that's that's the great thing about watching this is that like we've got record. Uh, Yeah, Bobby's good. Like both players here are fine. Uh, yeah, both players here are fine. Um, so, yeah, it, it, we we caught it on stream. So there's nothing. There's there's no like shade thrown on any player. It was just a weird DB thing. Um, yeah, if people want, they can they can go back to watch the vod. Um, yeah. So that will go through. Uh, but this is a very good hand from from Bobby. But that can happen once a fiber jar resolves and you draw into pot, right? Like that that happens sometimes. So uh, hitting a duo out of hand, so that means that they maybe don't want to commit too much to board. It also means that they probably don't have a serpent in hand. Um, yeah, very interesting pick because duo is random, and you can potentially play around it by like committing a bunch. Oh, duo of their own. Oh, that is rough. Um, I generally. I get why they do this, because, like, if uh, Aleph has a Serpent in hand, then that's kind of rough. But what I generally like to do is I like to go Duo, then Confi, because that gives you sort of the pick of the cream of the crop, right? Because you've done the random discards off Duo, maybe you hit something really good in hand, and um, then once you've done that, you can then go for Confi, rip a card out of hand. There's a risk to Duo hitting a Serpent, but if they've got Serpent in hand, like, you're kind of just screwed with Duo anyways. So, like, I don't know. Um... <laughs> she's fair. Yeah, she's fair. So I too resolve my fiber until I get pot confi duo. I mean, again, oh yeah, we saw it on stream. We saw the fiber jar not going back into the deck. Uh, so this is all fine. Like it was just a weird DB thing, but uh, it did work out for Bobby in the end here. But 
Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a weird DB thing. I mean, on stream, I said, like, all, you know, you can just shuffle back the fiber chart and, and, uh, you know, reset the hand, but it was just a very weird thing. Um, so yeah, it is, it is perfectly fine. Uh, people can go back and check the VOD of the stream if they, if they want to see proof of that. But yeah, this is going to be pretty rough, um, for Aleph here. Uh, Bobby is still lower on life points. They're at 4,800. Uh, so that's nothing to sort of scoff at, but. Uh, yeah, this is a bit tricky, and it looks like Alpha just not drawing the monsters here. Yeah, the duo hitting the the germ is really rough. It seems like they really need that monster, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, that elf is just soloing. It's just hidden in every turn till nineteen, and it seems like Alpha doesn't necessarily have a way that they want to get rid of it with. I mean, they could have like Ring or Mirror Force, but they're saving it because they figured that they could deal with the elf in other ways. But okay, Mirage is going to be pretty good here. Uh, just drawing into things and uh, potentially getting you out of this situation. Uh, Bobby looks like it's DC'd again. DB issues out the wazoo. Tons of DB issues today. But, uh, I mean, we do have a fair amount of people playing it for um, for this tournament. And, uh, yeah, setting two more back row there and passing back. So, that's going to be pretty good. Alf gets four draws here. They very likely do have an MST as well. Looks like Bobby does not have an MST here. So... That's gonna, if anything can get Alf out of this, it is that. Um, and that's also part of why the hand rips are like more okay in a format like this than I think they are in some other formats. Because even if you do get hand ripped in the beginning, if you've got like Mirage, if you've got Fiber Jar, you do have ways to recover from that uh, sort of loss of advantage early on. So uh, it, it is sort of an interesting dynamic there, I think. But yeah, Alf hidden in for 19, dropping Alf down to 2300. Very scary spot to be in, especially with Ring in the format. And another set here. So that set could be a variety of things. Uh, is there an MST? I mean, there should be an MST. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, if there's no MST in the back row, then setting five is honestly kind of awkward here because if you draw into an MST, you can't actually use it. Um, but it looks like there will be the MST there. And yeah, five cards in hand, three cards in back row. It's a lot of cards on field, but Bobby also has seven cards. So like the, the card advantage is not that different between the two players. Uh, it's kind of wild to see, but Graceful will hopefully help Aleph a, a little bit here. And uh, they will draw three and pitch two. What will they be pitching? If they got a serpent in hand, then that's going to be pretty good for them. Graceful's so busted in this format. Graceful busted in every format, really. Um, but yeah, it, it is uh, just being able to dig deeper into your deck and see those power cards is really good. Um, it, it does actually make some very interesting decisions, though, because you have so many power cards. If you're drawing into those power cards and you're like, You've got a hand of like Raigeki Dark Hole Monster Reborn or something like what do you what do you pitch, right? Like it I, I think like the decisions off Graceful are are much more are much harder in this format than a lot of other formats. Um if you think about like Graceful and Goat, like part of the power of Graceful and Goat is that there's so many good discards for it. Like Night Assailant, for instance. Um you pitch another Night Assailant, add back, you know, the first Night Assailant. Uh, you got Thunder Dragon as well. You do have Thunder Dragon legal in this format, but people don't really play it because it's kind of a brick. And uh, in a format like this, you really do want every card that you draw to do something. So really the only good pitch off Graceful is like Serpent. But then also you have to pitch one more card on top of that. So it really does lead to some very, very interesting decisions because like you're staring at a hand of like busted cards and you're like, which one do I send? You know, um, so it looks like they're going to send Mirror Force here. So that means that they probably have a way to deal with this board here. Um, yeah, a Forceful here on the hand is going to be very good. And will they go? It, it probably will go through because if uh, if Bobby had IO, they would have flipped that up on the graceful for sure. But yeah, it looks like we're gonna get a peek at what Bobby's got going. It looks like they've got Fiber Snatch, Premature Burial, and Raigeki. So we know the set isn't Fiber Jar, so that is good to know. Um, good having that information there. But then the question becomes, what is that set? Could be a Moth. A lot of powerful spells in Grave. So if it's Moth, that's gonna be pretty rough. The nice thing about Forceful is it shuffles back. So if it is a Moth, you know, they can't get back the, like, Raigeki, for instance, that's being sent here. But yeah, this is, this is rough stuff for sure. The rough thing, too, is that, like, if Alf does have, like, a Confi or, like, a Duo, that's basically dead because you don't want to activate that and drop yourself down below ring range on the Elf. So, yeah, it's rough stuff. And they're going to set a bunch and pass back to Bobby here. So pitching the mirror for is very interesting there 
because Mirror Force is one of the most defensive cards in the game. So it's very interesting that they did that instead of um, instead of something else. But maybe the back rows are just really, really important. Could be like TTs, could be a variety of things, I guess. Or maybe the Snatch Deal did change things, right? Spy flipping up, Spy getting out two more Spies. And Alf is thinking here, they could potentially give a TT, but if you TT this, then the other Spy can still hit the field. So you want to save the TT for when the second Spy hits the field. Um, and that second Spy will indeed hit the field. Will a TT be fired now? Okay, it looks like no. So that set could be a Spy of their own. It could be some Germs potentially, but Germ is kind of awkward because, again, you're going below that threshold that you want. Yep, it is indeed a Spy. So Spy will get out two more Spies from deck. And that is a pretty good defensive wall on Alakia2's part. And Bobby's thinking here. I mean, we know that they've got Fiber Jar. We know that they've got Snatch. Yeah, the Spy is coming out. Janjo in the house. Welcome to the stream. Yeah, I mean, Spy is a card that has been seeing more play in Yada recently. And I mean, we're seeing it here. Uh, two very different decks but both playing the Spies. It looks like uh, Bobby's not going to set the Fiber. That is a potential play they could have done. Just setting the Fiber Jar to try and reset the game uh, and just get in for that last 2,300 points of damage. But they're probably worried about, like, Red Geki uh, or Dark Hole. So I think this makes sense to keep the, the Fiber Jar because then you save it for if, you know, your opponent uses Red Geki uh, here and then attacks in. Yeah, Yada is hot. Yada is on the rise, in my opinion. I think Yada is one of the best formats in the game's history. Uh, I mean, <laughs> listen, I, the, the formats that I've played, like, uh, in this sort of context is, like, all the DMR formats, GOAT format, Edison format, a bit of Tengu. Like, I mean, I did play some, like, casually um, over the course of the game's history, but those are the ones that I've actually played in, in like, a competitive context or a somewhat competitive context. Um, so I don't know all the games, the, the formats in the game's history, but Yada format is just so, so fun. It is definitely one of the best of the DM era. And um, I think it shouldn't be overlooked. Like, if if we're sort of doing a thing where, like, we pick one format from each era, uh, Goat is GX. So, you know, it does count for the GX stuff. And I think it probably would take the pick for GX. I mean, GX does have some fun formats later on, like Perfect Circle and um, a variety of other things. But And we'll get to those on the channel soon. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like... Yada just perfectly encapsulates um, the DM era, and it's just really, really fun to play, really, really back and forth, and very, very skillful, too. Like, both these players are great players, and they've both been, like, I mean, they've been thinking a lot this game, because there's a lot to think about, and, I mean, it, it's just so cool seeing this back and forth. And Chain of Fire coming down on a Spy, so Spy will be able to clear the other Spy there. Uh, Sangan also potentially crashing in to the Spy as well, but... Yeah, All of You 2 is just cracked. All of You 2 is, like, so good in this format. Raigeki coming down. Okay, this is not lethal damage, uh, except if there's a ring. So, okay, it looks like they're going for the lethal line. Ring! Oh, hitting a ring there. Uh, That should... No, okay, this won't be... Okay, it will be lethal through ring because you've still got the sang to ring. So this is going to come down to the wire because... The idea here is that you switch the other spy to attack, attack in for 3,400, then you ring your sang in. So that would be lethal. But there's one more back row there for Bobby. If that back row is mirror force, then this could just be the end of the game. However, you know, I, I've said in the past, and I do think this is true, especially in a format like this. Sometimes you just have to go for, like, if they've got the card, they've got the card. But if they don't, you know, you win the game, and you just kind of go, for that and it looks like they don't have the mirror force in the back row and it looks like in main two they're probably going to go for the ring here or they're going to wait uh in case the last set is book of moon which it could be i guess but um i feel like i feel like you could just go for the the ring on the sand game like there's not really much risk to uh not doing that because you know the hand is like pre mat which is dead now snatch fiber jar um so I, I think that this is still fine. And it's just, you might as well play around the book, right? So this is a tough spot for Bobby because you don't necessarily want to... Okay, snatch on the spy there. So this means that uh, if Alfie 2 does want to use ring on the Sangan to dodge around book, uh, Bobby can still book the Sangan and get in for lethal that way. 
So this is this is forcing something. This this is, this is a big thing. This is a big thing, and this, this is the correct play on Bobby's part, in my opinion, at least. Because if you uh, if you like snatch the sand game, right? First of all, it doesn't really do anything, and second of all, if all of you two wants to ring it, then the book will. Oh, Io coming down here. Okay, Io. Okay, so this means they can't have ring in the back row because what you do, if you had ring in the back row, you would have just fired the ring on the sand game. And then if they activate a book, then you just use IO. So, okay. Uh, it, it snaps does not go to grave here. Um, uh, snaps does not go to grave. Uh, I'll just, uh, I, I got Bobby online here. Uh, snatch, uh, not in grave. Yeah. It, it just, uh, it just, uh, stays on field. Um, yeah. I can message Olive as well. Um, but yeah, it because it's an equip spell. So yeah, okay, yeah. Uh yeah, snatch not in grave. Yeah, it's it's an equip. So um so it does just stay around, even though it is negated. Because I wouldn't destroy the cards, it just negates the effects. So you can still equip things to things. And that's why if you activate snatch under an IO on a Reaper, the Reaper will still die because it has been targeted by the snatch. And so yeah. Yeah, it, there is sort of that there is sort of that debate uh or there there is sort of that thought where like it might not because it's not equipped yet but uh it does still equip. It just doesn't have its effect. Um yeah, so that that's a reasonable thought though. Um but yeah, just switching the uh spider defense and setting one and passing back. Now, that snatch will not gain uh all 1000 here in standby unless they let the uh IO go. So, they're thinking. They're thinking. Okay, they're checking something. So, this could be something they're checking um, with a judge, or, or they could confirm with me, or... Uh, it's a bit tricky, but... Um, yeah, there's a lot of weird rulings with Io, or, like, not necessarily even rulings, but just weird interactions with Io that can happen. Like, Io and Mirage are also um, something there. I mean, yeah, you could be checking the Io snatch ruling. I mean, I... Like, I'm not technically a judge, so, like, you know, don't necessarily just uh, check my rulings, um, things on everything, but... Oh, yeah, in the standby, yeah. So, basically what happens there is if you let IO go, then the Snatch will take control of the monster that has been equipped to it, and you will gain a 1,000 from that. So, that's that's what happens uh, with IO Snatch. Um, it, it's very strange, like, IO interacting with things that, like, with spells that activate in standby is, like, very... It's, it's always very weird, but... Um, the, the big thing is like with, uh, IO Mirage, because it, let's say you've got an IO and your opponent has a Mirage up and, um, it's your standby phase. If you let the IO go, your opponent will be able to draw off Mirage. Um, the only way that doesn't happen is if your opponent says, if you pass priority on the IO to give your opponent, um, the option to pass on Mirage. And then they say, oh yeah, I just won't draw off Mirage. You know, I'll, I'll let Mirage resolve here. He'll get negated by IO. And now, you know, good to go back to you. But realistically, that never happens. So if your opponent does want to draw off Mirage, they they can draw off Mirage um, if IO drops uh, in that standby phase. Very, very strange stuff. Uh, as a note, if you control the uh, Mirage... Okay, looks like they're checking with me. Uh, uh, yes. You will... You'll also gain a thousand, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yep, that will go through. So, yeah, so that'll get passed over, and they'll gain a thousand. So, the, this is a very, very good spot to be in. I mean, it's awkward because your opponent now has a ton of monsters here. Um... Okay, it looks like they're going to bring out the tomato and try and kill through that spy there. Okay, this is a very, very clever play. And uh, they're going to switch the saying in defense just in case it's Mirror Force. Uh, you don't want to give your opponent the opp opportunity to do the crackback, but it looks like that set was just a pre-mat. And that will be the end of the game. Incredible stuff. Yeah, that, that is a wild ending. Uh, the statue actually coming back to bite Bobby Bodega in the butt. Oh, wow, that is incredible. That that was incredible, awesome stuff. Yeah, it, it wasn't Bobby's fault. Like, uh, the the glitch was caught on stream. Uh, so yeah, um, 
yeah, glitch was caught on stream, so I can I can message uh Olive. Uh yeah. Okay, or or it's just over, so it doesn't really matter, but yeah, Dark Hole and Wangu here. Uh, unfortunately, neither of those would really do enough here, but yeah, great, great stuff. Intense stuff. Yeah, that is whew, that 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 was too that was that was too intense for my blood. That was like, oh man. And I mean that's that's part of the fun of these uh games in this format. Like this format is so intense. Um we got barcode versus Lay Murphy. I think that could be a good one to dive into because barcode has played in a bunch of these as well. Lay Murphy is very good duelist in a variety of formats. I'm not sure how much experience they have in Yada, but uh they're playing the Sasuke Samurai. Very cool stuff here. Uh MST on Lay Murphy's Mirage here. And this is game three. So we're diving in at the end of an intense one here. But uh whew, this is this has been some great games. I mean, Yada games are so intense. Like, I don't think you really quite get how intense they are until you play the format. But it is just wild how many games get down to the wire, down to, like, that last few cards, the weird interactions between, like, IU and Snatch, and, like, knowing when to push for certain things. Like, it is just insane. And so I'm really glad we got to see that game on camera because that was, oh my goodness, that was awesome. So, yeah, great stuff there. And, uh, yeah, I'm just going to answer a message here, but yeah, uh, so Sasuke is interesting. Sasuke is kind of vulnerable here. <clears throat> a lot of people don't like play Sasuke that much because like it is a bit of a weak monster. It does play into a warrior package and it looks like they are on Rota, so, you know, you can play it with that. Might be, honestly, a side deck card for whatever Barcode's playing. But looks like Barcode's also on some Warrior stuff. So that's kind of interesting. They've got the Zambira there. And they are going for a Rota here as well. And, uh, wait, did they not add back the Serpent? Oh, that's, I guess you don't want to add back the Serpent to then... Okay, yeah, because you're committing the Zalug this turn, you want to draw more off Mirage. So that makes sense. Uh, so there are times when you actually do want to tactically not add back the Serpent to hand. Um, which is kind of interesting. Most formats, that is not the case, but here it actually does have some uh, reasonable applications. And Ending in Exile is very, very good for barcode here. So, they'll also draw three more. And uh, these could be three good ones, especially when the Serpent's coming back to sort of lessen the blow of the discards that you would discard. Very, very powerful stuff. Lay's thinking. Yeah, this, this is a tough spot to be in. I mean, if you're thinking about, like, card advantage, like, yes, the Mirage could discard a bunch here, but, like, they get back Serpent. They also have, if they have MST for the Mirage, which they haven't gone through, they've gone through one MST here, but, yep, there's another MST on that Mirage. And uh, they get back Serpent here as well, and it's just brutal stuff. I mean, Fiber Jar could potentially alleviate things a bit, and that set could be a Fiber Jar. So you never know what you're going to get there. Um, but if they do manage to clear the set and then attack him with the Saluga again, you're bleeding out more cards. So it is just rough. Premat here going for the Witch. Will that go through? It looks like it will go through. I mean, that makes sense because uh, Barco probably has to read that Lay does not have an MST. Because if Lay had an MST, then they would fire MST on the Premat. And, uh, or not on the Premat, on the uh, Mirage. And then just prevent uh, Barcode from drawing here. But uh, yeah, that is a really good play. Going for pre-mount on Witch, uh, tripping it over for Jinzo, and then searching out Exiled for the follow-up. This is a uh, brutal stuff. I mean, 4-star will be able to stop these Lug, so at least you're not getting your hand ripped. But this is still a really tough spot to be in. But as we've seen throughout this tournament, uh, there have been a lot of very intense games that people have just been able to claw their way back from the brink of defeat. So definitely not the end of the game by any means. I mean, both players still have a lot of life points as well. But uh, definitely a rough situation for Lay to be in, for sure. Especially because they know about the Exiled. So yeah, they're adding back Serpent here. So the whatever they said here could be the Serpent. And so that does sort of disincentivize Barcode from Exiled forcing it. Um, okay, it looks like uh, Disconnect. looks like DB's having some issues today. That's just classic DB, you know. Um, but yeah, they're thinking. And they're going to set one. And they're going to... Oh, oh, no. The the misclick. Oh, I've done that before. That is so unfortunate. Yeah, I've done that. But, um... Yeah, deal with it. Welcome to the stream. 
yeah, I, I do think this format is one of the most based in the DM era. You missed some awesome games. Uh, all of you do is on a spicy deck, and they faced Bobby Bodega, and those games were down to the wire. Those games were so, so cool. Um, yeah, that is, that is, oh, it was just such a great game. I'm so happy that we got it on stream there. Uh, I, I don't know if that's allowed. Um, I don't think that's allowed. Yeah, the other card was set already. So I don't think that that's actually allowed, even though the misclick happened. Yeah, I don't think that's, that's quite allowed. Like, I, I don't, like, I, it, it just is what it is, right? Like, it's, it's just torn policy. Like, if you misclick and discard, like, that's obviously really unfortunate, right? But you also can't, like, you, you can't take back previously known information, right? Um, so, yeah, it looks like they're resetting that. And, uh, yeah, so I think that that was reset back to the point. Yeah. Uh, closer to deck, I assume, but yeah. Uh, yeah, because you gotta, you gotta maintain the information already known. Uh, if both were set that turn, then it would have been fine. Just be like, oh, well, you know, I, I missed and then do it. But unfortunately, like in that case, it, it's just rough, but like it, it is what it is, you know, but yeah, deal with it. It is a spicy game. So I uh, definitely recommend watching that back. Uh, we'll, we'll get Alfie two on stream again, uh, with their Necrofear deck. If we can get Bobby on stream, that would also be great. Um, but yeah, just intense stuff. And Reaper's going to reap away that Zalug there. That's obviously very unfortunate because one play you could do is bring out Zalug, attack over the Reaper just to deal some damage. It's not necessarily the best because then they just go Jinzo attack over Zalug and then Reaper attack in for another card. But it is something and you just want options here. But unfortunately, that Reaper and that Jinzo are, are depriving you of a lot of those options. So this is going to be a tough game for Lay to draw themselves back from. Um, but it is rough. So Luke is coming down here, so it looks like they are probably going to attack into the Reaper there. Just deal that damage, get a card out of hand, do what you can. Um, if they hit the Servant, that's obviously very unfortunate, but uh, they hit Exile Force, so that is pretty good. Um, you want to get rid of that, so that way you can go for bigger plays later. Uh, they did indeed add the Serpent to hand, so that also could get ripped by the Reaper there. So... Yeah, and Jinzo's going to hit over the Zalug, and Reaper's going to attack in for 300, rip a card out of hand. Lady's got to hope that it's the Serpent. If it's not, then they lose their last live card in hand. And, uh, oh, it's not the Serpent. That is brutal. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, so now they've got Serpent plus one unknown plus two back row that are likely dead against Jinzo. So, yeah, it's not looking good. Dark Hole, though. Dark Hole is a great draw. Yeah, Dark Hole is, uh... If you want to get back into the game, Dark Hole's one way to do it. And uh, another four-star Lady Bug of Doom. So it looks like both players are on the four-star tech. Uh, and it looks like Lay's going to set that uh, Sinister Serpent, stave off a bit of the damage. And things are looking a little bit better for them now. So it's definitely not out of the hole, right? They need things to actually um, get back their card advantage and start dealing in more damage. But, you know, this is a bit of a stabilizing position to be in. Reaper's coming down. That can hit over the Serpent, so you might as well do it. Oh, what a call! No! It's all... It's all happening all over again! Uh, yeah, that's rough. And Jinzo will hit the field now. Jinzo's shutting off uh, any of Lay's back row. Reaper hitting in over the Serpent. Uh, Jinzo hitting in for 24. Uh, oh, that is... That's brutal. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. Yeah, that's how it goes sometimes, though. But, uh... I, again, you know, the, it's not the end of the world, but, um, yeah, yeah, they, they are indeed Agmec. Serp, yeah, you need the Serp here. I mean, it's, oh, you, you can't afford to, uh, to, to not have the Serp, but it might not even matter. They're doing a huge thing here, though, so they might have something, but not looking good. It is not looking good at all. But, you know, if they got something, they kind of got to go for it, you know? Because if Barcode has any other monster in hand, they can just summon that out attack in for game. So, realistically, you do have to go for it. And Warriors do have a lot of monsters. They have Rotas to get into monsters. Okay, it looks like Lei is checking a ruling here. So, um, I'm curious what that ruling is. <clears throat> but, it might be like, uh, if Call's destroyed while Jinzo's on field, will Jinzo die? And, unfortunately, it will not die for Lei. Um... So, yeah, could be rough stuff. 
could be I mean, there's a variety of rulings it could be. This format is packed with a bunch of, like, deceptive rulings that you wouldn't necessarily consider. Uh, change of heart on the Reaper that will kill the Reaper there. So, uh, that does deal with that, at least. But, yeah, it's still an awkward spot. You set one, keep one in hand, so that way they don't know whether it's Serpent or not. But, yeah, this, this is just rough. A Serpent coming down. Serpent's probably going to hit in, and it does need hit in. Hitting a Sangan. Okay, so that will survive. And uh, Barcode will take 300 from that. Now, does Barcode actually want to attack into the Sangyan with the Jinzo? They're thinking about it. Uh, I'd say probably not. I'd say just leave the Sangyan because, like, you're not getting in more damage this turn. I guess the idea is that, like, Lay doesn't necessarily have... I mean, if they set one, then, like, Barcode can just do the thing that they've been doing and get in for more damage next turn. It seems like they don't really have any powerful monsters besides Serpent. So... You know, realistically, like, how much damage are they going to get into? And also, saying straight out Fiber Jar as well, which obviously Barco does not want Lay to get Fiber Jar, because that can potentially reset the game here. So, it looks like Barco is just passing back to Lay. So, Lay's got Serpent and one Unknown. Now, there are a couple different options they can go for here. If they do really want the Fiber Jar, what they could do is they could attack the Sangan into the Jinzo, and then search the Fiber Jar that way. Instead, they're going to set the Serpent. I think this probably is the best play for them just to wall up a little bit more. Um, and this way they don't take 1,400 points of damage and also, like, heavily telegraph the Fiber Jar. I mean, if they search Fiber Jar here off Sangin, that's going to be tele telegraphed no matter what. But, like, I think this probably is for the best. I don't think that Lei can easily kill them here unless they've got, like, Raigeki. But, uh, I mean, they have to have Raigeki, right? And if they've got Raigeki, you're dead anyways. So, um, I think it's fine to, to do this. Painful Choice coming down here, setting five. If anything can get barcode into a winning position this turn it is this card so painful again very powerful card but very difficult to use we'll have to see how barcode uses it here yeah they've got a lot of powerful cards in deck that they could potentially use here uh, let's let's think let's think through it um if we were cooking with that painful what would we what would we send so raigeki wins you the game Pro well, Regeki might not win you the game, but yeah, if you get another monster, Regeki wins you the game. So, Regeki is one. Change of Heart could potentially win you the game, because what you do... Actually, Change of Heart just outright wins you the game. Uh, Snatch Deal outright wins you the game, unless they've got MST. So, those are two you could do. Reborn, yeah, Reborn probably also wins you the game. Um, looks like they're sending Darkhole as well. Uh, Darkhole's kind of wild. Oh, no, wait, no. no I'm, I'm looking at the wrong graveyard. Yeah, they're sending Change, uh, Regeki, Reborn the Faith and the Snatch. I think the Faith is the only thing that doesn't, like, outright kill you here. I guess Regeki didn't outright kill you, but, like, it's very, very likely. So, I would personally... Well, the Faith is just so awkward. But, yeah, I, I think you just gotta give them the Faith, right? Because Snatch, they Snatched uh, Sangan. I mean, if, you, if they got MST, then Snatch isn't really anything. But, uh, yeah, they're just gonna give them the Moth. I guess uh, that means that Lay does not have MST here. So, yeah. I mean, Moth, I think, is the right pick. It's what you got to do. And, uh, okay, it looks like uh, Barcode is just hitting into these things because that Moth will be able to like, get you back like a Raigeki, a Chain of Heart. And, uh, yeah, so it's, like, not not quite over for Lei. I mean, Lei, as they say, they do have one more turn. But it's not looking good. <laughs> it's definitely not looking good. I mean, Raigeki off the top will do it. Um, no change, so you can't use that on the Moth. Knock can potentially allow you to survive a little bit longer. If you draw Knock and then you set Fiber, that's something. But, yeah, it's looking like the end for, for Lay here. I mean, I think the pick with saying it is Fiber. I, I don't know exactly what's in Lay's deck, but, yeah, it's it's Fiber. Like, you got you to gotta get out of this situation somehow, right? And main two, it looks like Barco is just going to set them off. If Lei has Raigeki, they've got Raigeki, right? So it, it just is what it is. Uh, one out of 24 chance that they get it. Um, no change of heart, so you can't even do that, but, yeah, um, yeah, it's just, uh, going for Raigeki, yeah. You gotta do what you gotta do, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah they checked Raven, they're like, damn! Uh, was it Raigeki? That's the question. Or Knock, Knock would do it too. Um, Okay, looks like they're just going to set one, set another. Oh, it doesn't quite look to be what is... Okay, they do have knock. Okay, good. So knock will... Okay, knock will do it. Whew, okay. I, I was like, 
I was like, ah, oh, damn, that seems like it's the end of the game, but it looks like Nock will indeed do it there. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> they forgot about Nock. Okay, yeah. Because, like, Nock, you need to, to knock the faith there. Um, And, yeah, so the set has to be Fiber Jar. Well, it might not be Fiber Jar, but, like, realistically, you just set Fiber Jar here because if you got a way to clear the set, then you're dead anyways. So, like, you do Fiber Jar here. Um, But, yeah, Barco's thinking, like, do they have a way to get rid of that or do something? Uh, I think if you're a barcode, you just... Oh, Dark Hole the Boar. Okay, yeah, that's one way to do it. Uh, hidden the Fiber Jar. That is kind of like the one big punish to not setting Serpent there, but, like, you kind of have to do it. Because, like... Oh, just summoning out a Fiber Jar of their own, just getting in for five. I mean, Lay is down that bad at this point. Um, but this could potentially open up a way to getting back into the game. I mean... Call is gone. Reborn is gone. A lot of very powerful cards are gone on Barcode's side. So this could definitely do it. Mirror Force to hit the, the Tomato is obviously kind of awkward, but I'm not sure Lake can win this turn with the monster that they might have in deck. They're going to add back that Serpent. And yeah, you've got to fade 11 turns here. Uh, I mean, you could argue actually that like setting the Tomato would have been better there to like fade the turns more easily. We don't know if they're on Knock or not, but uh, Zaluk will definitely... Uh, Increase the clock, but Torrential will deal with that. So they they could still be in it. This, this is kind of wild. You know, I've been saying throughout this tournament, like, it's never over till it's over in this format. And we're definitely seeing that here. Lay holding on. Uh, setting one. Going for pot on Barcode's side. So Barcode's saying, I'm not letting this game get to deck out. I'm ending this sooner rather than later. I need to just keep the pressure going on you. Um, but it might actually go that way. Coffee coming down here. Barcode's got enough life points to make that fine. Uh, figuring that the set is a serpent, and it looks like it was indeed the serpent. So four star hitting the grave, serpent coming out on Barcode's side, clearing that serpent, setting another passing back to Lay. Lay will be able to get back at serpent here, but the serpent can clear the serpent if they do set the serpent. And how many times will I say serpent in the sentence? Uh, they're gonna set one pass back. Uh, it could be the serpent, it could be something else if they kept a card in hand. So we're getting in the mind game territory. Serpent attacking in. It is a Reaper. Reaper will wall up for quite a bit. How many outs does Barcode have to that Reaper? Looks like not too many. So this could potentially, this could potentially come down to lay winning by deck out, which is wild to see. You very rarely see deck out in this format because of Fiber Jar. But, you know, you look at Barcode's Grave, the Painful sent a bunch of powerful cards earlier. Those powerful cards are no longer available to you. And how, do, how does Barcode win? I mean, Barcode could have things that target the Reaper that will let them get through, but that Serpent's coming back every turn to block things. You're giving more time for Lay Murphy to draw here. They go for Pot. They draw two more. This this game could have turned around. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't necessarily approve of, like, saying in the in the chat, like, oh, like, four turns left, and, and then I win. You know, I don't necessarily approve of that. Um, did they... Did they let the... Did they activate Io and then let it die in standby? Oh, no, they activated Io on the on the pot. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, that's fine. But, yeah, I don't necessarily approve of, like, what's what's going on in chat here. But uh, I, I'm just in it for the game itself. But I, I generally will say, if if you do have your opponent on this sort of clock, don't, like, don't, don't like, say, oh, yeah, I win in four turns, right? Like, that is generally a feels-bad moment. So, um, but, yeah. Still, very, very... Uh, very, very cool stuff. Um, yeah, deck out can't happen here. Uh, barcode could still have some stuff, but if we look at, like, what's in their graveyard versus what's in their deck, uh, yeah, it's not illegal. It's not illegal. So, like, you know, you can do it in a tournament. It's just, like, generally, like, it's it's not the best practice to do it, right? So, generally, you want to you wanna not, like, you know, basically rub your victory in your opponent's face, right? Um, yeah. I mean, there are basically... Oh, and Harpy's coming down here. Uh, this could be pretty good. Ring on the Reaper. So that is one way to deal with Reaper there. Um, And also MST on the other back row there. So that will uh, sort of stop that. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's true. It is It is sort of announcing to Barco that his intention is deck out. So, like, it does kind of just help. Uh, oh, I'm not sure about that ring there. I don't, I don't know about that ring. I think that ring might have been a mistake. And the reason... Well, I guess you're taking the 300 anyways. So, like, it doesn't really matter. So, actually, yeah. That, that ring's fine, I guess. But, um... Because the set is Serpent as well. So, Serpent can clear Serpent. So, like, you have to pay attention to that. But, you know, ring, ring dealt with Reaper. And now we're back in a situation where Barcode could potentially win the game. 
And Lily is coming down. Lily's going to attack over that Serpent. If Lily gets to hit in one of these times, you just win the game. Uh, honestly, I think maybe Lily... Oh, well, actually, um, I was going to say maybe Lily should have come down next turn. But I guess it's playing around like TT or something like that. But what's not playing around is Snatch Steel. If a Snatch Steel comes down on the Lily, then you lose that offensive option. You've used up three MSTs. No Harpies used up yet, so Harpies could clear the Snatch if that is an option. Now, also, as an important point to note, Lay cannot pay for Lily at this point because they're at exactly 2,000 life points. So, hmm. This is interesting. This is a very, very interesting game state. I mean, as I said, these, these games come down to the wire, and them get more down to the wire than this. Oh, my goodness. This format is just so good. Like, I don't know, dude. This, this format's so, so good. Like, oh, I, I really hope this encourages more people to, to play it because this format just, oh, it's so good. I love it. it it's just like, and, and I hope that this format in this tournament uh, sort of gets more people looking at it because it's just like, it's just so cool. So many awesome games. It's just the peak of the DM era for me. And uh, it's a shame that there are no, like, regular Yada tournaments going on. Uh, yeah. Okay, it looks like they did indeed shuffle their deck, so, um, yeah. They're going to add back that Serpent there, set a card, and set a back row, so we knew know that's the Serpent. So, now Barcode can summon out Serpent, attack over Serpent, and then get in for 3,400. Oh, and the Harpy's there. It is indeed there, so, yeah. The the Snatch would not have been, uh, so I'm going to play around, and this will indeed be the end of the game. So, whew, incredible stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good point. Not many people like it because of the power cards, but, like, as we've seen here, the power cards, like, they're sort of kept in check by the other power cards. And, like, you still get, like, intense, skillful games. Like, I'd say that, like, a lot of what was going on in that game was skill, not, not like, luck sacking, right? So, I would say that this format is incredibly skillful, but, oh, great stuff there. Um, Let's see who else we want to feature. What what do people want to dive into? There's Alfie 2 versus Dean. There's Sea Sparrow versus Hoy. I want to see what Sea Sparrow versus Hoy are doing, because uh, we haven't featured them on stream yet. Uh, we'll get it. We'll get an opportunity to to look at Alf uh, at a later point. But uh, where is Sea Spare and Ahoy? Did that game wrap up already? Is it just not reported? Um, or is it not started yet? It might not have started yet. Oh, there it is. It's Vatos for Ahoy. Yeah, yeah. Sea Spare uses Vatos as the the name. Oh, 500 light points. So this is uh pretty intense already. And it looks like Hoy's in a pretty good spot. Playing an interesting deck. Okay, on Ashura Priest. Not necessarily something that most people main. Also on Cylinder as well, which not many people main as well. Seems like a pretty aggressive deck. And it is getting in for a ton of damage on Vatos. You never want to be at 500 against a deck playing uh, Matic Cylinder. That's for sure. But MST coming down. Hidden in Io. So unfortunately that will uh, go through there. And I will stop uh, Hoy from using any more spells. But uh, that Io will lapse next turn. Vatos cannot afford to pay for it. So not the worst spot for Hoy to be in. Something on a sure that will eat a TT. Um, but uh, Vatos is in a tough spot. They're going to set one pass back to Hoy. Hoy's used up three MSTs. So no MSTs left for that set. Have they used up Harpies? Uh, they have not used up Harpies. They're going to bring out a Fiber Jar. Try and hit in for game with the Fiber. And that looks like it will be enough. Uh, yeah, just an MST. So getting more info for game two. Hitting a TT there. So, intense stuff. I mean, it seems like Hoy's on a spicy deck. Unclear what Vatos is on just yet, but I'm excited to see what they're on. Um, because, I mean, both these players have played a lot of Yada, and uh, so they're both very, very good. So, very cool stuff here. Uh, I'm just happy to be able to show off all these, I mean, all these awesome games. Like, this is just so, so cool. And I'm sure that the tournament tomorrow in Warrior format will be similarly cool. So, definitely check that out as well. Uh, I'll be streaming that too. And Warrior Fortnite is a very different form than, than Yada. It's almost like a different form of GOAT in a way. It's like an alternate version. Uh, but it's also very, very fun. And part of the fun of Warrior is that, like, there's so many decks that can be viable. Whereas, like, in Yada, there are also a lot of decks that can be viable. But, like, oftentimes the power cards can make games feel, like, very similar in a way. But uh, they're not even that similar because, like, all these games have felt different in their own way. But, like... In Yada, like, what you're worried about is not necessarily the gimmick that your opponent's deck has. It's the power cards they have left in their deck. The gimmick does come up, and you can play around that gimmick a bit. But, like, the power cards are what really define a lot of these games in Yada. And I think that that's a good thing, because I think that the games are very back and forth. There's always a chance to claw your way back into it, as we've seen here. But it does mean that the decks are less, like, 
they have less of an identity to them, I'd say. Um, but with Warrior format, you know, it's the first format after the ban list. And so all the decks have a ton of identity because they're finally able to express themselves in their own way. And I think that it makes for a really fun uh, format and a format with a metagame that's very undefined. And I'm very curious to see how it will continue to change over time. So Graceful here from Vatos. Pitching a Jinzo, very good pitch off Graceful because you can bring this back off of like Reborn, Call, etc. Um, so that's very good. And also pitching an Exiled, good removal there. But it seems like Vatos might not need it. Um, what are they going to do here? They're just going to set one, set another. And then are they going to, they are indeed going to go for a set monster there, passing back to Hoy. Now, what can we tell about this uh, monster, given that the Exiled Force was pitched? I would guess, okay, not coming down, so that will clear the set monster anyways. But I was going to say, I would guess that it is not a, uh, okay, it is a Don's Luke. I was going to guess that it's not a card that could hand rip, because I was thinking, uh, if it is a card that could hand rip, then, you know, keeping the Exiled would be good, because what you do is you summon out the Exiled next turn, pop your opponent's monster if they set it, and then you attack in with whatever monster you have to rip part of their hand. Um... But I don't think that's necessarily the worst thing. Uh, Hat says, I've been saying that's been true about power cards for most of you guys' identity. To an extent, that is very true, I think. Especially in formats where there are so many power cards here. Uh, yeah, even in Duel Links. I don't have as much experience with Duel Links. Um, but power cards can definitely define the games, right? Uh, if your opponent goes for that banned card, or not banned, but like limited card, and you're like, oh, damn, they got that limited card that just wins the game. And that's, of course, you know, very big. But I, I like to sort of view the power cards as... Um, sort of tools the different decks have. Um, okay, going for call here on the Jinzo, uh, figuring that if they had an MST, they would have set it to, uh, so then you can go for the call without fear here. And that makes a lot of sense. Again, part of why they discarded the Jinzo. Maybe also part of why they discarded the Exiled to get back the Exiled and tribute off that way. Um, but yeah, I think the power cards are very important, but I also think that like, they sort of serve as tools, right? Like, if the power cards are, are curbed, um, to a good degree, right? Then... A lot of the times, like, the power cards will augment your strategy and will help you out of really tough spots. But what you're winning with... I mean, what you win with could also be the power cards. Um, but, like, what I... This, this is a bit uh, tricky to, to say, but, like... Uh, what I'm trying to say is, like, the power cards... They'll be in the game, but, like, what defines the deck is is outside the power cards, oftentimes. In formats like Yada, where the power cards are not really curved that much, the power cards definitely take up a lot of the games. Uh, and so they do define a lot of the games that are going on. Um, but I'd say like later on, like if you're in warrior format and you open like Confi, right? Confi is a power card that's legal in warrior format, right? Um, that Confi is going to be very good, but is that going to define the game as much as whether you're playing like Chaos Return or, uh, Reason Gate Turbo? I, I don't quite think so. So like, I think in, in formats where things are curved a bit, like it does change the dynamic a bit. So that, that's my sort of thesis on that. Yeah, even during Tier 0, Teledad, Stardust, and Dark Armed were nice, but you were mostly watching out for Crush Card and Torrential. Yeah, and that's a very good point as well. Uh, Crush Card is just such a dominant card when it uh, is legal. And, uh, oh, does Call die? That's a good question. Uh, I think that Call dies... So, I think what the way it works is like... Um, I don't actually know. I, I think it, it does go... People go back and forth. Or not back and forth, but like... The ruling has been issued out there. I don't quite remember it. There are certain situations where the call does die. And there are certain information or situations where the call doesn't die. Realistically, it doesn't matter as much because no one's really playing Trunade in this format. But yeah, yeah exactly. As Hoy says, unless you have Trunade, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, Crutch Guard is a dominant card. Torrential is also a dominant card. But again, I think that this is like things you watch out for. But like also the, the games are often decided by things outside of those cards, right? Um... And also, those cards can decide games on their own, true. But, like, I don't know. It, and also, this varies depending on the format. Like, Teledad, like, obviously, Crush Card has an outsized presence compared to a uh, more healthy format. Um, so, I think it really does depend. Because, like, Warrior Format, I'd say, is not really defined by the power cards. Uh, same with Goat. Like, Goat, you can get trinity right? But, like, you're never like, oh, I got trinity Well, I mean, sometimes people are like, oh, I got trinity and that's the end of the game. But, like... I don't think the Trinity, like, defined as many games as, like, the grindy, sort of back-and-forth nature of GOAT, right? Um, and I'd say the same with, like, Edison, Tango Plan, etc. Like, the power cards are there, and you are playing around them. Like, that's the, that's what you gotta do. But, like, I, I'm not sure if I'd, I'd go as far as to say that they define it. Hey, hey, Hobby! Welcome to the stream. I haven't looked at the alt format yet. I will do that uh, later tonight, though. Uh, but I had to set up the stream this morning. So... Uh, looking forward to that, though. And that will be the end of the game. Vatos wins that one going very quick. But Jinzo is such a dominant threat in this format 
that is, that can turn out to be the case sometimes. So these have been much quicker than a lot of the games that we've seen so far. Um, and also more intense because whoever loses this game will be knocked out of the tournament because this is in the lower bracket here. Um, so, you know, it, it is a, there's a bit more on the line here than in some of the other games we've seen so far. But uh, both players have uh, played valiantly. I mean, they fought themselves through the lower bracket, bracket here. Um, so C Sparrow won that game. They won that game. Uh, or I guess they, they, what's going on? Is my internet got good? Okay, my internet's bad. Okay, good. Uh, I, I don't know what, what happened there exactly, but sorry for the disconnect, everyone. Um, but yeah, I mean, both players have, uh, fought their way through some intense games. Hoy's fought their way up, uh, from that bracket. And, uh, yeah, so very intense stuff. And, uh, now this is down to the last game here. So, okay, good. We reconnected. Thank you, OBS. Uh, sorry for the, sorry for the technical difficulties. Hopefully that is not a problem going forward. Um, maybe they just know that this is going to be the longest stream that I've done so far on the channel. So, um, they're just preemptively, uh, cutting down on, on the bit rate or something. Uh, but Duo is getting fired here, so that will rip an Elf and one more card from Vato's hand that they have to decide about. Uh, looks like no Serpent in hand, hitting a Harpies. Now, does Hoy have any other hand rips to make Vato's life a little bit more miserable? Uh, looks like they do not, so no Coffee, no Forceful. And so this looks like it will be a relatively uh, clean and fair game of Yu-Gi-Oh, potentially. But uh, yeah, Hidden Harpies is pretty good. Uh, oh, Dust Shoot! Never mind! Oh, no! Oh, brutal stuff. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier in the stream, but no one, uh, really mentioned it. Um, but, oh, okay, no monsters. Okay, so that is something, and also this hand is a bit resilient to Dust Shoot, because what you do is you just activate Mirage, you set everything, pass, um, and the only thing that really punishes that is if they've got MST plus Harpies, but if they had MST, they might have set the MST in addition to the Dust Shoot, so I think you're relatively safe just going for Mirage plus a bunch of sets. So... Okay, it looks like it looks like we might still have some uh, clean and fair games of Yu-Gi-Oh here. You've also got Coffee to see what's in their hand, so Coffee can be fired here. Um, take out a uh, card in hand that stops just the activating Mirage and playing all your cards play. So, yeah, I think that this is um, ultimately not too bad for Vatos here. But yeah, Dust Shoot is. I honestly like when I get Dust Shooted, I feel worse than when I get like Coffee or Forceful. And that may seem weird, but the reason why I feel worse is because my opponent knows everything that I'm doing this turn, right? Whereas with Confi or Forceful, um, you know, at least with that, I draw a new card that's a bit of unknown information for my opponent. And so I can sort of play mind games with that. With Dutch Dude, I'm just like, well, you know exactly what I've got. You know, what can I really do here, right? Uh, they're going to go for the pre-mat there, bring back the Elf. Um, attacking into this set, figuring that probably is not Morphing Jar. It's a Magician of Faith, though. That's going to be pretty rough here. Getting back an MST. Yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty rough. But everything in the hand dies to MST. So, like, he might as well just go Mirage, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, and they're just going Mirage. So, I think that's fine. Um, yeah, Dust Shoot plus Minecraft also wins games by themselves in formats where the power cards are banned. Yeah, yeah, Minecraft plus Dust Shoot is a nasty combination. I mean, the good thing about Dust Shoot Mind Crush is that, like, it does take a specific set of cards to pull off. But if you do have those specific cards, then uh, you're in you're in a bit of trouble. So uh, it looks like Hoy has used up two of the cards that Vatas knew about. And it looks like that set is a Serpent. So they do know about that. But the back row is unknown. So that is good to know about. A Sangan coming down here. Sangan can hit over the Serpent. Just get that off field. Prevent a Jinza from coming down in the future. Um, you know, I wonder, because that was Magician of Fate, would it... I mean, you don't necessarily know it's Magician of Faith uh, on the outset, but would it have been better to just fire Mirage in case it was Faith? Because then they can't get back Typhoon and stop Mirage. Uh, these are things to think about, I guess, but, like, you also aren't guaranteed to draw an MST, so they could just use MST later. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it was fine. I think this was a fine play. Also, that really only loses to, like, the Faith. And also, this isn't a lost game state, right? The Sangin is on field. They can keep hitting in. Uh, you can bring out another monster as well to keep hitting in. So I'd say that this is a pretty even game state. Uh, both players have about the same amount of cards. Um, Serpent recurs itself, sure. But like, you know, three to four. Sangan also kind of recurs itself if it gets destroyed, if it gets another card to hand. So uh, i say this is pretty good. Kaiku coming down, though. That's going to be pretty good. At this point in the game's history, it does only banish monsters. So that is good to know about. Only banishing the elf here. Um, 
But losing the elf is important because you want that elf to hit over the Kaiku if you have a way to bring it back. So it seems like they probably don't have Call or else they would have used Call of the Haunted to bring back the elf before the Kaiku hit in. So that way they have a way to clear it. But uh, that might also have a card in deck to search out here that deals with the Kaiku. Like Exiled Force could do it. Um, the question is, do you want to go for an Exiled Force? Uh, Serpent's kind of risky because like they can summon out a Serpent, attack over your Serpent, hit in with Kaiku, banish the Serpent. You don't necessarily want to do that. This is a tough choice for them. Fiber is an option. They could go for Fiber, try and reset the game state because it's kind of an awkward game state to be in. I don't think Exile is the worst, uh, which is also fine. You can use Witch to search out an Elf to get over the Kaiku. It takes a couple turns, but it's ultimately not that bad. And it looks like Hoy is going to pass back to Vatos here. And what will Vatos do? Looks like they're thinking about exactly how to play this. I mean, setting the Witch is definitely a straightforward move that, you know, is pretty good, gets a search, or summoning the Witch. Are they on creature swap tech? Do they just have a way to deal with the Kaiku? Okay, they're going to snatch the Kaiku, but that eats an MST. And now you're in a bit of an awkward spot. The Sangin could get banished off this. Um, Yeah, it's kind of rough. And there wasn't really a way to play around that too much, because if you snatch the Kaiku, then Hoi could just let it go until you summon the Witch, and then they MST the, the snatch. But also, they might have preemptively mst the snatch in case you've got Jinzo, so... Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe it was, it would have been better to not summon the, the witch right away, but I mean, this isn't the worst thing in the world. You just lose the Sangan from Grave. So like, that's not the biggest loss, but if Fiber shuffles everything back, you don't necessarily want to be losing that Sangan. Sangan coming down as well. So this insulates against like, you know, Mirror Force, TT, etc. But yeah, so they're going to take seven. The Kaiku will banish the Sangan from Graveyard. One more monster out of Vatos' deck. And also, a thousand more life points coming from that Sangan. So, not looking too good for Vatos. But again, you know, we've seen people come back from worse. So, uh, anything can happen at this point in the game. The Elf can also deal with the Kaiku there, if the back row is nothing. So, yeah, looking good. The risk is if the back row is, like, ring, that'd be pretty bad. Uh, Graceful is going to be pretty good here. Drawing you deeper into the deck. And just trying to find a way to insulate your play here. So that's part of why Graceful is so strong, because you do have to discard for this, but like you get to pick the cards that are actually useful here. Like Knock, what's Knock going to do? Nothing much. What's Lily going to do with only one activation of it? Not really that much. So I think that probably is the correct play here. Bring out the Elf. That is, uh, yeah, it's what you got to do. And then attacking into the Kaiku. Is that a Mirror Force in the back row? No, it is not. So that Elf will hit into the Kaiku. And now Vatos has the aggressive edge now. They're going to set one pass back to Hoi. Uh, no Harpies used up. Uh, Harpies has been used up on Vatos' side, though. So Hoi could potentially go for more backer there. Uh, Painful getting fired, but Io getting fired in response. Now two MST has been used up. So, yep, no uh, MST to deal with that Io. So this is a very commanding position for Vatos to be in. Now the issue is they want to keep up this position. They don't necessarily have a way to eat through Hoi's board and get attacking in, right? So this puts them in an awkward spot. Because they need to have some way to get aggressive, and they don't want Hoy to use their power spells. But if you keep the IO up, you're losing 7 on your turn. You only have 5 activations of IO, and if you get down to the point where you're less than 1900, you potentially risk losing to ring. So, you know, we know that Hoy does not have ring now, or else they would have ringed the elf. But this is a bit awkward here. Bringing out a tomato here. That will allow Hoy or allow Vatos to eat through the entire board because again, Hoy very likely does not have a mirror force. Going for Call as well. Call can bring back Lily here, I guess, but Lily is a bit risky because Lily just loses you the game. Yeah, which is yeah, which is the move. So I mean you could use Lily to attack over the serpent, right? And not use effect, then attack over the Sangam with the, the tomato and then attack indirectly for 19. But I think which is better in case they somehow clear your call. So yeah, I think this is right. Um yeah, taking in with Witch and Tomato. Sangin gets a surge here. Uh, there's a variety of good things it could search, but uh, it needs to do a lot of heavy lifting here. Exiled Force could be something, but like, then you're leaving yourself open to another big attack on the next turn. So probably not that. If they're playing Spy, Spy is a really good search here because they can't necessarily get through the Spy. So that is definitely an option. Because you're gonna, just going to go for Jar. I think Jar is also a really good pick. Because right now, Hoy is still ahead in terms of life points. And Jar resets everything except for life points. So, um, I think this was a good pick. They also pitched a knock earlier. So, they likely don't have another knock in hand unless they drew it for turn this turn. So, I think this makes a lot of sense. Setting that set. 
and passing back to Vatos. Now, if Vatos has the knock here, they can let the IO go and then attack him with everything for a ton of damage. They are indeed going to let the IO go. They could also have a red Geki as well. That would be pretty good here. But a lot of things they could have that uh, would be not the best for Hoi uh, in this scenario. So very, very tricky turn. You definitely never play for IO here because like, you know, you're going to attack into Fiber Jar this turn anyways. So like you don't necessarily need to go down on life points. But yeah, they're just attacking into the Fiber Jar uh, with the Tomato. And yep, it is indeed the Fiber Jar. So that will reset everything. Um, and honestly, in the worst spot for Vatos to be in, Vatos has the initiative here. So if they draw Hand Rips, they can use that right away. They can also commit a monster to board because they haven't used their normal summoner set this turn. So either way, I think this is a pretty good situation for them. But yeah. Very, very good stuff. Like, and again, this game is super intense. Like, all these games have been really, really intense, except for, like, game two of this match. Like, pretty much all these games have been, like, down to the wire. Just, like, awesome stuff. Potter Reed coming down here, drawn two. And, uh, I could potentially get into more hand rips. I could get into other things. Forceful coming down, uh, shoveling a card back from hand, getting full knowledge of Hoy's hand here. So, that's very good as well kind of need that advantage at this point because you're down 2,000 light points. But, yeah, it's full also inform Vatos' play here from here on out. They've got Regeki, Kaiku, Reborn, Elf, and Premature Burial. That is a tricky hand. You can't really get rid of the aggressive pressure in the form of Kaiku or Elf. You can't really get rid of the revival in the form of Reborn or Premature Burial. So, the move might be just Regeki. Um... I think Regeki is honestly the pick here. It depends on what else Vatos has in hand. For instance, if they've got more hand rips, maybe the move is to get rid of a Reborn or a Prima, so that way you can get rid of uh, Monster as well. But I, I do think the move is Regeki. And yeah, they will shuffle back the Regeki. Uh, kind of an awkward hand. You can't really do much against the other threats, so you just got to send back Regeki. Now, Regeki is a really good threat in its own right, so like, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's bad to send here, even if the rest of the hand was not just insulated like that. Um, painful here. Coming down as well. I like the play of doing painful after the forceful, so that way you sort of inform more of your decision making about what to send here. Um, now here's an option where oh, okay, it looks like they're sending serpent. Yeah, I was gonna say here's an option where you send serpent, and you potentially give your opponent a bit of a tricky decision because if they think that they can get in with Kaiku next turn to banish the serpent, then they could potentially take that challenge. Uh, I still think you probably give them the serpent here. Because that serpent will eventually wind up in the graveyard and eventually will be able to banish it. So you don't necessarily need to cut down to like, uh, oh, Jinzo as well. That to me telegraphs that Vatos has a call here. Because if you're sending Jinzo, then you know about the Reborn in your opponent's hand. So you've got to have a way to interact with that Reborn. Guardian Sphinx! Okay, we're seeing the spice. We're seeing the spice now. Wow. Okay, and Gemini Elf as well. I mean, you give your opponent the Serpent for sure, but that is the Spice, the Sphinx Spice. Wow. Not a card you see often in this format, but it is legal. Um, And, I mean, if it ever goes off, you get to bounce back your opponent's hand there. Wow. That, that's some incredible stuff. Uh, Yeah, Guardian Sphinx goaded exactly right our Phoenix. And, yeah, the Sphinx. Sphinx. Anyone watch the, the Venture Brothers here? Uh, No? That might just be a reference that I get, but Sphinx, you know, uh, great show if, if people haven't seen it, but, um, yeah, it looks like they're just going to hit the reborn out of the hand. So maybe they don't have call. Maybe they just wanted the Jinzo and grave for when they eventually get call, but yeah, they're just going to set the Serp, um, and pass back to Hoy. Now that set is probably premature and yeah, it is indeed the premature, but premature dies to MST anyways. So like for Hoy, it's not that bad of a bluff. Um, and it, it paid off the way they wanted to, it looks like. So, they're bringing out a Zalug here. Very scary to see that come down. Snatchio also coming down. Taking the Elf. Getting in for a ton of damage here. Ripping a card out of hand as well. So, it's not looking too good for, for Hoi here. Uh, now, if they miss the Kaiku, then Kaiku can get in and banish the Serp. But, uh, it looks like... Or, no, the Serpent's in hand. So, that one doesn't even matter. Um, they get in for 19 now. They will go up to 27 here. But, they do need a way to stop all this damage that they're taking. And, they might not have it. Uh, now, all that was originally known in the original hand is gone, so Vatos had no knowledge of what's left, but will that be enough? Set and one, passing, okay, um, you do what you can, 
but this could potentially be the end of the game if, if Vatos has another card in hand. They do have Exiled, so that will probably be the end of the game here, unless they, they're they playing Karyu. But yeah, Fiber unfortunately does fall to the Exiled, and uh, yeah, that will be the end of the game. So very intense one here. Very, very good stuff. Thank you, Rather Phoenix, for subbing. Uh, if, if you're watching the stream and not subbed, uh, definitely uh, sub. We got a lot of good um, retro format content coming, but yeah, I appreciate the sub. Uh, we're trying to get to 1300 by the end of the month. I think we can do it. Um, but yeah, very good stuff there. It looks like, uh, looks like, uh, Sea Spirit will be moving on and facing all of you two lost. No. Okay. We got to watch, we got to watch winner's finals. So, uh, I'm going to hop in on that real quick. Uh, I just need to send a message. Uh, okay. Uh, let's dive into the winner's finals between Dean and, uh, Barcode. So let's see who will make it to the winner's finals. And, uh, yeah. Okay. And it looks like they're bringing out a Lily here. So they're in a very, very good spot. They're able to hit over the Sangin with the Zambira and attack indirectly with the Lily. So, yeah. Uh, so that's a lot of damage coming in here. And Exile Force will be able to deal with the Lily. Also, you don't need to necessarily worry about the Zambira because Zambira can't attack directly. But still, dropping down to 4,400 is... Not anything to shake a stick at. Oh, that, that's tough. Tough spot for Dean to be in here. Especially because they've used up two powerful traps. Io's still on field. So, you know, spells are not really that useful here. But, uh, yeah, you just gotta, gotta go for the force popping the lily. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what you gotta do. You just gotta pass. At least the Zambira can't attack in this turn, so that's something. But if Barcode has other monsters, which they very likely do, they've got six cards in hand, then they can get in for some more damage. They're setting here. So that could mean that they've got a Faith or they don't have any aggressive pressure. So very interesting. I agree, Janjo. Adventure Bros was very underrated. Still a shame it got canceled. At least it went out on a really good note. I, I thought the final movie was was really good. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was just a great show. Uh, especially if, like if you're into nerd culture, like that show is, is great. But uh Injection Fairy Lily attacking in to Zambira here, and that will indeed go through, dealing 17, but Dean's down to 2,400. That Lily only has one more activation, so it's tough. With the Pac-Man deck around at this time, Pac-Man is something that is legal. You can... Oh, Change of Heart's just going to do it. Uh, Pac-Man is something that is legal, so you can play it, but unfortunately, uh, it's not really that good at this point because there are so many power cards, like Raigeki, Dark Hole, etc. That just eats you alive. Um... So not too many people play Pac-Man, but it is something that you can build if you want. Um, I, I think it'd be cool if people start building it more. I mean, we did see Sphinx in uh, in Vatos' deck, so like def that could be more of a Pac-Man build. Um, but the full-on Pac-Man playing like Swarm of Scarabs, Deslacuda, Swarm of Locusts, etc., all that stuff uh, is maybe not as viable. It's, actually, is Swarm of Scarabs in this form? I think I think it is. I think Swarm of Scarabs and Swarm of Locusts are in this format, but I can check. Um, it came out in... Uh, Piranha Garden, yeah. So Swarm of Scarabs and Swarm of Locusts are in this format. So, yeah. So you can indeed build that deck. Um, but yeah, at least they were able to finish the series indeed. And I thought they ended well, so that was pretty good. Yeah, so that's definitely a deck you can build. Hopefully someday someone does manage to build it and make it good. But yeah, this format, it, like, this format's, like, its meta is so undefined right now. Like, if you look at the winners of the past couple tournaments, a new deck has won, like, every tournament, basically. Uh, not, like, all of them, but, like, a lot of them, like, has been won by very different decks. So, you know, there is a lot of uh, sort of open opportunity for people to build more. So Pac-Man could definitely be a deck that, you know, sort of um, jumped into the meta there. But uh, I know that people might respond to, like, oh, a different deck won every time. They might say, like, oh, well, that just means that, like, the power cards are so busted and they can enable any deck to win. Well, those different times were won by the same player. So, you know, uh, I think that that is a sign the skill is a bigger part of this format than luck. Uh, although luck does still play a role. Uh, what cards are in the Pac-Man deck? There's Swarm of Scarabs, Swarm of Locusts. Um, there's Deslacuda. Guardian Sphinx, as we've seen. Uh, there's no level limit area B, but there is Gravity Bind. There's Gravity Bind. There's um, uh, Messenger of Peace. No Wall of Illusion either, I don't think. I think Wall of Illusion comes out later. but uh, Or not Wall of Illusion. I mean Wall of Revealing Light. That comes out later. Uh, no Medusa Worm, unfortunately. That's Lost Millennium. Uh, no Golden Century either. Uh, that's Flaming Eternity. So you don't have those. 
But uh, oftentimes the 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 scarabs, the the locusts, and the lakuta are enough for to make the deck tick. The big thing is like stopping uh, your opponent's aggression because there is triple MST in this format. There's Harpy Feather Duster. Your opponent can side in Heavy Storm. There's Dust Tornadoes as well. So it can be very, very tough to actually maintain your, your board setup. But uh, you can build the deck. Like, the deck definitely has the bones here uh, to be built. And, uh, yeah, no Golem Sentry, unfortunately. That's Flaming Eternity. So, uh, yeah. No Guardian Statue either. A Guardian Statue actually came after Golem Sentry, which is wild, because Guardian Statue is just a worse Golem Sentry. I guess it can be searched off with the Black Forest, but, like, uh, which is banned at, this, at that point in the game. So... Uh, it's kind of weird, but yeah, it's a bit of an oof. There's, there's not too much you can do um, outside of like Scarabs, Locusts, and um, and Lakuta. There are some other zombie flips that you could play, like Royal Keeper is something, Wandering Mummy is something, but like those are like pretty bad. Uh, like Wandering Mummy just like shuffles around your, your set monsters, which is kind of interesting. It can keep your opponent guessing, especially if you've got Giant Axe Mummy, which is also a monster that like, you can set back down, and basically if your opponent attacked into it with a monster that has less than uh, attack than its defense, then that monster will be destroyed. But all of that is, like, really bad. <laughs> like, that that's not the way you want to build the deck. It, it's just really, really bad. And uh, so, unfortunately, like, a lot of the deck is not there. Um, but it is something like uh, Unity. Uh, Unity, like, uh, the card Unity? Or, like, uh, what do you mean? Like, United We Stand? Or... Uh, let me look up Unity. It might not be out right now. Um, Unity, card details. Uh, unfortunately, that was from 2006. So Unity is not out yet, unfortunately. So that would be good with the deck, but unfortunately it's not here yet. Uh, Zalug hitting a Jinzo out of the hand. And it's looking pretty rough for Dean here. Although there are definitely some draws that can do it. Like a Tomato into that Zalug uh, would be very good. Jinjifard on the Zalug just ripping the last card out of hand. Um, so that's something at least getting in some damage as well, but yeah, it's, it's not looking the best for them, but yeah, unfortunately unity is not out yet. Um, there is, there's a chorus of sanctuary, which is a field spell that busts up defense. That's something, but the issue is that like scarabs defense. Oh, okay. Fiber dart is really good here. Uh, shuffling back the deck and also Barco did commit their normal summon here. So that means that they won't be able to get another monster to board. But yeah, Course of Sanctuary is a field spell that buffs up uh, by 500 defense. And unfortunately, Scarab's defense is 1,000. And, um, you know, Locust's defense is 500. So, yeah, Yellow Luster Shield is out in this format as well. Uh, so you could do that. Um, but yeah, uh, no TCG or OCU exclusives were legal for Worlds format. So Unity is not out. Um, looks like Duo's coming down. So at least Barco does get that to protect themselves. But this is a bit risky because... You're down to 1,700, you don't get a normal summoner set here, and your opponent does have the option to do that. So, very tricky stuff here. Uh, they're going to set one, set two, set three, pass back. So, this means that they probably do have an Imperial Order set to protect their back row. They probably also do have a back row that can protect themselves from damage. Maybe they got a Rain Destruction to force a draw. Um, oh, Luster Shield was IOC, damn. Yeah. Uh, one of the weird uh, cards in IOC. Yeah, the, the 2004 event was really cool in Master Duel. Uh, honestly, it was very, very similar to Warrior Format. Everyone's saying, like, oh, it's, like, GOAT Format and Master Duel, uh, but it was, like, the OCG form of GOAT, and it used a, a list that was more similar to Warrior. So, honestly, it was, it was like, almost like Warrior Format. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that, that got a lot of people interested in more of the DM era. And so it's, it's really awesome to see that getting people back into the game. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was FET Goat. So there were cards from Flaming Eternity there as well. Um, so it's not it's not like quite Goat or Warrior format, but it did remind me a lot more of Warrior format. Yeah, and there, there are no gadgets in uh, the TCG at the time as well. Um, so, yeah, but Chaos was definitely uh, in the TCG at that time. And, uh, oh, is this the end of the game? Oh, no, call for the, the Fiber to stave off some life points here. Uh, it's not looking good for Dean because they do take 900 from this. Uh, so they're down to 400. And uh, they will lose a card there. But, oh, Tomato would have been perfect against the Zalug. Because you craft the, the Tomato into the Zalug and get another monster attack in for more damage. But, uh, unfortunately, it was not meant to be there. Um, yeah, this is looking a bit tough. I mean, right, Geki's gone, so that's something. But, yeah, it's, it's not looking good. I will say that. Right, Geki on the Zalug will help for a little bit here, at least. 
And they do have a Zaluga of their own, but unfortunately that TT's coming down. And yeah, the last card was pre match So if this was played a little bit differently here, if you summon the Zalug first, no, it wouldn't have actually made a difference because summoning Zalug first, then they pre mat next turn anyway. So it wouldn't have made a difference at this point in the game. Um, but still very intense stuff. Uh, very good stuff. And down to the wire again. All these games down to the wire. So, so cool. But looks like Barcode will be in winner's finals here. Or uh, in the, the final match. Uh, should be a lot of fun. What's my favorite format? I honestly go back and forth between a lot of them. Yada is definitely up there. Uh, for the DM era, like, my three favorites are Yada, Critter, and Warrior. They're all really fun. Uh, Critter format is basically the format, the second format in the game's history, right after Metal Raiders. Um, and it's just very, very grindy, very control-oriented, very, very difficult, but it's very, very rewarding uh, if you do manage to uh, play it. Uh, and uh, I'll answer the non-DM favorite format uh, after I finished covering the, the other DM format. Warrior format, which is uh, the format that is going to have a tournament tomorrow. So if you do want to play in that, definitely head over to the format library and join that. Um, but that format is very similar to GOAT, but it's with a different list. So that list uh, bans Grateful Charity, bans Delinquent Duo, which makes Chaos Turbo a little bit less good. And so it means that right now the format's at a point where like there's a lot of experimentation going on. People are looking at Goat Control. Goat Control is a lot better of a deck in Warrior. People are looking at like Reason Gate Turbo. People are looking at a lot of different decks there. And it, the meta is really wide open. And I think it's really fun. My sort of opinion of Warrior could change after the meta becomes more solidified. But right now it's in a really, really cool place. Um, so that's my favorite DM formats. For favorite formats in general, uh, I haven't played like too much out of DM besides like casually. Um, but I have played, like, Goat and Edison. Um, I'd say, like, I really like Edison because it's, like, a lot of decks running around. And uh, I think it's really cool. I think it's, like, a good snapshot of the 5Ds era. Um, and it had a lot of archetypes that I'm very nostalgic for. So I do like that a lot. Uh, I've played a bit of Tengu Plant. I think that that is really fun as well. I haven't played enough to really, like, make a good opinion on it. But I think that could definitely be one of my favorites in the future. Um, and I've played a bit of Hat as well. Hat I really enjoy, too. It, Hat's, again, like, a very grindy format. Um, so, you know, that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, I haven't tried, like, I tried a bit of Dragon Ruler. I played in one of the, I think it was, like, it might have been a Ravine Ruler, uh, format on, uh, format library. Um, and I enjoyed it, but, like, it, it wasn't, like, the best format for me, but I think that might have just been because, like, I'm not as fresh on Dragon Ruler combos as, like, I used to be. Like, I never really was, like, the most competitive at, at those combos, but I didn't know them relatively at the time. But, like, you know, I, I was definitely rusty. And, like, when I get to that format in my coverage, I'm definitely going to go through it more. But, yeah, there are definitely formats in the game's history that, like, just don't vibe with certain people. Like, for me, like, in the DM era, there are a lot of good formats. But there are also form formats that I really did not like. Like, I personally did not like Joey Pegasus. I wasn't the biggest vampire format fan. Um, but a lot of people do like Joey Pegasus. A lot of people do like vampire. So, like, it really does depend on the person. Um... And there's a lot of great stuff to, to find out there. That's kind of why on my channel, I try and just go through everything. Um, when I'm covering a format itself, I generally try not to be like, oh, this format's bad or oh, like, you know, who would enjoy this format? Because I know that there's always formats out there that appeal to different people. So like, I try and cover the formats as like even handily as I can uh, without any bias or anything. I mean, there's always going to be some bias, but like, I, I generally try and just let the format speak for themselves. And hopefully if people enjoy that sort of thing, then they try out the format, they grow the format more. And we get a bit of a healthier, like, uh, retro scene. So, yeah, Barrel Dragon, actually, uh, it's funny that you say that. There is a machine reasoning deck in this format um, where Barrel Dragon is one of the end bosses of it. Because level 7, so people don't really come, uh, people don't call it off reasoning off that often. Uh, so it can hit the field a lot. It also is a big beater. And if you're playing with limited removal, that's 5200 damage off one limited removal attack with it. It can be removal as well. So there are some things you can do with Barrel Dragon in this format. So, uh, yeah, it's a really, really cool card. So definitely check out Yada if, if you do want to make Barrel Dragon work. Because I think Barrel Dragon probably is at its peak in this format. So very, very cool um, deck there. But, yeah, that, that is true to deal with it. I, I am saying if you like Joey Pegasus, you're a bad person. How dare you? Uh, now, <laughs> no, one's a, no one's a bad person for liking a given format or not. Uh, even the most degenerate formats out there, like, if you enjoy it, like, who am I to say that, like, you know, you enjoying that thing is bad, right? Like, everyone enjoys what they want to enjoy, and that's part of the fun of the game. Like, the game has had so many different formats over the course of its history that, like, there's so much to enjoy, right? If you don't like one format, there's probably another out there that you'll enjoy. And uh, I, I feel like it's kind of a shame that people... And I'm not saying that Goat and Edison are bad, because Goat and Edison are very good, but I, I do feel like it's kind of a shame that people, like, 
try and just focus just on those or Tengu Plant, or they get all tribal and they're like, no, I must play only Goat, or I must play only Edison, or only Tengu Plant and stuff, and every other format's terrible, right? Like, I don't really like that sort of mindset. I think you can play Goat, Edison, Tengu Plant, and a variety of other formats as well. Like, you can play whatever formats appeal to you in the game's history. And I think actually playing more than one format can be very good at just sort of like, if you ever play one format too much and you're like, ah, oh, damn, this is this is so exhausting. Like, I'm just tired of this meta. I'm tired of these decks. Uh, then you can like dive into another format for a bit, you know, play around with that a bit, like uh, enjoy that until you're tired of that and then jump back into the first format that you sort of got tired of originally, right? And it can be really, really good at just like sort of getting a, a mental refresh uh, if you ever get too burnt out on a given thing. Um, so I, I encourage people to just try out as, any, as many formats as they can just to get a feel for them and just see what they might enjoy. Um, because I guarantee you, there's a format out there that you haven't tried yet that you will enjoy. Uh, I feel like if you pick a variety of formats, you're engaging yourself deeper into the game and finding out which experiences you like the most and still having fun in all of them. I agree 100% Ryler Phoenix. Um, and also the great thing about that too, is that you're getting better at different facets of the game. Like certain formats are much grindier and much control, much more control oriented, like Critter format, right? That is a format that like very, very grindy, uh, very, very control oriented. There's a lot of stuff going on that you have to keep track of. And it's very, very intense. And so if you play that format a bit, you will get better at grindy control games in GOAT format as well. I guarantee it. Um, for instance, something like Vampire format, that's a very tempo oriented format. If you play that format a lot, you will get better at faster paced formats where you just need to figure out when you need to get aggressive. Um, and I, so there's a lot of different variety out there. And I think it really does help you uh, improve the game overall. Like, I think since starting this channel, I've gotten a lot better as a player. Part of that is because, like, whenever I play games, I go back and actually record videos analyzing them on the channel, which if you analyze your games, then you will be able to get better at them uh, and just at the game in general because you'll see things that you didn't see at the time where you're like, okay, if I wind up this situation again later, then I can do this, right? So, like, I do think that that's been a big reason why I've gotten better, but I also think it's just been playing a variety of different formats, right? Like, I'm better at uh, tempo, for instance, because I've played Vampire format, because I've played Android format, because I've played a bit more aggressive format. So it looks like Bobby will be winning that one. Sorry for not really commenting on that one that much. I, I sort of got sidetracked um, by what people were bringing up. But yeah, it looks like Bobby will be facing Lay next, and it looks like that is the currently the only active game going on right now. So we got we got a good run up to finals. We got Lay versus Bobby. We got Alfie two versus the winner of that. We got Dean versus the winner of that, and then we got Barcode versus whoever wins that. So Awesome, awesome games coming up here. And we are in the home stretch. So great stuff to see here. Let's see if they're hosting already. It looks like they're not hosting yet. Um, but I'm excited to see when that game starts because it will be a blast to play. Who do people think will win this uh, tournament? Uh, it really could go a number of ways. All the players left are really, really good duelists. So I think that like it really could come down to anyone here. Even even Bobby or Lei, who are currently you know at the back of the pack here. There's definitely been uh, tournaments where people have managed to sort of eat their way through the entire lower bracket and make it to the top and win the entire thing. So I'm really excited to see this uh, marathon of games here. And I hope that you're all enjoying as well because there are just going to be some more epic games coming your way. Whenever you get players of this caliber playing, it always turns into a good time. So I'm really hyped. Uh, oh yeah, also I should mention uh, for people who... Don't know what Yada format is and have just been like vibing. Uh, Yada format takes place in August 2003 uh, in the Worlds um, Championship of that year. So uh, it's it's like for that Worlds format. So it's it's kind of weird because normally most uh, retro TCG formats we play are like in TCG formats. But uh, the Worlds format had like a bit more natural rulings than uh, the TCG did at the time. Like TCG was still doing weird things with like Kaiku Bazoo, etc. Um, and so Worlds is like, I think the best place to sort of plant the flag there for this format. And it it's just such a great card pool, such a great list. And it's just really, really intense games. I mean, you've seen that if you've been watching the stream so far, you've seen so many intense games uh, today. And I, I mean, I've just been, I've just been loving it so far because these games, oh boy, they, they, they go wild. So if you haven't played Yada, I highly encourage you to try it out because there's just so much uh, back and forth, so much epic plays, so much exploration to be done. I mean, even in this bracket, like, all of you do is on a spicy Necrofear deck. So, like, th there's experimentation going on, 
And uh, yeah, uh, what's my username? My username is BSOX. So that's my username on uh, DB and also on Discord as well. Uh, if you hop in the YGF from Zero Discord server. Um, so yeah, that is my username. So feel free to add me. Uh, I might not add you back until after the stream wraps up because just, uh, you know, I want to keep my eyes on the games here. Um, but yeah, uh, happy to add you back. Can I just do th Oh, no, I have to go out of it. Well, I, anyway, I'll accept it there. And uh, then we'll dive back into the game. So uh, let's see. There it is. Okay. So looks like Bobby is starting off the game here. And uh, let's see what they do to begin. They're going to go for forceful, so they do get full hand knowledge of Murphy's hand here. So that's going to be pretty good. But again, like I mentioned with like Dust Shoot, um, I I feel like with the, the Forceful Sentry and Confiscation, it's like you do get full knowledge of the hand, but then your opponent's drawing another card, right? So like you don't know what that new unknown is. If they play their cards right, they can honestly introduce a lot of uncertainty with the information that you might have. So it's kind of interesting how that that works. We're like, I do think that Coffee and Forceful are like generally better than Dust Shoot, but they feel like less frustrating to play against personally. Um, that could just be a personal thing, right? Like, uh, I'm sure that there are many people who would be much happier just like having, uh, dust shoots instead of, or getting dust shooted as opposed to getting like confident or forceful. But, um, I, I, that's just how I feel about it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I might just be crazy, but, oh man, forceful then duo, brutal stuff. I generally do like to go, uh, well, if you got forceful, if you got forceful, you might as well go forceful because you send back the serpent and then you go for the, the duo. So, uh, I think that's okay, but I generally like to do the, the duo and then the forceful. And if they've got serpent, they've got serpent, you know, it's just like, well, they got serpent, you know, what can I do? Um, but yeah, I think, I think that this is a fine ordering as well. Um, yeah, hand control is pretty devastating in this format as well. Um, hand control is like a deck that honestly, like in the past expiration of this format, like people thought hand control was the best deck in the format. Nowadays, people realize that, like, it does have its flaws. Uh, it can be very good, but oftentimes people don't even play the drop-offs because, like, drop-off can be a bit of a brick. It's a random discard. If you pitch a serpent, then that's obviously not good. Um, so, yeah, it's, like, it's definitely a deck that is interesting and is still very good in this format, but, like, it's also something that people aren't really playing as much. So, look like Jinjo's going to tribute over that saying, yes, get a search, hit over the Zalug as well. Uh, and that's going to be pretty rough for Lei here. Snatch on the Jinto is going to be pretty good, though. Uh, that can get them back into the game a little bit. Uh, tagging in for 2,400. Getting out of Sangan as well. Tagging in for 3,400. Half the life points about. But, uh, Bobby will gain 1,000, so they're not out of it yet. They're going to gain that 1,000 right there. And they're going to go for Graceful here as well. So Graceful is going to be very good. Drawn three, pitch and two. Yeah, Electric Snake is a very funny tech. And when you only have to deal with, um... With like drop offs or confies or duos, that electric snake is a lot better. Um, so it's very funny in this format. It, uh, it doesn't really see much play because, first of all, hand control isn't like everywhere, and also if you do see a hand control deck, it's oftentimes not playing like drop offs and stuff. So the only real ways you're getting value off that is off like Zalug or Reaper. But Zalug and Reaper are very good and in those hand control decks, and so snake can come up potentially. So, uh, a very funny tech. A funny story about uh, Snake is that we also occasionally on this channel explore like sort of like hypothetical formats where just formats where like, uh, what if, you know, when the pack came out, all the cards were unlimited in it, right? So when Magic Ruler came out, um, it had all three hand rips in it. And so we played the hypothetical MRL format and that was like, what would happen if they were to access to nine hand rips in their deck? Uh, and so it was some wild stuff. So people were taking an electric snake for that. Um, but also times like people would often like cut the hand rips down. Like they wouldn't play all nine because that's just kind of overkill. And if you draw them later in the game, they're kind of dead weight. So it's very interesting to see, but Reaper is going to go really hard here. Bobby's just going to keep gaining back a thousand from that Jinzo. Uh, if late didn't have a way to deal with the Reaper. So yeah, rough stuff for lay here. Uh, that serve there, that uh, charity was very good, uh, drawing them deeper into the deck. And yeah, I mean, that's how it goes sometimes. And it looks like, uh, does Lay have a way to deal with the Reaper? I mean, they've got plenty of ways in their deck, most likely. They don't have change anymore. That's unfortunate. But any other targeting card, um, any like Raigeki, any Dark Hole you don't necessarily want to use, but if they're playing Fisher, then they can use that. Yeah, it's kind of rough. So it looks like Jinja's going to attack into the set there. It's going to be a Witch, which will get a search out of the deck. 
And there are a variety of good things to search here. Although again, like Bobby didn't necessarily need to sort of put the gas on, right? Bobby could just sit around like letting the the um, snatch just give them more and more life points over time. So it's looking pretty good for them, honestly. Um, again, like Lay is at full life points. So it's definitely not over, right? Like, and also, you know, who knows how long that Jinja is going to stay around. But this is a very, very good spot to be in. Now that set, it could be a tomato. Uh, which if they, if it is a tomato, there's a question of like, what's it getting, right? Because Sangan and Witch are both in Grave. They're both limited in this format, so you can't, like, bring out another Sangan. Um, you could bring out another Tomato. That deck thins a little bit, but I'm not really sure what other targets uh, Bobby's playing. Maybe a Zalug. Could be a Zalug, but Zalug just dies to the Jindo eventually. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't I don't really know. I guess you just bring out Tomatoes. There's only one Tomato left in deck, so you might as well bring out that Tomato while there's still a target potentially left in deck. But they are thinking here, so maybe they've got more than one target. Yeah, it's a bit of a choice because normally you'd get out like Sangan or Witch, but those are both gone. And that's part of like uh, the interesting thing about Tomato in this format is that there are... Okay, Nudoria, that's going to be a very good card. Uh, Nudoria can just hit over Sangan next turn potentially. Also, Nudoria can kill the Jinzo. I think we did see this uh, in the Alifia 2 versus Bobby game earlier. So Nudoria, definitely a good tech in this sort of Tomato control list. And just bring it out immediately because the Sangan can't, can't hit over uh, like the Tomato bring out Dawn, then, like, they switch Sangan to defend, so, like, what's the point in that, you know? Um, so you have a very good card there. And, yeah, Lay's thinking. So Lay might have something here. That's interesting. They might be thinking, do I crash the Sangan into the new Doria and just get the search? Because they have a normal summoner set this turn, so if you crash the Sangan in, you could get, like, a Magician of Faith to get back to change. You could do a variety of things here. Huh, that's a bit of a, a tricky one. You can't use any traps here, so it's very unlikely that they've got like a trap to pop the new Doria or something. Um, they could be playing Book of Moon, but Book of Moon's kind of weird. You don't necessarily want to book the new Doria and like attack into it. But yeah, you could potentially go saying and crash into new Doria, then set Fiber Jar. That could be an option, but then it's very telegraphed. But yeah, they are just going to crash into new Doria there, get the search, and what are they going to search out is the question. Yeah, very tricky. What you, what would y'all do in this situation, chat? What do you what do you think you'd do? Um, I'm not sure I would have crashed the Sangan. I might have just switched the Sangan in defense, but you are in that tricky spot where like that snatch is keeping Bobby Bodega, you know, buffed up on life, right? Um now next turn you could always purposely crash the Jinto into the nude, but yeah. Okay, yeah, they are searching up fiber jar there. Jay Anderson says flip the table, that's definitely an option as well. Um could do that. Forceful on the hand is very, very good here because basically you're you have the forceful to back up the fiber. Um, because if they've got a way to deal with the fiber, you take it out of the hand. If they um have multiple ways, you don't necessarily commit the fiber here. So I think there's a good uh play. They're saying hmm though, so they might have multiple options here. They could have like knock and oh yeah, they do have knock, yeah. So they probably don't have Geki as well. Um but they got knock. Uh, they could have changed as well. Okay, Tomato, Nightmare, Exiled, Serpent. So, okay, so the the Fiber is probably going to eat the Exile. Uh, oh, yeah, why didn't they just draw into all five pieces of Exodia? That's a very good point, Ryler. Um, yeah, that would have probably won them the game if they had done that, but uh, I, I guess they, they just didn't see the line, you know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that, that said, it's definitely the Fiber Jar. That's the only thing it can be. So, um, if Bobby wants to use the Exile, they can. Um... There also was potentially the option of not setting that last card there because um, if you set the last card, then you know that, like, this sets fiber. So, like, it's kind of weird. Um, I don't necessarily... I, I think you... Like, and what's that set card going to do, right? Like, I don't know what the set is, but Jin is on field negating on traps. So, like, what are you really worried about there? Um, I guess if you don't have another monster in hand, your opponent can just bring out Exile, pop the Jinzo, get in for a hand rip and 1,200 damage. So they probably don't have, like, a mirror in hand, or a mirror on field, that is. So, yeah. This this is a very good format for playing goofy decks, rather. I'm not sure if Perfectly Ultimate Moth, uh, I'm not sure if it's that level of goofy, where, like, that deck probably would suffer. 
But there's a lot of very goofy stuff you can play that can do very, very good in this format. So I highly encourage you to check it out if that's what you want to do. Uh, we've, we've got people cooking in this format. Um, when I was really covering it, people cooked. Uh, people continued to cook after that as well. So there's a lot of uh, a spicy decks that you can make in this format if that's what you want to do. Um, but yeah, this is just awkward stuff for sure. Hitting over the set there, it's a tomato. So tomato will get a monster from deck, getting another reaper. So that is good information. Now Lay knows that Bobby's on multiple Reaper, but yeah, this is just rough. Um, MST on the back row there. It's just a ring. Okay, ring is a very powerful card to get rid of here. Uh, setting another passing back, but ah, oh, damn, this is this is just rough. This is rough stuff here. Yeah, this is not good. Yeah, and even if uh, I guess so. Setting the card made sense because like even if um, they'd exiled. It hadn't exiled the Jinzo, just exiled the set monster. They could have some uh, switched New Jordan to attack, crashed into Jinzo, attacked in for Reaper hits. So, yeah, just awkward. Snatch on the Jinzo is something at least. So that can take that back and get in for a ton of damage here. Kind of awkward if uh, if Lei has their own Reaper set. They're going for a Parshath. Okay, never mind. It's not awkward at all because Parshath will be able to get over that set monster there. Now, there is also the argument for just switching the nude to attack, tagging into Jinzo, popping that. But I think they're more scared of the traps than the possibility of Lei having an MST. And we look at the MSTs, uh, Lei already used one, and um, so they might not use another. But uh, Tomato will get them another card here, so that's something at least. But Bobby also gets to draw off that. Um, and also, like, they're going to draw next turn as well. Oh, it's just, it's just not looking good. Oof, that is... Brutal stuff here for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Bobby's got a commanding position in this uh, game. Now, Lei will be getting back a thousand next turn, so that is something, but in terms of the card advantage, it is, oof, it's just rough. But yeah, Reaper getting switched to defense and passing back to Lei here. Uh, a board sweep could do it. You know, Regeki or Dark Hole would be very good against this board, especially given that Witch is on field. So that is something. But they need to draw into that. Dark Hole is there, so Dark Hole will be able to draw, or not draw them into that, but like it will be able to uh, give them a search off that, clear the field, and uh, depending on what they search, it could be very good here. So uh, that's what I meant. But like the board clears, they can't be very powerful at just like locking up the game, but they can also be a very, very good comeback tool in this format. And they make the games a lot more intense. Like you're never quite out of it. Reaper getting searched out, so Reaper could be summoned here, attack in for 300, rip a card out of hand as a potential option. Uh, Serpent is in hand. They do know about that, so that's awkward there. But, like, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. If you hit a non-Serpent, then that's very good. But is that... Oh, they hit the Serpent! No! Oh, that, that just hurts. That just hurts. Oh, no. Yeah, never what you want to see uh, off the Reaper hit. But uh, that is how it goes sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that luck is sinister, mildly upset Gerbil. Exactly. Oh my goodness. Oh man, uh, that's how it goes sometimes. Sometimes the luck is just not with you, you know. But the dark hole was something at least uh, to clear away the board. But yeah, I mean, Bobby has a couple different options here potentially. Um, just setting a bunch, setting a monster. It could be the serpent. Could be something else. Uh, he lay also said this luck is sinister. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a good joke. It repeats uh, across across platforms. TT coming down here. That's going to be very good. Probably popping the Sinister set. And yeah, it doesn't need the Sinister set. So that was a very good situation to be in. Because if you, they don't come to another monster, then, uh, okay, Io coming up here. Now, Io will negate the Mirage. But the issue is that, like, it is, yeah, MST coming down on the Io. I think that is smart. You just got to do that now. Um now, Lay Murphy only has one MSC left in deck, or potentially on field. It could be there, but this could potentially be a bunch of discards for them. Um, so, yeah, they're drawing here, and they're thinking. They potentially have an MST to deal with that Mirage as well. Um, yeah, MST there. Yeah, yeah Raigeki Break is something that you can use to pop Mirage as well, but uh, I we didn't see it in Lay's deck before. Um, a lot of decks aren't like playing it unless they're like built to work around it. So, Reggae Break, very powerful card for sure, but uh, kind of underplayed in the meta at this point. But yeah, getting rid of that Mirage, so now both players... I, I'm shocked that both players are actually at like a relatively even... Uh, relatively even cards. Like, this, this is kind of wild. Both players have a lot of life points left, relatively even cards. Uh, 
yeah, this is, this is kind of wild. Uh, not quite sure why Bobby isn't adding back the Serpent. Maybe they're just forgetting about it. Could be that they want to set up a Mirage play later, and they don't want the Serpent clogging up their hand. Uh, but yeah, Dark Hole really turns things around. That's why I'm okay with, like, Reggae and Dark Hole in this format. One, you can play around it. So, you know, that makes it a bit better. You just don't commit a ton of monsters to board uh, if you're worried about the uh, Dark Lord Raigeki. And two, like, it can be a great comeback mechanic. And Lei were like, out of this game, they, it did not draw a board clear. They drew a board clear, and now the game is anyone's game. So very, very cool stuff. But yeah, shoutouts to MF Doom, Bobby Bodega's uh, profile there. Great stuff. Uh, maybe they'll do some mad villainous plays here. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, great rapper. Uh, gone too soon. Um, but... Yeah, this is a big thing for Bobby. They're going to go for Call here, and they're going to go for uh, Jinzo. And that will indeed go through. So I think Jinzo is a good pick there. Get back the Jinzo attack over the Elf. Uh, Snatch is gone, so you don't have to worry about that. Fiber Jar is gone on Lay's side, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, Bobby can use the Fiber Jar later if they want to, if they want to get back into the game. And they're going to go for a Mirage as well. So this is why they weren't um, getting back the Serpent. You want the Serpent engraved, so that way you can get it back to hand to lessen the impact of the discards, but also you don't want it in hand, so that way you can draw more cards. So, uh, very, very good play here. It is a bit risky. If you don't draw an out to your own Mirage, then that's a bit tough because you're drawing very deep into the deck, and deck out is a potential scary option. Um, but, you know, only one MST has been used up on Bobby's side, so there's still two MSTs left. Painful going, uh, Sister Serpent getting out of the deck there. Um, since so probably gonna be the pick because, you know, it doesn't really do anything on this board. Uh, I guess if Graceful was set, then that's something, but, uh, Lay probably would have used Graceful a lot earlier in the game, uh, if they had Graceful set. Because those have to have been there for a little bit. So, uh, they're gonna send Serpent, and they're gonna send a bunch of others. Huge thing here. Now, the issue is, is that, like, by sending Serpent, you are saying these cards that I'm sending are just going to be deck bins, right? So, they need to decide, like, which cards do I not want to draw in this position? Um, which card do I want to draw in this position? So they need to decide, like, what are the four cards that uh, I want out of my deck? Because there's no way that Bobby does not give them the Serpent here. Um, the Hand Rips could be good options, because the Hand Rips are kind of not the best in, in a simplified game state. Although with Mirage going on, then the Hand Rips could be a bit better. Uh, setting Double Rota, Confi, and Duo. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a smart pick. Rota could be helpful for deck thing more, but also like Rota telegraphs what monster you have, which isn't necessarily the best at this point in the game. Also, no warrior monster in your deck can actually get over Jinzo. So well, Exiled can deal with it, but like, uh, I guess Exiled can deal with it. So maybe you want to keep the Rotas left, but yeah, I think Rota is a respectable send um, off the painful there. So yeah, I think the Serpent is definitely the move here uh, for Bobby because Serpent is a chump blocker. I mean, I guess there is an argument for doing... Um, the, yeah, yeah, Serpent, right? Yeah, uh, there is an argument for, like, doing Confi, because Confi gets them down a 1,000 life points, also you get in for a 2,400 damage attack next turn, but, like, this just gives the most value. Uh, also, if you've got your only MST in hand, okay, they had an MST set, so I guess they even could have done Duo, but, um, yeah, I think that this, this is still better. Yeah, uh, and they're gonna add their own Serpent back now that the Mirage is gone. So, Serpent can summon out, attack over Serpent, and then get him for 24, and that puts a three-turn clock on Lay. So that isn't bad. Also, all traps are negated. Uh, Bobby's thinking, though, so they might have a bit more of a sinister combo in the tank. Uh, they're going to bring out that Serpent, indeed, just attack over the set, attack him for 24. I think this makes sense. It's a, it's a very conservative, um, you know, play, but it also is very good. Um, so, looks like Bobby's going to pass back to Lay here. Uh, Lay's going to draw... They do still have a lot of options here to help them out. Uh, Raigeki, for instance, is in deck, and clearing the um, Jinzo could be good. They're going to bring out a Gemini Elf attack over the Serpent. We know the other card in hand is Serpent, so, you know, it's not the best, but at least it does wall up a little bit against Jinzo. Jinzo just attacked over it for five. Um, but, yeah, it's it's uh, not looking good for Light here, for sure. Heartbeats clear away the back row. That's really good. Hitting a Mirror Force and a TT. Damn, if uh, Lake could have cleared the Jinzo. Oh, well, that's just the end of the game. Yeah, change of heart will do it. Uh, changing the elf and then getting in for a bunch. So, yeah, that's going to do it. And that does play through Karibo as well. Although, uh, they knew that there was no Karibo in hand, but, you know, that, that is the way to play around Karibo. But, yeah, intense games. And that was just game one. <laughs> that was just game one. And not even a fiber draw was activated that game. So, that really does show how down the wire and intense these games can be. Back and forth games uh, all day long. 
I mean, this, this format has just been so, so cool to watch uh, games in. And uh, people could play Karibo. It's a card that people have, like, discussed in, like, the side deck especially. Um, just to curb against certain, like, OTK strats, like, against Machine Reasoning, for instance, it's very good because it stops, like, your, if your opponent activates limit removal, attack them with a 5200 um, Barrel Dragon, use Karibo to, to uh, negate the damage. So, it's very good in that way. Machine Reasoning isn't quite as good a deck to merit, like, uh, specific side deck hate, but, so, you know, are people playing Karibo? Most likely not, but it is something that all people can always play, so it is good to sort of play around just in case if you can play around it. So, yeah. Um, so I would say that Karibo is... Uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't play it in my decks, personally, or most of my decks, at least, but uh, maybe in Alpha 2's deck, that is an option, because Alpha 2 is playing a Necrofear deck, and Karibo is a Fiend. So, yeah. Yeah, Barrel Dragon is Mantle Raider, so it is around in this format. No Blowback Dragon, though, but Barrel Dragon is around. Um, Barrel Dragon, it... People have tried to experiment with it in Critter format, too. Um, it doesn't really do the best in Critter format, because you have access to two Sanya and two Witch. So if your opponent has a set monster, you bring up Barrel Dragon, you know, try and pop it. If you do pop it, they get a search. Not really that good. Uh, and also, it's two Tributes, so you need to put a lot into it. Um, there's only Reborn in Critter format, so... It's the only way to bring it back from Grave. It's kind of awkward in Critter. But uh, in, in Yada, there, there are other ways to bring it out. So um, I, I think it's honestly better in Yada than Critter. Which is kind of wild to think about. But uh, I think that's how it does shake out. But uh, Lay's thinking here. They're going to bring out an Elf to start. Looks like no hand rips, though. Uh, maybe a Dust Shoot, though. Um, but that Elf is going to sit around for a little bit. And... What is Bobby going to do here? They're going to go for Pot. So Pot's a very good start here. Drawn two. Set in one. Set in another. And pass him back to Lay. What is Lay going to do now? They're just going to attack into the set. In case it's Fiber Dragon, you don't want to come in another normal summon here. But it is a Spy. So Spy will be able to get another Spy out from deck. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Spy has been seeing a bit more play in this format. Um... So Spy is a very interesting tool. And uh, yeah, Karibo does see a little bit more play in some Stein formats, but a lot of people just like Threatening Roar and things like that a bit better. Karibo does have the advantage of playing around Cold Wave, which Cold Wave Monarchs like in the Stein is like very, very good. Um, but it's it's not like the go-to way to stop Stein decks, but it is one way that you can stop Stein decks. So uh, I just see some play in those. Uh, but Bobby's thinking here a little bit more. And... Yeah, it's a bit tough. Like, do you... Yeah, they're just going to pass. Yeah, I don't think they need to commit more necessarily here. they got a good board, but you always got to worry about that Raigeki. you got to worry about, like, just tricky edge cases that might come up. Um, Yeah, they're going to... Oh, we got to worry about 4-star as well. Damn, 4-star Ladybug of Doom popping those monsters. Whew. Yeah, that, that does clear it. <laughs> uh, Yeah, and Rota coming down, but Io coming down as well. So Io would uh, protect against the Raigeki as well. But no one's prepared for the four-star ladybug. Uh, yeah, I have stayed on field, so that will stick around, preventing more spells from going through. And that is another 2,700 points of damage against Bobby there. Yeah, brutal stuff. Um, yeah, I was not expecting ladybug either, and I actually saw ladybug in Lay's previous game. So, you know, uh, it's kind of wild uh, that it popped up. But yeah, some people are playing it a little bit more. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's like actually good in Yana format or if it's just something that people are tinkering with that you know, maybe comes up occasionally, but, um, it, it can be, uh, good for making big swings like this. The issue is in Yana format is that there's so many other monsters attacking that are not level four. So this card is a bit less good than it didn't say something like Android format, but it's still good enough to see play. And when it blows out a, a, a board like that, then that is very good. It uh, looks like Lay disconnected here briefly, but they are back. So, uh, they're back in action, ready to go. And... Oh, it looks like, oh, it looks like Bobby might have disconnected. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, it looks like Bobby might have DC'd. Um, DB's been having glitches all day today, man. It is, it is rough. Yeah, it is, it is, it is rough today. It's rough out there. I mean, we saw the glitch earlier, um, with the fiber jar glitch, and now we're seeing this DC, so that is, is, uh, tough stuff. But... Hopefully the DC wraps up pretty quickly because I do think this is a very intense game. So it'd be a shame if it had to end this way. Um, but 
Yeah. No, we wouldn't penalize Bobby here for this. Um, like I never said that we would. Um, I it's just a shame that it's happening this way. Okay, there. Yeah, it's a DC there. Um, so like if the the thing is though, if if the if like one player was kicked out and like could not get back in at all and was just kicked out and the game was lost, right? Then that would be a game loss for them, like a game loss, not a match loss, but a game loss, um, because there's no way to recover that game state. And if it was allowed that, like, okay, yeah, you know, you can just lag out, and if you can't get back in, then there's no consequences. Then what players could do was, and I'm not saying that either of these players would do this, but I'm saying that there are certain bad actors out there who might do this, where uh, they would just like lag out whenever um, their opponent had a punching position, right? And so it's like. You know, again, I'm not saying that these players would do that because they wouldn't. Like, these players are very good players and they play in a bunch of these tournaments and uh, they would not do that sort of thing. But there are players out there who would take advantage of that. And so, you know, that's why if a player is forced to... It's basically, like, locked out of the game by DB and can't get back in. That's why they would, unfortunately, have to take a game loss for that. So, um, it, it's unfortunate, but it is how the uh, how the tournament works. So... Uh, it's one of the downsides to playing online as opposed to in person, but, um, you know, th I think there are also a lot of benefits to playing online. You know, for instance, you can connect people from all over the world to play, which is really cool. Um, so I think that's awesome. But, uh, yeah, Exiled Force is a really cool play. You get to attack over the Ladybug and then, uh, tribute off for the Elf. So you clear that away. And we do know that the last two cards in hand are Blast and one other card. I, I forget the other card. Uh, so let me know in the comments, but I don't think they were, um... Anyway, you can get super aggressive here, but Gear Freed coming down for the blast. Oof, that is that is rough. Um, yeah, Zambira, that's what it was. Yeah, so Zambira can't attack indirectly, so uh, it was relatively safe. But yeah, blast is going to be a bit of a problem. Yeah, MSTing the blast, I do think that is the right move um, to prevent them from having just a pop on their turn. Uh, Gear Freed is a deck that's very good in Yada format, so um, yeah, it, so that's why. They're, they're going for this, but Gemini Elf can clear the Gear Freed with no Blast to protect it. Unfortunately, Zambira can get over the Elf, so, you know, Lay is not, you know, just a sitting duck to this, but it is a very back-and-forth game at this point. We're down into the, the low-resource situation where, like, both players are sort of in top deck mode. Uh, of course, Bobby does have a little bit more cards than Lay does, but still, it's, like, very, very intense. Bo um, Lay has board presence. Bobby's not right now. So Zambira can just keep hitting over Lay, uh, Bobby's stuff, so a bit tricky. Can't necessarily hit over a spy if Bobby is playing the third spy, but it can over a tomato. Now, uh, tomato will get another monster from deck here, and if Bobby so chooses, they can potentially just crash tomatoes into the Zambiras, uh, and um, yeah, it, it could be rough. Um, I think DB is like, I think this tournament, uh, DB has been causing some issues, but um, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, it's the platform we use. It's the best platform we have for this sort of retro tournament play. Um, because it is manual, so you can use the rulings in it um, that actually correspond with the formats. But uh, yeah, I do think it's been having more problems lately. So the Jindo had to be the draw for turn, I think, also. I I'm just going to point this out. Um, because if Jindo wasn't the draw for turn, I think Bobby would have gone for like a Sangan or a Witch. I mean, there was the risk also of like, no, Call was in Grave, so you can't, don't have to worry about that. So yeah, Fiber goes to Grave off Confi. Uh, not back in deck, so that is very important here because... Uh, if, uh, yeah, if that did come up, then that'd be rough. Uh, yeah, thanks for stopping by, Ryler. Uh, and if you do want to see uh, another stream tomorrow, we'll be hosting a stream for the Warrior format tomorrow. So, uh, definitely check back. Um, uh, Bobby could have done what anyway? Um, Bobby, uh, brought a Sangan? No, it, it, that wouldn't have mattered because Sangan is, would get tribute off anyways for Jinzo. So it, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, I mean, you, like, no, that doesn't really make sense. Like, uh, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a silly statement. But, uh, yeah, no, uh, look forward to you being there. Uh, it makes much more sense if you just know about the Zambira on field and you don't have Jinzo in hand to bring out Tomato, because then Tomato can clear the Zambira if you do really want to. Uh, because you just keep crashing in Tomatoes. Um, but... Yeah, Reaper's getting in for 300, ripping a card out of hand. That's very unfortunate for Bobby. Hitting a, oh, hitting a Raigeki. Oh, no. Yeah, that's, that's, that's rough. That's rough stuff. Um, but, yeah. Witch coming down as well. 
Yeah, that is very painful. Yeah, you never want to see the Raigeki ripped out of hand. Uh, which going to hit over the Reaper there, attacking in for 800. And that does wall up the Reaper a little bit. Now, the Lady can just switch the Reaper to defense and wall up for a bit. But we do know that Bobby does play Parshath. So that Parshath could potentially come down and hit over Reaper eventually. Um, so it's a bit scarier. And maybe that's one of the reasons why you should play Parshath in this format. Because it can hit over Reaper. Reaper might be a bit more popular. Uh, Heavy Storm and Feather Duster are both legal in this format. A lot of people don't play Heavy in the main. They just play Feather Duster in the main and then three MSTs. And it may sound crazy to people who are like coming into this format for the first time. Because it's like, Heavy deals with multiple back row. MST just deals with one. But MST being reactive is very important. Because MST can react to things like Imperial Order. Can react to Snap Steel, Premature Burial, Call of the Haunted, etc. And so generally it is good to have the reactiveness of an MST. Rather than just the blowout nature of a Heavy. Uh, Harpies is good though because it just is one sided, so you don't really have to play around it on your end. Um, and also, like, you know, having four spell and drop removal cards is like not terrible. So, um, because spell and drop removal is very important in this format, there are a lot of good traps, but also a lot of good spells, uh, like Mirage Nightmare. There's um, Snap Steel, basically, all the cards that I mentioned that you want to react with uh, to an MST, those are all good to hit with Harpies as well. So, uh, except for Mirage. Mirage, you don't necessarily want to hit with Harpies because uh, then they keep their whole hand. So, yeah. But Lay's thinking here, so they might have a powerful line. Uh, they might have to get rid of their Reaper to do so. So that might be why they're thinking a bit about this. They've used up Dark Hole already, so there's no Dark Hole uh, coming down. Could be Regeki coming down, though, clearing away that uh, Witch and whatever other set monster there is. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely a tricky spot for Lay. Going for MST on the back row, so it seems like they're going for a push here of some sort. You can get Dark Hole. Okay, that's really good. Um, yeah, Dark Hole. So they, that means Bobby did have the option to go for Dark Hole on Witch and, and Reaper and then get a search attack in. But they chose to save that, so that means that the set is probably something like a Serpent or a Sangin, in my opinion. Because then your Dark Hole is still live. And yeah, it is indeed a Serpent. So yeah, so yeah, the Dark Hole is still live. And... Um, and that is a play you want to do eventually. Um, and that's actually very clever to set the Serpent as well, because you set the Serpent, you hope that Lay Murphy also like gets more cards on their field, and then you go for a big Dark Hole later. So unfortunately, the MST did hit the Dark Hole, which is, is kind of rough there. But uh, yeah, I think that was a very good play on Bobby's part. Um, and Lay did correctly snipe it, so that's very good as well. But yeah, Bobby setting another another card in hand. Oh, Knock is going to go brutal here if it is indeed the Reaper or the Serpent. It is indeed the Serpent. So now Lay has a choice. Do they switch the Reaper to attack, rip a card out of hand? It looks like they are indeed going to do that. Bobby does get a search off Witch. They can't search out Serpent. So this card is at risk of dying to the Reaper or the Lug. Now you could potentially search out Parshath. I believe that is 1400 defense. Um, or maybe it's 1600 defense. I think Parshath's searchable off Witch, maybe. Um, but yeah. Um, looks like Lei is not fearing the Mirror Force, in fact, um, because they switched everything to attack. Um, but they do rip the Snatch out of hand. Snatch is very good for, uh, you know, snatching the Zalug, attacking over Reaper, or just snatching the Reaper, getting rid of it. So, um, we do know that the hand, Gemini Elf is in there. MST coming for the last back row, uh, and it is Blast with Chain, so that's a very good MST to use there. And now Gemini Elf hitting into the Zalug, prioritizing clearing a monster off field instead of damage. I think that's very smart. Um, Lay is going to switch that Reaper to defense, and are they going to set another? Or are they just going to leave the Reaper being like, that should be good enough, because if you look at the graveyard, right, Geki's used up. Uh, change is not used up, but Snatch Shield's used up. That's one way to get rid of it. Um, so this is relatively good. So, looks like Bobby's going to set two. Um, curious about what that set is. A lot of good things it could be. Moth would be pretty good here, getting back a, a spell from Grave. Um, painful, though, is going to be pretty good here. Lay can get a bunch of powerful cards to potentially deal with that set, uh, or at least stabilize their position a little bit. Uh, they're setting the Serpent, though, so they're just going for deck thinning here, it looks like. Um, did they even have five cards to get rid of it? Let's see, they might have had another Knock, uh, Raigeki, Change of Heart, that's three. Um, but then if it's like Sangan, then Change of Heart's a lot worse, so you don't really want to do that. Um, they could have sent... Exile, yeah, or I guess they could have sent two Rota. So if they really wanted to get rid of that set, what they could have done was uh, Rota, Rota, um, Change of Heart, Raigeki, and Knock. Assuming they're playing the second Knock, which I assume they are because they're playing a Warrior deck and they're already playing the one Knock here. So I figure they're on two Knocks. So they could do that, get rid of the set in case it's like Jar or something. Jar is kind of rough for them. 
Um, but yeah, I, I don't necessarily like the idea of sending change with certain because you really do want change in the deck to be a top deck later on, right? So yeah, if you're sending Servant, you should send Duo Sentry here as just like more fodder to get out of your deck. Um, but I don't know. It, it's just, that's, I don't know. It's something that I think a lot of newcomers to the format don't quite realize when they first do it because they almost view Painful as like a Foolish Burial for Serpent, which it very well can be. Like I'm not saying you can never use Painful that way, but if you do use it that way, you have to be sending cards that you do not want in your deck. Um, and I think that like, Light probably wants all the other cards in deck, right? Um, but Serpent is just such a, a free give for your opponent, right? Like if you send Serpent, like it's not a painful choice for your opponent. They just give you the Serpent, right? Um, so you want to send other cards that you don't want to see rather than cards that you do want to see. And I feel like you do want to see a lot of the other cards here, but you don't want to see like, you know, Duo or Sentry, right? Uh, you don't want to see potentially, I mean, you could even send the Rotas because like, you don't necessarily want to see... Oh, the, one road is already gone. So the, the play that I said couldn't actually happen, unfortunately. But um, but either way, there I think that you generally don't want to do that sort of thing. I don't know why the stream's been cutting out so much. I'm sorry, folks, for that sort of choppy experience. Maybe it's just my Wi-Fi in addition to DB. Maybe it's just global Wi-Fi just being awkward. Um, but uh, very sorry for that, folks. Hopefully Bobby gets back soon. Just tons of lag, it looks like here. Um, yeah, brutal stuff indeed, but this has been a great game so far and hopefully it continues to, uh, be great because this, this is a very interesting situation because both players are at relatively even cards. Lay, Lay does have a uh, serpent set, so that is something that they'll be able to keep getting back, but that Reaper is going to be very annoying for Bobby to deal with. No, Bobby, Bobby, come back. No. 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. Good. Oh, no, no. Damn. It's given, it's given 290 seconds. Oh my goodness. Reaper gave up on taking cards and decided to take Bobby's life instead. That's very true. Look at this thing. It came directly for Bobby. And now Bobby's uh, internet life is gone. Okay, there. The Bobby's back. Let's go. Oh, goodness. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The 290 thing was, I think, both players DC'd. And when both players DC'd, it does give people um, like five minutes to get back in. Um, so yeah, we're back. We're back better than ever. Oof, just, uh, rough stuff. I'm glad that these games are not getting like, uh, game losses off technicalities like this, because, uh, I, I'm sure that both these players do want to end the game out, like on an actual game ending note, right? They don't want to just get a win through getting kicked or something like that. Right. Um, so yeah, the Reaper tried to take Bobby's life, but it couldn't do it. Came back from the dead. Uh, you have to send another, and Lay send another as well. Let's see, what's, what's Bobby got left in deck? I think that's always a very fun sort of thing to do when it gets to this stage in the game, is, like, to consider, what do people have left in deck, right? What are they trying to draw into? What are their current outs to the board that their opponent has set up? Uh, and knock is definitely a good one, knock in that serpent. So, knock, act, double knock action on the serpents. These serpents both gone, out of there. Um... But yeah, it's revenge. And then ring on the Reaper is going to be pretty good. That will pop both. Both players will take uh, 300. And then uh, Bobby can attack in for 19. Very curious what that set is. Uh, it must be a set that like is a bit weak in terms of attack. Because Bobby's in a bit of a vulnerable position life point wise. So oh, Reborn here is going to be pretty good for Lei. Getting a Jinzo out. So Jinzo will be able to uh, hit over the Elf there. Now, if that set is Magician of Faith, if we think about that, that I do think that um, Bobby probably the win here. I mean, it depends on if they can get back Snatch. Double MST used up, but the last set could be an MST. Um, could also just be a Reaper set. Might That might be the move. Yeah, it is indeed a Reaper set. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense why they kept it set. And now we're back into this sort of same position that was before, where it's kind of a stalemate. Neither player really wants to do anything right now. Uh, what does Lei have to deal with the Reaper? They do have a Raigeki left in deck, so Raigeki will deal with it. Not much else, though, because Snatch and Change are both gone. Exile is still in deck, so that's something. Both Rotos are gone, though. Pre-Map coming out here. Uh, Pre-Map for Exile, probably. Yeah, Exile. Uh, so that's clearing that. Because Bobby recognizes that if um, Lei does draw a way to out the uh, Reaper, 
then they just lose. So they need to clear the uh, Jinzo, even if it does cost them a bit of valuable life points. Uh, Mirage coming down here. There is one MST left in deck, so that MST could be used on that Mirage. Now, Bobby has a bit of an option here because do you switch the Reaper to attack, rip a card out of hand, right? I, I think that might be a bit risky. It really does depend on what Bobby has in their back row. But it might be worth it just to, to sort of get rid of um, something that advantage here. It is, it is very tough. It could lose the game as well, which is why it's a bit of a risk. But it looks like this will probably be the end of the game. If they get back Jinzo and they go for a lethal push here, that very likely will win unless Lei has a Book of Moon in the back row. Which, you know, some people have been playing Book of Moon. They could also have a scapegoat in the back row. But uh, I think this very likely will be the end of the game here. And yeah, that will be the end of the game. So yeah, just an MST back there. So they did have the combo to get rid of the Mirage. Uh, they also did have this combi here if they really did want another hand rip. But oh, and they had the Harpies there too. So yeah, very intense stuff. It really could have gone either way in these last couple turns. So that's part of what makes this format so fun. It really is very volatile, very explosive. Uh, and anyone can really win at any time. So very good stuff. So Bobby's going to be moving on. For the grudge match against all of you two, we saw them earlier in the stream. It was such an awesome match. Uh, hopefully it will be that good this time as well. Hopefully there will be less uh, DCing and technical difficulties and stuff. Um, but it should be pretty good. So, yeah. Awesome stuff there. Um, either player has joined yet. Um, hmm. I'll just jump into this game in the meantime. Uh, what is this format? Uh, this might be Imperial. Yeah. Or it could be a uh, treasure. No, it's Imperial because there's a call to Hana there. So yeah, this might be for the uh, actual Imperial tournament that's also going on right now. So that's kind of cool to see. Uh, I just dumped in because they're two familiar names. Um, yeah, and it looks like, let's see, our, okay. It looks like Bobby and Aleph have reported there. So that means that we've got Aleph versus Bobby happening soon. Let's see. Uh, all of his typing in the Discord. Yeah, and there's the rematch. When will it be hosted is what I'm wondering. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this match. This is going to be very, very cool. Um, very, very cool stuff. Uh, they're checking to see if the, they need a quick break. Um, if there is a quick break, we can jump into the Imperial game going on while we wait for... I mean, let's let's just uh, let's watch the Imperial game while they're deciding on whether they're is going to be a break or not. Because these, these uh, tournaments can be long, long marathons. So sometimes you do really want the break uh, because it's just like, you've been going for a long time. Your brain's a little bit fried. You need, a, you need a bit, but it looks like they are indeed ready. So let's just dive into that game there. And oh my goodness. I'm I'm so excited. I'm so excited. This, this, this you, you guys don't understand how excited I am because that early game, oh my goodness. That was one of the best games I've seen in the auto format. So if this game that's coming up is like on that level, then this is going to be one for the record books. Um, and then whoever wins this is going to face off against Dean as well and then go into the finals with Barcode. So we're nearing the end of the tournament, but these games can go on for quite a while. So um, there's still a lot of time left. Yeah, Lay, I'm glad you enjoyed the tournament. This Was, was this your uh, first time playing Yada format? I think you did really well for your first time. Um, yeah, Reaver is a very, very powerful card. Um, so it, it's very good in these, uh, things. Yeah, first time playing Yada. Uh, did you, uh, did you enjoy the format as a whole? Do you think you'll play it again? It's always cool to see, uh, new people jump into Yada and realize how good it is. Yeah, they're playing it again. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I think this format has such potential for growth. And so it's always great to see more people play and be like, oh, wow. That, that that format's actually really fun. And yeah, it is a lot more balanced than Chaos. Like, you still have a ton of power cards, but for some reason, just, like, the makeup of the format makes it so that, like, the power cards don't really feel, like, too, too busted. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it definitely deserves to have more of a consistent scene. Hopefully we'll get that in the future. Soul of on a pot! Wow! Oh, my goodness. Power plays only from Olive here. Damn. Damn. <laughs> That is, that is wild. Oh my goodness. Having the soul read on Bobby, that Bobby could not punish that. And oh my goodness. That, wow. Wowza. That was, oh my God. That's, whew, because there's so much that can punish that too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now nah, you are not going to play this game. Uh, that is, oh, that's insane. Um, 
And it really is hard to go lethal. Oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense why they did the Solemn. They don't want their opponent to drop because they got the Yadlock potentially coming down online. If Bobby can't deal with that Yadlock, then that's the end of the game. So the issue here, though, is that Bobby sells four cards in hand. So if they play their cards right, they could potentially just stave off the Yadlock, which is a big risk for Olive. But Olive is clearly planning on going all in on this uh, Yada strategy here. Uh, so we'll have to see if it actually pays off. Harpies for the back row is something. Uh, hitting a TT. TT would have been really good, but unfortunately that witch is going to come down, which is also going to get Bobby another search as well if Alf manages to clear the witch. So it's not looking the best for them. Raigeki also already gone, so you can't even really clear the witch through a uh, spell and then get in with multiple germs and then a yada. Um, so it's looking like the yada lock has fallen here, which again, as I mentioned earlier in the in the stream, the yada lock is very powerful if you can pull it off, but oftentimes the, the Yaddle Lock is a lot more difficult to set up than you might expect. And oftentimes when people pull off the Yaddle Lock, it generally is pretty deserved. So, um, yeah. And yeah, Aleph has gone further into their deck as well with that Graceful. Graceful is such a powerful card here. Uh, if they do really want to commit to the Yaddle Lock, Graceful can likely give them the tools to do that. But uh, it is a bit of a thing. You, you really do have to decide a lot in this format. Like, what is my current strategy? Do I need to pivot from that, given what my opponent might have? Or can I risk going for this? despite whatever power cards might be there, or despite whatever my opponent might have, and just trying to win off the back of this. So that's clearly what Olive is deciding right now. They decide, okay, uh, what can I send off Graceful? Uh, oh, sending Necrofear too, wow, okay. That's a bit of an interesting send there, because it's very easy to get three fiends from this position. You've got one German grave already, you've got two germs on field. So Necrofear is being set up later, but I guess the idea is that Alpha is at such low life points, that at this point in the game, Necrofear might not even matter because Bobby might just kill them in one turn, right? Uh, going for a tomato there, tagging into the witch. This is a bit vulnerable to something like uh, Dark Hole or Raigeki. Um, but, you know, this is a lot of damage here. And if Bobby does not have Dark Hole or Raigeki, then this is going to be pretty good. So Bobby's viewing deck right now. They don't decide what to search. Now, if they are very scared of the Yadlock, they could go for Serpent, but Serpent's a bit of a passive play because Serpent gets eaten by the germs, by the tomatoes, so Yadda can still attack in. They could also go for Fiber Jar here, just saying, you know, I need to cut my losses. Knock is already gone, or not Knock, but Raigeki's already gone. That's one of their main ways to actually clear my set Fiber Jar. So, you know, I can just set it. I'm doing better on life points, so, you know, I can just go for this. Um, but yeah, it is awkward. Uh, no, Serpent, what Serpent solves is if Bobby does have a board clear, you can set Serpent to stave off the auto lock later. So that's why I brought it up. But in this current game state, if Bobby does not have a board clear, then the Serpent is much worse. Um, so there is a lot to decide here. Um, yeah, a lot for Bobby to think about. Very, very tricky choice. And which gets you a lot of different targets in this deck. Like which can search pretty much everything in the deck. They're going to search at a Parshath. Okay. That is a very bold play. Uh, I mean, that, that's basically saying, like, I've got Change of Heart, I got Snatch, I got Reborn, I got Premat, I got a variety of things that can get me back that Witch, tribute over it for a, uh, Parshath, or I've got a way to take your stuff and, uh, bring up Parshath. So, very scary play for Olive, but Olive does have a painful choice here, and painful choice can potentially deal with that Parshath. Now, this is going to be a very, very tricky painful choice. You don't necessarily want to... Uh, try to send the um, Serpent, what you want to send is the Hand Rips, because Hand Rips can deal with what Bobby might have in hand there. And it can also potentially set up for insurance if you are worried about Bobby bringing out the Parsha. So the Hand Rips are definitely must-sends, but the real question here is what are the other two cards that you're sending from deck? So this is a very, very interesting situation, a very tough choice off Painful. And then on Bobby's side of things, once you see the hand rips go, once you see those two remaining cards, what do you actually give your opponent? Pot and change could be options, but I'm not sure if Aleph wants to necessarily go for that because pot and change, like change of heart, especially Aleph does not want to go for, because change of heart does not deal with the Parshath preemptively. What Aleph does not want to happen is Bobby to get out the Parshath, hit over stuff, draw another card, and do things like that. So what they're saying is MST here to deal with if it's Snatch in hand, and they'll, they might send another MST, they might send... Oh, it's tough. It's, it's tough stuff. I don't think MST is terrible, though, because they're saying, like, okay, if you've got Snatch, then this stops the Snatch. Doesn't stop Change, but does stop Snatch. Yeah, this, this is a tough, tough choice for sure. But, and they're going to send Ring as well. I think Ring is a very, very good pick here. 
Uh, I, I think Bobby's probably going to give the MST. Um, because MST only deals with Snatch. Yeah, okay, it is a painful choice, so maybe they do indeed have the Snatch deal in hand. So, Aleph with another Soul Read saying, you don't have Change of Heart, you've got Snatch deal. Uh, or you've, oh, actually, actually, so I will say, uh, MST also deals with Premat. Premat is an option to bring out the Witch and then tribute over for Parshath, so, uh, it basically, like, 50-50, because the things that get you Parshath on field are Change of Heart, Premature Burial, Snatch Teal, and um, Monster Reborn, right? Those are the four that do it. And so what you're trying to do here is you're trying to mitigate against half of those. And the fact that Bobby is thinking so much means that they must have a Snatch Teal or a Premat. They're going to give the ring, and that to me says that they probably have the Premat, because if they've got the Premat, then they can bring back Witch. If Aleph wants to ring the Witch, that's really bad for them. Uh, but they'll probably just ring, uh, ring the Parshath when that comes down, and Bobby still gets a search here. So that would be my guess there. Um, so, yeah, I would guess that it is pre in hand. Painful choice here, though. Wow. And, oh, my goodness. Uh, painful's on both sides, and this is showing the power of Painful, but also how difficult it really is. Uh, Painful is one of the coolest cards in the game's history, design-wise. And while eventually the game gets to a point where Painful is definitely not allowed to be legal because there's so much you can do with graveyard setup, in a format like this, Painful is actually really, really... I, I would even say balanced. I think it's it's a pretty balanced card. Um, I think it deserves to be limited. Don't get me wrong. But I also think that it can lead to very, very interesting game states like this. Uh, oh, man. That is a choice. I think, honestly, this might sound crazy. I could see Darkhold. Okay, going for MST instead. I, I don't know. I don't know about that. MST because Parshat is so good. So, yeah, I'm seeing the back row preemptively. It might just be an IO here. Oh, it's a ring, yeah. I don't I don't know. I think Darkhold actually might have been the pick. As wild as that may sound, I think that Darkhold might have been the pick. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, I mean, it still isn't... It, it is a huge investment to get the Parshat. That is very true, uh, Gerbil. But, I don't know, you get the drawback. So, like, you know, there is that, too. And, I mean, Bobby's also taking five here, but, like, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really think I really think that the, the Dark Hole was the move. But um, all of also has other things in hand that they know about. So, like, yeah, I think, I think it's fine. And, like, Premat ultimately... I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's kind of rough. But, um, yeah. Very, very intense game. And also, like, I think that there's been a lot of very skill-intensive decisions here. So, very, very good stuff, for sure. Um, both players are even now on cards. And we do know that Aleph has a Yada in hand, too. So, so okay, another reason to pick the Dark Hole here is because if Bobby doesn't have another monster and they don't have Premat, then Yada basically sets up the Yada Lock, right? So, I actually think Dark Hole would have been the right choice there. Um, it really does depend on what the last card in Bobby's hand was, but given what you know, like, you want the ring online to set up the Yada. So, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think that might have been a misplay. Unless, unless Olive has... Uh, okay, Jeroid actually does clear the par shaft, so that is very funny. Um, and now you're in a relatively good spot as well. You can still attack in with the Germ, get in for more damage here. Both players are relatively low on life. So you're doing pretty good that way. Yeah, Jeroid is indeed playable. It's seen play in this deck, at least. Came out in Legacy of Darkness, I believe. Um, but yeah, Fuel in the Fiends. I mean, we saw the Necrofear there in Grave. Uh, Tomato coming out, though, so that will run over the Jeroid there. And, yeah, that's going to be quite unfortunate there. Uh, tomato can float into other things as well, so the Yada is less likely to go off. So, yeah, it's a bit tough. A bit tough indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing Necrofear doing well here, so uh, Olive is definitely trying to pilot it to a tournament victory. Uh, if anyone can do it, it is Olive, so we'll have to see what they do here. They're going to set one, switch to the German defense, and pass back to... Oh, set another, pass back to uh, Bodega. Yeah. Not much you can do against that tomato there. Um, now, what is the set, do we think? Do we think it's the Yada, just the chump block, or do we think it's something else? They're going to take into the germ, uh, just attacking into the unknown. I think that makes... Or attacking into the known, so that makes sense. And then you're going to set one, pass back to Olive. It's getting a bit scary for Olive here. Bobby has the aggressive pressure, and depending on what your set is, you might be in a bit of a tough spot. Going for Darkhole here. That's a pretty good Darkhole if it goes through. 
uh, and no Iowan Grave, so it might not have, but yeah, hidden a Serpent, so Serpent was there, so uh, if Bobby already had the Serpent, then the Yaddle Lock would have been cut off, but it's still, they're going for the Yada anyways. Uh, Bobby can get back the Serpent to hand and, you know, poke in, but oh, Ring here on the Yada, that is something at least, so that will deal with that, deal 200 to both players, and now Alpha is in a bit of a scary spot. But Bobby might not really have much here, is the thing. And Alf does have a back row, so that is something that Bobby has to worry about here. But man, such a such an intense game. I mean, whenever you get these two players in a room, you're going to have an intense match. Um, Yada coming down on Bobby's side here. So, you know, saying Uno reverse on this, and that will indeed go through. So, yeah, it's not looking good for Olive here. They're going to have their turn here. If they've got something to do, then they can do it. Oh, they got Serpent. So Serpent can block off the Adalok for them. So that is something. Honestly, you could bring out Serpent Poke. I think that's not terrible. Um, so Serpent can attack in and also blocked off the Yada. You're risking taking damage yourself, but you're also dropping Bobby down to 1,400. So yeah, it looks like they're just going to bring out the Serpent Poke. I think this makes sense. It plays around Knock as well, because if Knock comes down on the Serpent, then you're just dead, right? So I like this play. Snatch is gone, so you don't need to worry about that. It looks like Bobby's just going to set one, set another pass back to Aleph. Now, is that another Serpent or is it something else? That is the question. Aleph does get a draw here because the Yada Lock is offline. And this is what I was saying, where like Yada is a very powerful card, but it doesn't necessarily, the lock isn't permanent, right? In a lot of cases, it can be. And if it is permanent, then you win the game. But setting up that lock can take a lot of difficult maneuvering. So um, it generally feels more okay to lose to the lock than in later formats. But um, New Doria coming down. That's going to be a pretty good aggressive pressure here. Uh, attacking in to the set with the Serpent. Uh, saying that is a Serpent. I know it's a Serpent. And it was indeed the Serpent. Tagging in for 12. Dropping Bobby down to 2. And this is a very, very scary place to be for Bobby. Uh, given the uh, board here. Because if they bring out a monster and attack. Then you know New Doria pops it. If they set another monster. New Doria can attack over it. And then uh, Alf can attack in directly with Serp. So yeah. Not looking good for Bobby. Bobby's got to get a pretty good card here to, to win. Um, there are, well, Regeki and Darkhold are both gone, so those don't do it. Change of Heart doesn't quite do it as well. It just deals 900. Um, yeah, not looking good. Not looking good for Bobby. Bobby does have some options, though, clearly, because they got four cards in hand. There's always something they can do. But uh, it just depends on whether they can actually do enough to win. And it looks like they're just going to set and pass. So if that set is the Serpent again, then that will be the end of the game, I think. Um, but if it's not, which it very well might not be, then Bobby is still in it, even though they are only 200. The rings are both gone, so they don't need to worry about that. A lot of people don't play Cancelled here, but oh, yeah, that's just going to be the end of the game there. Very, very intense game. That was one of the most intense games I've seen in this format. And that was game one. So I can't wait for the rest of the match. I mean, oh my goodness. Uh... Just so many, like, wild plays there. Things that I wouldn't necessarily have done, like the the Solemn on the pot. Like, that was very intense. Like, but Aleph knew that they were just going for the Adalok. They had the Regeki to try and push for that even further. So it uh, made sense in that context. But, like, wow, this is, like, a match between two very, very good players here. Um, Yeah, I would say the the one thing... I mean, Aleph won either way, but I th I'd say the one thing that I would have done that I, I think I honestly can defend as being... um. A different thing that I do is giving the dark hole as opposed to the MST because um, you you're like you want the ring up so that way they don't get the par trap and draw deeper, right? So you're fine losing the board because you've still got Yada. Yada plays around snatch, um, and if they do a pre mat to bring out the the par trap, then you've got ring for that. So I guess ring puts you down really low, and and Yada is going back to hand every time. So I guess that's the argument for MST. But I don't know. Um, that that's just me. That, that was just a uh, my opinion on it, but I also didn't know Alice's hand at the time, so. Um, but anyways, uh, we're going into game two. Bobby's going first this time. And will they be able to tie up the match going into game three? They're setting one, setting another, passing back to Olive. Are we going to see another Solomon a pop play? <laughs> this was the exact start that Olive had, too. Um, going to go for Forceful here. That's going to be pretty rough if Bobby doesn't have a way to stop it. And it looks like they don't, so... This, to me, so that Aleph is not probably going to go aggressive this turn because you don't necessarily want to uh, hit into, like, a Sangen after firing the Forceful. And you generally want to save the Forceful for um, if you're, like, attacking in, in case it is a Sangen, right? So 
or a witch, which also exists. So it looks like the hand is Gemini, Elf, Exiled, Force, MST, and Duster. Uh, that is very good knowledge to know, so you don't want to necessarily commit too many back row here. Uh, it looks like Elf's just going to set one. They're going to decide whether they set two or not. They're going to set another and pass back to Bobby. So yeah, I think just one set is fine. MST in the end phase for that. So it looks like Bobby was a bit bricked up on uh, MSTs and Harpies. So yeah. And uh, Elf is definitely a very interesting card to return to deck, but it means that uh, Elf does not want them to have an offensive beater here. Now, what Bobby can do is they can bring an Exile, pop the set, and then potentially attack him with the set that they have there. It's kind of awkward because Elf knew about that play coming. So uh, it's kind of weird there. Also, all set in MST, so that's a clear bluff. That doesn't actually stop a play where like Exile comes out and then Bobby attacks in. So that set is probably not something that Bobby wants to Exile here. Um, it could also be a mind game, and Alfie 2 is doing this because they knew that Bobby would MST the set, uh, whether that was the MST in hand or the MST on field, and they wanted the, them to sort of think, like, oh, I shouldn't exile this card. Um, a lot of mind games going on. But either way, uh, Alfie is definitely in a more advantageous position because they know what Bobby has largely. Um, so they can sort of just keep playing around that. Which coming down, which is going to be pretty good, and Germ also getting flipped up. So, you know, Exiles can deal with that Germ next turn, but it's still pretty good here. Um, germ attacking into Emmons, or, uh, Witch here, uh, it's going to take two. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily, like, Aleph not expecting the MST, but, like, MST is a perfectly good trade for the MST, because, like, basically the idea behind setting MST is if Bobby, like, activates MST on your MST, use MST on their back row. So your MST was trading for their back row no matter what. It was just a matter of, like, whether uh, they would use the MST from hand. Going for Solemn on pot again. <laughs> oh my goodness. Every time. Uh, wild stuff. Um, will it pay off for all of this game is a big question though. Because what Bobby could do here is they could just sort of wall up a bit. They could bring out Exiled, pop the Germ. I don't think that's a bad choice. Oh, graceful. Oh my goodness. That's the punish for that sort of thing. Looks like Bobby probably was saving the graceful that they drew last turn um, for when they had a more advantageous discard. But now that Aleph is down to 3,900, uh, you go for Graceful because uh, you could potentially win the game here. So, yeah, bit of a big punish here, but it might still not be the end of the game. The fact that Bobby is thinking about what to discard here means that they might not have a lethal line. Very intense stuff, though. Pitching a knock. Yeah, knock isn't really going to come up here uh, when your opponent's got a bunch of uh, monsters in attack. You don't really need the knock right now. You also got the exiled in hand as well. But, yeah, they're just going to pass. Okay, not choosing to exile the germ. Um, I guess you're saving exile for a bigger threat. But I think you kind of want to exile the germ because, like, germ is just annoying. But, I, I don't know. I guess germ isn't the most annoying thing in the world. You might want to save exile for, like, a fiber guard or something. But in that case, why not save the knock, right? So, uh, I don't know. I guess exile is more flexible. So, yeah. But, a very intense game indeed. Now, the question is, what is Aleph going to do in this situation? Oh, okay. Bring out a Jinzo there. Very, very good. Uh, you got to search off Witch, get to attack over their Witch, attacking directly with Germ, potentially. Uh, but now Bobby's saving of the Exile actually makes a lot of sense because Exile can pop that Jinzo, and that's very good for them. So it looks like Aleph is indeed going to go aggressive here, attacking over the Witch, and then attacking in for 1,000 with the Germ. So... Uh, Bobby's got a search here, though, and that search could be something to deal with this board, potentially. Big think, though. And a deservedly big think, because this is a very important search off the Witch. This could potentially decide the course of the game from this point onward. And there are a lot of good options that you can get out here. Now, you know about the tomato in Alfia's hand as well, so you know they're getting a bunch of annoying monsters to deal with. You could just go for a desperate, like, fiber jar search, right? You're still doing good on life. Your opponent's at 3,900, so fiber jar is honestly not a bad option here. That could be what they're thinking about. They could just be thinking about, no! Like, no, no! Oh! Rip. Okay, they're back. They're back! Okay, Woo. Man, DB. DB's got a vendetta against Bobby Bodega. Either that or Bobby Bodega's Wi-Fi has got a vendetta against them. But uh, either way, uh, it's uh, looking good. They're thinking. I mean, yeah, you got to think here. This is a very, very big thing. I mean, for the people out there who might say that Yada is not a skill-intended format, look at these games. Like, look at how much each player is thinking about what they're getting. 
There's a lot that goes into this. A lot of mind games, a lot of things about what the opponent might have, a lot of things about what you might have. Like, there's just so much going on. This is one of the most skill-intensive formats uh, in the DM era, for sure. Uh, maybe even in the game's history, maybe not in the game's history. Like, I'm, I'm not willing to make that claim because I haven't explored the entirety of the game's history. But uh, it is still a very, very intensive, uh, skill-intensive format. And turning out to Jinzo here is very interesting. It means that they, again, this telegraphing that they might have a way to take control of the germ or the Jinzo there and bring that out. But um, definitely an interesting choice off the witch. So they're thinking they do have one MST left in hand. So MST can deal with the set there if they do want to go for that. But they might want to say, well, they, yeah, you can just go for it because they don't have to worry about IO being set. Um, because IO said it can't activate because Jinzo is on the field. So. Um, so they're thinking, they're thinking about exactly what to do. This is indeed a big thing. It's very, very similar to last game where uh, Bobby had the Parshath in hand threatening things. Now they've got the Jinzo in hand threatening things. So yeah, it's a tough spot for Alt to be in for sure with that low of life point total. And Alt doesn't even have the, the lingering threat this time of Yada. I mean, they might have it in hand, but like it's an unknown. So Bobby isn't necessarily going to like play as carefully around the Yada lock going through, which could benefit Olive, but um, Bobby could also be considering that Olive might have that already. So. But we know the hand is tomato and one other. So tomato is very annoying to deal with. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. I think MSTing the back row isn't bad, although Olive also knows about the MST in the hand. So, like, could just be bait. Hmm. Tricky stuff. Change of heart on the germ instead of the Jinzo. So the Jinzos can just crash after this, and then you save the exile for the tomato. Uh, I don't hate that play. Uh, I think that's a pretty good play. Uh, because you're also high on life points. And your opponent does bring out Yada here. Uh, you do have ways to threaten more damage and things like that. So uh, I think you're in a pretty good spot. So I think that probably was the correct play there. And now for main two, you could potentially set like the MST. You could activate the MST on whatever the set is. Um, th there's a lot of different options here. You could also not set the MST in case Alf has a call set. And then they fire call in the end phase to bring back Jinzo. So that way you can actually use the MST from hand in response to that. Um, there's a lot of different things to consider. Although, would Aleph have set the call, uh, if they had Jinzo on field? Probably not. You probably want to save the call for after that. But they're going to bring out a tomato here, attack in for 14. That will indeed go through. And Bobby, next turn, might just go for exile on the tomato. Uh, just clear that. A lot of different options for them this, uh, next turn. And Aleph's going to set another now that the Harpy's Feather Duster is gone. They can feel a bit more safe setting multiple back row. Because generally people don't play heavy. Um, especially if you see that your opponent's deck is not playing like the most back row. You don't necessarily want to bring in a heavy. Um, people could bring it in for surprise because a lot of the times the way people play in this format is once the duster is gone, they just set as many back rows as they want. But, um, I think it's probably fine to do this. And this is another big think. For Bobby here. The play that we know about that they have is just Exiled Pop. And that is indeed, seems like what they're doing. Uh, so just bring out Exiled Pop and that tomato there. And maybe just passing. Oh, they got Reborn as well. And they're going to go for Jinzo. Which Jinzo though? That's the question. I honestly think there there is an argument for going for your opponent's Jinzo there. And the reason for that is you've got MST to deal with a call. However, uh, if your opponent draws Snatch Steel, you don't necessarily want to be in a position where you have to lose to the Snatch Steel, right? So you want to save the MST for that. So I think ultimately it probably is better that you use Reborn on your own Jinzo, but yeah, this is a tough spot for Alf to be in. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really sure how many ways... Okay, there's the Snatch, but the MST is in the back row there to deal with the Snatch. So that's one avenue gone. I don't know. They're in, a, they're in a tough spot. I mean, they knew about the MST. So they probably have some other stuff here. They've got Jeroid to decrease the attack of the Jinzo, block off things a little bit because you're only taking 400 damage next turn if they don't have another monster. Um, but it is a little bit awkward here. So as soon as that 1600 here. Um, yeah, this is, won't quite be a game depending on what else they have. But if they do have another monster here, that could just be the end of the game. Um, Painful, though. Painful should be able to send enough monsters to win. 
because all you need is a monster with 1,100 or more attack. So if you send just five monsters, then I'll just do it. So yeah, double Wangu, Elf, Elf, and yeah, one more should do it. Uh, Wangu, yeah. That should be the end of the game. Yep, and that will indeed be the end of the game. So, you know, uh, Alf did what they had to do, but it was not enough against Bobby. And that, again, shows the flexibility of Painful Choice. You know, if you need to get a monster to hand with a certain amount of attack, you generally have enough in your deck, you can use Painful Choice to get that. And that was how it happened there. So Painful, a very, very versatile card, can be used to set up lethal lines, can be used just to deck thin, can be used for a variety of different options. So very tricky card to use, but a uh, powerful one if used correctly. But we're going in to the game three here. Um, yeah, Judgment can cost duels, but it can also win duels, right? Like, that's why Judgment's so powerful, right? Like, you could argue that Judgment won the first game. Um, and you could argue that Judgment lost this game. So, like, it's a very risky card, but in the hand of a skilled player, it can be very, very good. And all of you, too, is a very skilled player. Both players are very uh, skilled players. Um, but, you know, it is a very, very risky card, for sure. Um... Yeah. I mean, it didn't just happen to lead to a win. It was used in a way that led to a win. Like, you know, that's, I, I feel like a lot of people like, and I really hate this argument against judgment where they're like, oh, judgment, you know, people overrate it because it can need everything, but life points matter a lot more in the DM era. So like, yeah. And, and like, occasionally you get, uh, you use it at the right time and you get lucky in the stars align, you win with judgment, but a lot of the time you use it and you just die. Right. And to some extent, there is some truth in that argument, right? Like, to be fair, there are formats where judgment's a lot worse because life points matter a lot more. For instance, in a more tempo-oriented format, like Android format, like Vampire format, uh, or even like Chaos format, right? Like judgment, I think, is really bad. Um, but in a format that's a bit more grindy, like Critter format, like potentially Yada format, uh, then I think it can be used a lot better because oftentimes uh, your opponent doesn't have multiple aggressive threats that are constantly spitting out on board and hitting you in with. Uh, you, if you can control the pace of the game with judgment, then it can be very, very good. Of course, if you use it incorrectly or um, you misjudge when you use judgment or things like that, then it can cost you the game, right? Um, but I do think that, like, the potential of the card is good enough, and the fact that you get to choose when to play with it is means that, like, it's not causing you to lose games most of the time. It, like, if used correctly, it is a very good card. So um, it often does just come down to skill. Use skillfully, it can win you the game. Use not skillfully, it can lose you the game. Even if used skillfully, it can also lose you the game. There is that case as well. Um, but, like, I, I do think that people, like, overestimate the amount uh, that just caused you to lose games. Um, so, yeah, I'm not saying it's, like, I'm not saying that it's as good as, like, later on in the game's history. Because later on in the game's history, it gets much better. Like, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that it can be very good in a format like this, right? And I feel like a lot of people do just sort of, like, rag on this card, like, overly harshly. So, um, yeah. So, Spy getting flipped up, bringing out another Spy here. And an Exile Force coming down, so Alpha 2 is getting a bit aggressive here, uh, popping that set. Oh, it's a Witch, though. That is unfortunate. Uh, so, Exile, unfortunately, uh, not hitting a high-priority target. But uh, at least these Spies can attack in for 2,400 damage if that goes through. And it will indeed go through here. So, I don't think this was a bad turn from Aleph, especially if they've got other things in hand to keep the aggressive pressure going. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of unfortunate using an exiled on a on a witch. That's the end of water bottle number one. So that means we gotta go into water bottle number two now. I prepared. Water bottle number two. I was ready for the long haul for this stream, so you know. I, I got all the hydration I may need. Uh, tomato coming down as well here. And uh, Spy attacking in first. Figuring it might be a like um, a Serpent, but it is not. Yeah, Water Bottle number two is really good in this meta. I haven't used it yet, but I can already sense, given the way my throat feels, that Water Bottle number two is going to be a game changer. Uh, I highly encourage people, uh, if they do stream Yada tournaments in the future, make sure you bring Water Bottle number two. It is just such a good uh, bottle, and it's really underplayed, uh, in my opinion. But those tomatoes are going to crash in. And we got a bit of a tomato war going on here. So if we look at Bobby's tomatoes, they've used up two so far. Alf has only used up one. And so they can bring out that tomato, crash into the tomato, bring out another. Unless they bricked on tomatoes in hand, which could be rough. We bring out Nudoria instead, though. This is also a respectable uh, other option. Bring out Nudoria, crash into the tomato, pop the tomato, and then you get in for 12 more. But Ring comes down to stop that, getting rid of that Nudoria there. 
Now, the good thing here is that Olive can still switch the Spy to Defense. They still get in the amount of damage that they wanted to get in originally, right? If Midoriya attacked into the Tomato, then they would have gotten in for 1,200 off the Spy. Um, but, you know, Midoriya is a very powerful card, and uh, unfortunately, he's not able to pop that Tomato, leaving Bobby with a powerful card as well. So, yeah, definitely a, a tough turn of events for Olive, but still definitely by no means uh, a terrible situation. And they're setting a bunch of back row going for Mirage there. So that means they probably have an MST in the back row as well. One of the nice things about going for Mirage uh, when you have a full back row is even if your opponent dusters you, uh, then you don't have to discard off Mirage. So like it oftentimes does pay you back in terms of the cards that you're losing. Uh, unfortunately, it can also lose you some very powerful cards. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I do think it is still a good option. So Bobby's got to think about exactly what to do here. If they get duster, they might want to fire it. Um, but Alf might also have a, an Imperial Order in the back row to stop that. It looks like they're going to go for Jinzo first to shut off an Order that might be in the back row. Uh, Alf might have a Solemn for this. Uh, if they do have a Solemn, this might be the time to use it. Uh, I don't think this is a bad Solemn opportunity, but it doesn't need to go through. That Jinzo is going to attack into the Spy and attack position and deal 1,200. So this means that Alf probably has a way to deal with Jinzo, or they're trying to bluff the Solemn in the back row. Uh, say, oh, look, I'm saving this uh, Solemn. But, um... Yeah, I feel like they might have drawn into a way to deal with Jinzo here. So in the draw, they're thinking about exactly what to do. Uh, they could actually have a lethal line, potentially. They want to MST the back row, which would be kind of wild. Uh, but they are going to MST the Mirage. So I think that probably is the safer play to do, especially if the back row is like MST. MST could pop what you have in the back row that you want to use to win. So I think this does make sense. Going for Forceful here, seeing what's in the hand. Bobby's thinking about that, but they can't activate Judgment. They can't activate IO. So um yeah, that force will just go through. Um, yeah, we really haven't seen too many Tomato Wars in these Yada streams, but it does happen occasionally. It happens much more frequently in past formats, but it, Tomato is still very played in Yada format, and it's very, very good. And so if you see two people with multiple Tomatoes, then they get to uh, go for that. So uh, Forceful, send back a card from hand, send back the Exile there, uh, and leaving uh, Bobby with Sangan, Serpent, and Darkhold. So that's quite the hand. Um curious why they sent back exiled i guess the they must have a set monster that they can bring out here but then hole can deal with that but hole also deals with their jinzo so uh a bit of an interesting choice turning over the spy for a jinzo of their own okay jinzo crashing there um well you don't really care about like popping the spy because like you first of all you got dark hole if the jinzo is clear but if the jinzo isn't clear then jinzo can just hit over the spy so um yeah but anyways, uh, Jinzo crashing here now. Both players' traps are back online if they've got traps in the back row. Um, but yeah, Bobby is going to bring out Sangan here just to attack in. I mean, Alf knew about Sangan, so they knew this was coming. Um, but yeah, that's going to be a bit annoying for them. Are they thinking about whether to take this? Maybe they got call for their own Jinzo? They got call for their own Jinzo. That's pretty good. I feel like you don't, you, you like never TT this, right? If they had TT, they probably just would have let Bobby keep the exile and send back Sangin, right? Um, they're thinking. Yeah, they're going to take the thousand. I think it's more likely they've got a call in the back row than like a TT. But yeah. Oh yeah, that's why TT is not really the best there. And that's why if they had TT, they would have sent back Sangin as opposed to exile. So I don't think they have TT. I think that's, like, that's my solid read on the situation. They don't have TT in the back row. Uh, or else they would have done things differently with the uh, Forceful. Uh, but they are going to set one. And I think that set monster is live. So there is the question, does Bobby dark hole the board? Um, Alf is telegraphing that the, that the set monster is a live monster. So there is worlds where, like, Bobby does not go for the dark hole here. Because Olive knows about the dark hole. And they're saying, they sent back the exile. So they're saying, like, no, don't pop my monster that I bring out. So this this could just be a ploy to waste the dark hole on Bobby's part. So Bobby does have to think about that. They have to think like, you know, is it worth going for dark hole here? What potential flip monster do they have? If it is a flip monster, is it even, um, you know, is there anything too bad that it can be? And what do I do here? What what also is Aleph playing? Are they playing Magician of Faith to get back pot? Are they playing, you know, Fiber Jar? Are they, like, what are they playing? There's a variety of things. Dark Hole is coming down here. All thinking here. If they've got a Solemn, now might be the time to do it. But uh, they've got Io instead, so Io's going to be very good. MST for the Io, though. 
So that will stop that. And I was thinking, so they might have a solemn for this. I think if you do have a solemn for this, you do want to use it on the MST. Depending on what the set monster is, of course. Um, but yeah, it looks like that will go through and that will clear the entire board there. So Sangain getting a search as well. And oh, they did have a moth set. So that was very, very good um, on Bobby's part. But yeah, getting a Reaper as well to rip a card out of hand here is going to be very good. Um, again, I don't have the strongest read of the back rows TT. And yeah, the back rows TT, you definitely want to use TT there. But uh, I was just thinking maybe they've got Mirror Force. Maybe they do have the Call of the Haunted as I was thinking earlier. Uh, no, they do have the Mirror Force. So yeah, Mirror Force will deal with Reaper. And Bobby's checking the grave, seeing what they have to play around, seeing what they have to play into. And they're just passing back to Aleph. So no back row for Bobby here. The, the gates are open. Uh, and Aleph can just attack in. And also, now all the cards that Aleph knew in hand are used up, except for Serp. Yeah, Mirror Force 1 for 1 is, like, really unfortunate, but if you think about it, like, oh, okay, well, uh, Yada's gonna be pretty good here, and getting back a Jinzo, most likely, I would assume. I, don't, I, I actually think this... Well, I get it, because the Serpent's gonna come out either way, right? But, like, maybe you save it for Exile, but... Yeah, yeah, this definitely makes it worth it as well, um, Gerbil. And it contextualized a lot of, like, why they used um, Mirror Force there. But, yeah, Mirror Force, like, it was kind of a two-for-one there because the Reaper would have taken two cards. So, like, you got to use the Mirror Force on that, even if you don't have this combo. But I think this is a very, very good combo. Very tough for Bobby to come back from this. Um, of course, they can set the Serpent for a turn, but then the Yaddle Lock goes online. That's kind of unfortunate. If they've got a monster that can actually... Do something here that they didn't play that, but like, yeah, it's looking rough. They got a serpent and two unknowns. Change will get in for 24 here. Hold up. Do they have a lethal line? No, okay, they just got exiled, but this is still good because then you can use exile, pop the Jinzo. You're in the Yaddle Lock for one turn, but then you set serpent and then your opponent needs to have a way to deal with that. So, honestly, I think this probably is the best move they had. Um, it's still not the best move. There is still a lot of things that, oh, uh, yeah, that's the end of the game. Wow, that was incredible. That was that was really good. Really, really good games. Um, I mean, yeah, you, like Bobby had to do that. That was like basically their oh, graceful on the top. Oh, that's rough. But uh, yeah, Bobby had to do that. Uh, and also, I did not I'll almost have lethal, but they did not quite have lethal the previous turn. Um, they would have been one hundred off with the Gemini Elf. And honestly, given the graceful on top, probably better than they went for the Yada. But yeah, very, very good games there. Whew, good stuff. So. That means that Aleph is facing against Dean yet again. And then the winner of that will go on to face Barcode. Oh, man. This this storm has been hype. We've been going on for quite some time now. Uh, three hours and 41 minutes so far. So uh, I, I think there's probably like at least another hour left in this tournament. Um, just, you know, letting you know for, uh, you know, just uh, in terms of like if you're tired out from the stream, you can jump back in then uh, or things like that. But I think that the game's... Uh, up to the finals will be also really, really good. So I'm looking forward to those. Um, I think I think I might have to do a first on the channel, uh, which is kind of wild. Ever since I've streamed, uh, I've never gotten up from this chair, I don't think. Um, but I might have to do a first and use the restroom. But uh, yeah, I think I might do that once the game starts up. So that way you're not missing anything, you know. Um, but once that happens, I'll just quickly run to the restroom and uh and then i'll be back don't worry i'll be back on stream so it'll be fun it shouldn't be that long um but yeah we got dean <laughs> look that's a great username get sacked that is a great username oh my goodness uh and yeah they're playing hat i feel like hat isn't the sackiest format although there are soul charges uh yeah that's true i do have an empty water bottle you know who would even know yeah, no. I, don't, I don't want to risk anything that gets me violated on uh youtube's terms of services though um, so yeah, although I know that I know it's the true gamer move to just, you know, uh, make use of that empty water bottle. That's, that's another benefit of water bottle number two, you know, because you still got water bottle number one lying around. So, uh, the, the applications are just numerous, you know, so many applications for it, but unfortunately I'm not brave enough. I, I'm not willing to risk it, you know, I'm not willing to risk it for the biscuit. Um, but yeah, very, very good stuff here. So I'm seeing, uh, when they get on here because i on the discord they're they're uh they're doing stuff so um i'm just uh typing out a message as well 
multitasking. That's the that's the bread and butter of being a streamer here. But it's very exciting. Now that we're down to three players left, who do y'all think is going to win the tournament? I, I'm kind of wondering that. Because, you know, yes, Barco does have the advantage of having to lose two games as opposed to just one. But, you know, both players left are also very, very good players. So I think any of them could potentially take it. Let's see. Let's look at let's look at the uh, the bracket. Has Aleph played Barcode yet? Aleph did not play Barcode, but they did play Dean, and they lost to Dean before. So this is a rematch here to see who will win that, and then the winner will go on to face Barcode. So you you never know what will happen in these new matchups, but we also never know what will happen in these old matchups. Uh, while Alpha Two did win against Bobby before, they could definitely manage to win against Dean here. So. Oh, rip. Alf is uh, dropping out. Um, but still very, very cool that they managed to make it all the way here to the finals. Actually, if they're dropping out, there's there's only like one or two more matches left. I'll stick it out. I'll stick it out for, for the content. Um, so, yeah, I would have really liked to see Alf, um, you know, continue on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, these these format tournaments, they they do go a while if it's, if it's a single day thing and it's all in one. So, you know, I got to respect it. Yeah, and also, it's, it's like very, very stressful game so far. So, yeah, so no worries, uh, Aleph. You know, do what you got to do. And, uh, yeah, um, and we can go on to the next one. But, yeah, no, no worries if that is the case. Uh, we're seeing if they actually are um, going out of the tournament or if there's just going to be a break. Um, but, you know, if they do have to drop out, no, no worries. Um, this, we're all playing these games just to have fun. And uh, if... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it looks like they are indeed going to drop out. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the bracket is over here. So we're right near the end. So it was going to be Aleph versus Dean, but it looks like Aleph has to drop out here. And so it looks like the finals will be Dean versus Barcode for all the bacon. Um, so it should be pretty good. But, uh, yeah. Um, rough stuff. But, uh, I mean, Aleph was definitely in it. So, um uh, Dean, you don't need to hop on stream. I'm, I'm just sort of doing it, um, you know, on my own. I'm not just I'm talking through things. But uh, we'll we'll watch uh, your game. And then afterwards, I, I might uh, ask you and Barcode on stream if, if y'all have any thoughts about the games and stuff. So uh, I might do that. But uh, we'll see. So, uh, yeah, we're going in to Dean versus Barcode here. Very exciting stuff. And, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I didn't quite make it to the end. But... It did show that the Necrofear deck potentially has some potential there. So very, very good stuff. Um, and often awesome run from the king of Yada format, all of you too. So it looks like Barcode is hosting there for Dean. And then we'll be diving in. I'm looking forward to this. This should be a good one. We got to see a bit of their uh, previous game on stream. And it was very, very intense. So let's see how this match goes. Yeah, not again, huh? but uh, yeah. Uh, I do think this format is very, very varied. Yes, that is uh, very true. Um, I think it's one of the more diverse metagames in the DM era because a lot of the time in the DM era, you sort of fall to like a standard, like, oh, the good stuff deck is just the deck that everyone plays. You just throw in all the good cards and there's the best deck in the room, right? You can play other decks, but like the good stuff deck is going to be favored in most games. Yeah, the format doesn't really have a good stuff deck. And so I do think that there's been a lot of experimentation as to like what the best deck in the front does look like. Um, so yeah, Forceful coming down here. Forceful getting a peek at Barcode's hand, shuffling back something. Going for that. So it looks like the hand is Darkhole, Rhoda, MST, Exiled, and Call, or Change of Heart. That is a broken hand there. That's really, really good. Um... That's a tough one. You can't really send back Exiled or else they get it off Rota. You could send back Rota if you don't want them to get more aggressive pressure. That might be the move. But Change of Heart, Dark Hole are so good. If you got Io, you want to send back MST. But given that they set a card there, it could be MST set as well. Another one. It's a bluff. Could also be a TT set or a ring. A lot of different things that this could be. So Dean is thinking here. And it, it is an important thing, I think. Yeah, tough stuff. Dark Hole getting sent back. Dark Hole's a pretty good card. It means that they probably don't have Leia Sangan or Witch to set here. But, oh, okay, they got Reaper. Okay, that explains why you send back the Dark Hole. 
Um, Exile can also deal with Reaper, though. But you don't want to send back Exile because they can just get that back off Rota, right? So I think it makes sense to clear one of the ways to get the uh, Reaper out. And uh, yeah, Change can also deal with Reaper, but Change doesn't really do anything for Dean here. Or uh, for Barcode there. And you generally want to save Change for like a more important card. But um, yeah, they're going to rip a card out of the hand. Uh, no, the dice rolling. Don't roll the dice. Just pick. No. Uh, I, I mean, you can roll the dice if you want to, but like it just kind of wastes a lot of time. Uh, the hand's already random, so like you don't need to do more. But uh, yeah, it's going to hit an MST there. Passing back to Barcode. Now Barcode, again, could use the change of heart or you just summon out Exiled, tack over the uh, Reaper and uh, then tribute off. Barcode could also, if they want to, they could just Rota for Dawn, Dawn attack over Reaper, uh, rip a card out of the hand, then exile the Reaper next turn. That is something they could do. The risk of that is if Dean has a way to deal with the Dawn, uh, then that could really backfire in Barcode's face. So don't necessarily want to do that, but they are going to go for Rota here. They might be going for it. They are going for it indeed. So they are ripping a card out of the hand, either saying like, you know, if Dean has the way to get over Dawn, you know, they have it. Or saying that, you know, they've got back row and they, the back row can sort of help them here. But yeah, Don the Z, uh, Donald Z, the best of the Donald alphabet people, um, you know, going from Don A to Don Z, Don Z definitely has the most meta relevance here. The Don has come. Uh, the Don rises, you could say. Change of heart on the Don is going to be pretty good here. Um, rip two cards out of hand potentially, but, uh, Barcode might've also set some powerful cards in that, uh, back row there. So, bring out an exile as well to pop the Dawn, too. So, this is pretty rough. So, yeah, double rip and then the exile to top it all off. Yeah, it's not looking good for Barco, but Barco might have a way to stop this with their back row there. They're thinking about it. They're going to take the three, lose a card from hand. So, yeah. I think it was just asking, like, is this okay? Like, not like, okay. Like, not like, not like too sassy, but yeah, hitting the exile is rough. Um, and will the Don hit the other card out of the hand as well? This will also tell, okay, Jar Greed going for a draw, potentially trying to lessen the impact of that Don rip. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a very desperate play there. Uh, I will rip out a Zambira. Okay, Zambira is a pretty good card there. Ring on the Exiled. Okay, so this is a very clever play. You ring the Exiled, so that way uh, you get the Dawn back attack over the Reaper next turn. So this is sort of trading a hand rip for a hand rip. So, yeah, that was a very, very interesting play. Definitely definitely a play that, like, very tricky. But there were a lot of options that turn. You could ring... Oh, well, Reborn for the Exiled uh, to pop the Dawn that way. So this did get your opponent to use a Reborn. So it's kind of like a hand rip because you're still trading the card there. Um, but still pretty rough. And yeah, I mean, Barcode might not have a way to do that. Where's the plant deck for 420? Unfortunately, I'm not at the point where plant decks are even remotely viable. Uh, I guess Lord Poison maybe is something uh, you could do, but like Lord Poison and Lakunga along with tomatoes. Those are like the main plant things, but like they don't really have too much synergy. Like Lakunga has water synergy with poison, but like, Tomato doesn't really get into either of them. So, um, yeah, it's not really the best. Yeah, Truesdale also does stuff, but, like, again, it's, like, not really the best. So, Alpha tagging in for 1900. No need to leave the uh, Reaper in attack and no cards in hand. So, yeah, looking kind of rough for Barcode here. But, again, as we've seen time and time again in this tournament, uh, you can always come back from the brink of defeat. And also, uh, Barcode is up a match. So, if they lose this match, then they'll be going into another match against Dean. Uh, for all the marbles. But intense stuff here, for sure. Chain of Heart on the Reaper to clear that. Uh, we did know about the change. Io coming down, though. Io won't actually stop the uh, Reaper from being popped because the change will uh, still pop it. But I would stop the Snatch Deal. So, um, you know, they still have to use the MST on it. But, uh, yeah, generally, you want to save the Io for not that because change would still go through because it still targeted it. But didn't really matter there. Either way, the MST was in the back row, so... Uh, Truesdale in Yada is not out, but Truesdale by the point like that I've covered is out. So, um, yeah, you can do Truesdale. Like, I'll be covering, um, next week will mainly be about goat format. And then after that, we'll be going into like cyber format and stuff. Um, but yeah, Lord Poison the Kunga is IOC. So in Yada, it's not out. Um, but in at the point of the channel where I'm at, uh, it is out. So yeah. Um, 
But yeah, hitting into a tomato here, that's a pretty good card for Dean because now Dean won't necessarily lose that much damage. They're gaining life off the snatch, so that's pretty good. Um, they could have potentially gone into another tomato, but I guess that's more... You're risking more if uh, Barcode has removal. Uh, painful is rough. Uh, yeah, Bobby, great playing. Like, those were awesome games. Uh, was this your first time playing Yada Bobby, or, or have you played before? Because those were some awesome, intense games. I mean, some of the best games that I've seen in the format. Um, so, yeah, those those were great. Um, but yeah, it, uh, oh wow, you have the built uh, the deck built in real life, Janda. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool deck. I mean, it's, it's fun, but like, unfortunately, until like Crossroads of Chaos, plant decks are like not really the best. Um, First time since 2003. Wow. Uh, yeah, well, you did really, really good for, for the first time since 2003. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I mean, a lot of skills from GOAT really do carry over into Yada, but there there are these like subtle differences that make a lot of interesting um, decisions and things to do. So uh, do you think that you play this format again, Bobby, or, or was this sort of like a one-and-done thing? Because Yada definitely isn't for everyone, but like a lot of people who play it, they're, they're like, man, that, that was a lot better than I thought. Um, so it looks like Dean is crashing in the witches. Um, and so the witches will get searched and they'll add serpent here. Uh, yeah, keep playing. Let's go. Uh, I feel like, you know, Yada's just gaining more and more people who are interested in it. And that's the great thing for the format because like, you know, I think that this format, there's a lot of potential for growth um, and a lot of very interesting dynamics in this format that you don't have in other formats. So I think it's really, really cool. So I'm glad that you're going to keep playing. Uh, and there's just so much depth to it too. Like, I feel like at this point, the meta is so undefined that like there's so much to explore and it's not like, you know, you can get tired of certain matches because you'll basically be playing a bunch of different matchups a lot. And that can get tiring in its own right because you don't necessarily know what you're going to play. But all those matchups do have a certain set of core cards. So it's not like the the most unknown information out there. So, yeah. So this is a rough stuff for Barco. They're just actually crashing in the Gemini Elf because they're like, I don't want to keep giving you life. Uh, I'm going to clear this. Drop this buyer down to 19 and uh, set one pass. Or set another pass as well. Um, so yeah, that's rough stuff. Uh, yeah, Fuchsia Ridgey stocks skyrocketing to the moon. Jando, if you missed the locals last night, um, someone actually played Fuchsia Ridgey and they managed to summon it uh, in the locals, which is wild. It was it was so cool. I need to actually make the roll for that. I was going to make a roll in the Discord for that. Um, but yeah, it, it was... It, shout out to Kesha for for doing that last night, but that was insane. Um, one in a million, but they managed to pull it off. So now we're into the point of the game where like it's going a lot more slow. I mean, Pot of Greed will help Barcode out a lot here, potentially getting into more things, but uh, Barcode also needs to be a bit careful because they are lower on life. Dean's at 6,000. Not as many ways to deal that 6,000 damage here. And with a Magician of Faith and attack, you open yourself up to some major damage coming in. So... Barco's thinking about what uh, spell to get. Like, you might just say, like, oh, you should just get Pot. But Change is actually a really good card here. You can potentially go for Change on the set. Use it to sort of get more advantage. If you've got Jinzo, you can trigger that off. Uh, a lot of different things you can do with this. So Barco's thinking about exactly what they want to do with this. And it will definitely be an interesting choice here. They're going to bring a Dawn and flip up a Serpent. So uh, I think they did know about the Serpent there. But uh, this way they get the live card out of the hand. And if the set was live, then they get the advantage of that. So it also gets in a lot of damage here. Um, so I think this is a good move, even though, you know, people might say, oh, they should have gone for pop for the advantage. But like, sometimes you need to know when to push for damage and push for getting the card out of hand, like with Dawn. Um, so I think this was fine. Gemini Elf coming down here, and this is going to be a bit rough because Elf can hit over Zalug, which it will do. Uh, and then Serpent can even crash into Faith, which it will do as well. So I think those are both good moves there. And now uh, Dean will get Serpent back next turn. Still very, very low cards for Dean. But, uh, oh, Painful could potentially get five from deck that could do it. Um, it's a bit tough, though, because it really depends on the last card in Barco's hand. But either way, Painful is very good here. Unfortunately, if you want to deck then out the hand rips, then you don't really have the best option to do so because Serpent's already gone, right? So... Like, normally you send Serpent a bunch of hand rips, they just give you Serpent, because it's like, well, Serpent's coming back. You send the hand rips and a bunch of other cards, they're going to give you a hand rip. And, like, at 2,400 life points, do you really want to give... Do you really want to have Compi in hand or Duo in hand? Probably not, right? So, um, 
it's a bit tricky. I mean, you might just go for it anyways because the deck thinning might just be worth it enough to do. But it is still, like, very awkward here for sure. So you might just want to go for five good ones. And it looks like they are indeed going to go for five good ones. So I think Premap, Monster Reborn, Mirage of Nightmare, and two more. Call the Haunted, as well of, uh, what else? Uh, right, Geki. So these are very, very good cards here. Uh, big, tough choice for Dean. I feel like you don't want to give the Reborn. You want to give the Premat instead if you do that. But it looks like Dean's going to give them Mirage, saying, well, if you don't have um, MST and you've used up two MSTs already, then this is pretty good. But it looks like uh, Barkley can bring out this Jinzo, attack over the Elf. They're drawn four this turn. So, you know, it's not the least likely thing to draw into an MST. They don't draw an MST. They still get the Serpent back to lessen the impact of the discards. So, ultimately, I think this is a very, very good turn for uh, Barcode here. Going for a Rota here. Searching out a card from deck that can search out an Exile. No, Exile's been used up, so can't search out Exiled. Can't search out Dawn. We know the hand is Dawn Serpent, so I guess this is just deck thinning here. Um, even if you don't really have many targets left, that's fine, but, like, I don't know. Your reinforcement of the Dawn. Okay, it looks like Barco did draw the MST there, and they're adding back the Serpent. So this is looking like uh, very, very good for Barcode. I think Barcode probably winning this game. Uh, they're bringing in the Sangan. Dawn can hit over Sangan, but if that does happen, then Barcode probably wins because uh, Barcode just attacks over the Dawn for 1,000, and then whatever else they're searching off Sangan can attack in for lethal. So uh, at this point in the game, Barcode does not care about that Dawn rip. So I think this makes a lot of sense. But they're just setting more anyways, just because they might as well. Uh, last card in Serpent, so the Dawn rip is completely worthless at this point. So I think this is fine. The one risk is that if Harpies comes down here, that would be a bit awkward. But yeah, uh, Dean also acknowledges, like, uh, I got a set here. Now, Barcode can't necessarily... Oh, well, Lily will wrap things up. Yeah, you can just attack into the set with the Jinzo there. Uh, attack him with Lily. And that'll be the end of the game. So very, very good game one there. Uh, just barely in the game one, too, because uh, they had 2,400, so that's very, very close to not being able to pay for Lily, but they did have just enough to do it. And, yeah, so very, very good stuff there. Um, yeah, very intense game. And, like, again, I think a lot of these games are very intense, and they get down to the wire, where it really can go back and forth, and it really could go either way. This is indeed the final round, Janjo. The one caveat to that is if Dean wins, then they'll have to face a... They'll have to play again, right? Because this double elimination, Barcode was undefeated so far, so uh, that means that Barcode has to lose twice in order to get eliminated from the tournament. So um, this is the final round, but it might be two matches instead of one. Still, very, very good final so far. And very intense. And I think it also shows, like, um, Dean opened hand rip on Barcode, like, turn one, right? And yet, they were still able to... Uh, you know, Barcode was still able to claw their way back and win. So it does show that the hand rips are brutal if they happen, but it's definitely not the end of the world. I only bring that up because a lot of the things that people cite for reason not to get in this format, they're like, oh, I don't like the three hand rips running around, um, and I don't like the power cards. As we discussed uh, over the course of this stream, the power cards are definitely a bit more balanced than you might expect because everyone has access to them. Um, and the hand rips, as we're seeing here, they don't necessarily end the game for you. They're very strong, don't get me wrong. But if you do activate a hand rip, then there is recovery. As I mentioned before, unlike with Dust Shoot, you don't know the entire hand on the following turn. So, you know, there is still that unknown that you can work with. There are things you can do. So, going for Duster, then the Geki. Going for big plays here, but it looks like it's because they're going for the Dawn. Bringing out the Dawn, tacking in for 14, and uh, ripping a card out of Dean's hand. Uh, so, this is looking very, very good for Barcode here at the start. And what will they rip? They'll rip a TT. TT is very good. Uh, so it seems like Dean was playing around the Duster, which is very smart to do. But unfortunately, it didn't really help them that much. They're going to set two pass back to Barcode. Will they be able to keep up the aggressive pressure here is the question. Um, yeah, a bit of a tough one. They're going for MST on the back row, so this implies that they likely do have a way to keep up the aggressive pressure. Yep, they do. It's Exiled. Exiled will pop the set. It's a Reaper. It's a very good thing to pop. And then they're ripping out another card from the hand. So, brutal stuff for Dean. But if you look at the, the number of cards in each player's hand, then uh, Barker has three, Dean has two. So, it's not necessarily as lopsided as you might think because Dean or Barker has had to use uh, cards every turn to actually keep the hand rips going. 
So it's been more one-for-one -one removal than you might expect, and which will potentially be able to get Dean back more value later. Unfortunately for Dean now, they will lose that last card in hand, and uh, they are also very low on life points, and that can matter a lot. Hitting a Yada, that's quite unfortunate, and bringing out a Zimbira now, uh, passing back to Dean. Not looking good for Dean here, honestly. This might just be the end of the game. Uh, yeah, very tough spot indeed. We know that set is not a Mirror Force, so, yeah, it's not looking good. Uh, I mean, ring is something that it could be. You could ring the Zambira when deal to... No, you don't want to ring the Zambira because then you're in ring range yourself. You want to ring the Zalug probably. Yeah, not looking good. Um, I mean, the good thing is that Barcode isn't killing you here, potentially, unless they've got a ring of their own to set after tanking the Zambira, and then they ring their own Zambira. But, yeah, it's not looking good. So, uh, this might be the end of the game. A um, bit of an anticlimactic end of the game, given some of the other games that we've seen so far. But, you know, sometimes this is the way that things go in Yada format. Tempo does matter a bit. And if you're able to maintain that tempo, like Barcode's been doing, then you can win the game that way. Uh, but we've seen, like, throughout this uh, stream that, uh, you know, it, like, there are a variety of different ways that the games can play out. Uh, it looks like it is indeed the ring. So, yeah, ring will pop these Alug there. Uh, and, yeah. So... Actually, this game might be a little bit closer than we might expect because um, with that tomato, Dean could potentially stabilize. Of course, it really does depend on what that set is. Graceful here can also help them stabilize quite a bit. And again, both players are low on resources. So uh, there is still ways for them to come back. Unfortunately, it's not looking good. If that set that Barcode has is Fiber Jar, then this might just be the end of the game. Pitching a Rhoda and a Harpies here, setting one and firing Forceful. So you're setting the last card back at least, but uh, I might not matter in the end. Uh, so that said is the tomato. We do know that. I think honestly, uh, I was going to say, I think honestly you could go tomato. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a faith. So that's going to be the end of the game. Chain of heart on the, uh, tomato. And that's just going to be it. Right. So this game was probably over either way. Yeah. Because you couldn't really, you could crash the tomato in a couple times, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. And then Jinzo comes down on top of that. So, wow. Yeah. That is the end of the game there. That's just how it goes sometimes. Tempo does matter a lot, uh, even in a grindier format like this. And Barco just had all the tempo, and they played it very, very well. Both players played this very well. Every player I think we've seen in this tournament so far played their game very, very well. So big shout out to all the players who joined uh, this tournament. I mean, it's awesome stuff. Hopefully this uh, stream and this tournament uh, encourage people to try out more Yada in the future. I think Yada is one of the best formats in the DM era, if not the best format in the DM era. So I really do encourage more people to try it out because I think it is a blast to play. Um, I'm probably going to sign off here, but congrats to Barcode and congrats to everyone who played. Uh, we will have another stream tomorrow for Warrior format. Um, but in order to prepare for that, uh, I'm probably going to sign off here uh, just so that way I can maintain my mental energy and my stamina. So uh, glad that you all were able to, uh, watch the stream with me. I mean, these were some awesome games. And, uh, if you liked the content, please do subscribe. It really does help out a lot. And I'll also notify you when the stream tomorrow starts and when my other coverage, uh, starts as well. So great stuff. If you are interested in a tournament like this, definitely head on over to the format library discord and join the warrior format tomorrow because it should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Warrior is another great format in the DM era, and hopefully that will highlight this as well. So I hope you enjoyed as always. Let me know down in the comments below if you're not in the stream already, uh, what you thought of these games. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you in the next one. So peace.